What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, guys, so we are going to do a full story video. A full story video is when I sit down, take a bunch of videos that tell one overarching storyline and combine them together into one big video. Now, today's full story video is going to be about Fall of the Mutants. Now, this was the second X-Men crossover ever done in Marvel Comics. Technically, it's not really a crossover, really more of an X-Men event, because none of the three teams actually cross over into each other books. See, when it came to Fall of the Mutants, the X-Men, X-Factor, and New Mutants had to handle problems on their own. So, for example, when it came to X-Factor, they had to deal with Apocalypse. When it came to the X-Men, well, they had to deal with the Adversary. When it came to New Mutants, well, they had to deal with the Wright and the Animator. And so, each team had to handle their own problems on their own. And in some cases, there were some big changes to the team done at the end of the event. But either way, here is the complete story of Fall of the Mutants. I do hope you enjoy. Today's video. And so getting into Uncanny X-Men number 215, we do pick up with Madeline Pryor. Now remember, when it comes to Madeline Pryor, she is the clone of Jean Grey. But around this point in time, no one knew that she was the clone of Jean Grey. Matter of fact, everybody thought that she was just a woman that looked very similar to Jean Grey. Now, she did go on to marry Cyclops and they had a child together, better known as Cable. Now, over in X-Factor comics around this time, Cyclops left her and his son behind to go form X-Factor alongside with Angel, Beast, Iceman and the newly returned Jean Grey. He has not told his wife that Jean Grey has come back to life, the woman he used to love before her. And so right now, he's hanging out with her over at the base of X Factor. Now, something else to mention is that when it comes to Madeline Pryor, she does not remember the early days of her life. Now, we all know why because she is the clone of Jean Grey. But when it came to the X-Men stories around this time, they said because she was in a plane crash and she was the only survivor of that plane crash, she had forgotten everything else about her life before that plane crash. And so as we dive into Uncanny X-Men number 215, we see her kind of reliving that plane crash. As the plane does crash and she is the sole survivor. Now right after she's able to walk out of that wreckage, she's then grabbed by two paramedics who then throw her on an ambulance. Now right off the bat, we are told that these two guys are not paramedics. Matter of fact, they are marauders. Now remember, marauders were the main bad guys in the Mutant Massacre storyline. They were going around killing off Morlocks left and right. And the question is right now, why did they go after Madeline Pryor? Because the opening pages of this book, we are left to believe that this is a flashback. That right after she was able to survive that plane crash, she was grabbed by the Marauders, but she was able to get away. Well, not really. She almost got away, but as soon as she tried to get away, she got shot from behind by Scout Hunter. And so we're left to wonder, did this really happen? Or is this a dream? And so then we pick up with Storm, who is currently getting ready to send most of the X-Men away. Now, the reason why, because three of the X-Men got seriously injured in earlier story arcs, Kitty Pride, Colossus, and also Nightcrawler. And so they need some time to heal up. The other four characters who are also being sent away are technically newbies and they need some training and that would be Rogue, 
Psylocke, Longshot, and also Dazzler. And so those four characters, plus the three who are injured, are all going over to Mirror Island to get healed up, but to also get some training in. Now, Storm and Wolverine, they are going to stay behind. But the reason why Storm is doing this is because she feels like the mansion is not a safe place for the newbies nor the ones who are injured. Because again, this story arc comes right after the whole mutant uh, massacre storyline. And so Storm is afraid of the idea of the Marauders coming here and attacking the place. And so she'll feel more comfortable if everybody is away getting trained and getting healed. While her and Wolverine stay behind to handle different kinds of situations. Now we do jump back over to Madeline Pryor and when we do is her now waking up in a hospital after being shot in the head by Scout Hunter. Now again, we have no idea if this is a flashback right after the plane crash or she's having some kind of nightmare. Either way, we are told that she was able to survive the shooting done by Scalp Hunter and she was brought to a nearby hospital. Now, of course, they had no idea how to identify her and so they had no idea who she was. But as soon as she does wake up, she tells them, my name is Madeline Pryor. But again, we're left to wonder, is this some kind of dream or is this a flashback that takes place right after the plane crash that she has supposedly survived? But then we have to jump over to Wolverine and Storm. Now remember, those two characters stay behind. They didn't go to Muir Island because they have to handle some things in the area. And one of those things is Sarah Gray. Now remember, Sarah Gray is the sister to Jean Gray. Now when it came to Sarah, her main goal around this point in time was to speak on behalf of the mutants, to tell the world that mutants are technically not evil, that mutants can be great people and be great for humans and mutants tends to work alongside with one another. Now when it came to Sarah, because she was labeled as a mutant lover, you had all these different groups out there who were trying their best to get rid of mutants go after her. And matter of fact, over in the X Factor comic, her house was blown up when Cyclops and Jean Grey were trying to pay her a visit to tell her your sister is alive again. But unfortunately, she was not home and the place was blown up. Now, our two heroes, they did survive. And luckily, Sarah was not home, so she also survived. And so this is Storm and Wolverine coming here because they heard that something happened to her house. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he tells Storm, hey, Sarah's not dead. Sarah is alive, just not here, though. We got to figure out where she went to. But that is the moment Wolverine realized he picks up two other scents, Cyclops and Jean Grey. And like I said, around his time, no one really knew that Jean Grey was alive again except X-Factor and the Fantastic Four. X-Men had no idea that Jean Grey is alive. And so for Wolverine, he's all like, this can't be true. There's no way I should be able to pick up Jean Grey's scent but he does and when he does he goes berserk and he on accident knocks out storm and runs off into the forest to kind of process the whole idea that the woman he loves is now alive again now we do jump back over to the other members of the x-men who are currently on their way over to mere island now on the way there, we get the idea of how seriously injured Kitty Pride is. Because in the Mutant Massacre storyline, she was shot in the back by one of the Marauders, which affected her powers to the point where she can no longer stop phasing. Her body is always in phasing mode. But the problem is though, the phasing is getting worse to the point where she's no longer able to communicate. And sooner or later, she may not be able to think anymore. It's kind of like she's going completely ghost and sooner or later, she'll just disappear completely. And so now we're left to wonder, can the X-Men find a way to turn her powers off and to save her? 
Now we do jump back over to Storm. Now when we do, is Storm waking up after being knocked out by Wolverine, but realizing that she has been captured, and she was captured by three characters, and that would be Crimson Commando, Stonewall, and Super Saber. Now these three characters used to be heroes in World War II. But of course, as the war ended, they were told to retire. Now at first, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to keep using their powers as a way to help the world out, but unfortunately, the government said no. But as years went on, you had more and more different kinds of evil people popping up. And with that happening, they felt like they should use their powers as a way to punish these new kinds of evil people. Now, the way they do it is kind of like they capture you and then they release you into the forest and they are going to hunt you down and your goal is to get away and survive if you don't well you're dead now the reason why they kidnapped storm is because they believe that storm was the one who burned down the house of sarah gray because they found her knocked out next to the house thanks to wolverine now we come to find out there is another girl there and that would be Priscilla and the reason why she was kidnapped because her and her boyfriend were selling drugs and that is a huge problem and so now they're going to kill her as well but like I said the way they kill you off is that they're going to release you in a forest and your goal is to get the heck out of there and to hopefully get away from them if you don't you're gonna die and so now it's up to storm to save her life and this young girl's life before they are killed off by these three characters now as we jump into uncanny x-men number 216 well we pick up with wolverine and remember when it came to wolverine the last time we saw him he went berserk as soon as he was able to pick up the scent of jean gray and because of that he went so crazy like an animal that he's out there in the woods just running around and he does get hit by a car now usually if somebody's hit by a car they most likely get killed off or seriously injured but Wolverine does not get hurt that bad because of his healing factor. Now the couple that did hit them, they're going to be somewhat important for this chapter alone. But again, it's reminding us that thanks to Wolverine now finding the scent of Jean Grey, he's kind of wondering the possibility that she is alive again. But getting back over to Storm, we do currently see her with Priscilla. And you have the two ladies trying their best to get away from all the different men who are trying to chase them down. Now, when it comes to Priscilla, she wants to go ahead and set up traps as a way to kill off the three men who are currently hunting them. But for Storm, that's the wrong thing to do. Matter of fact, there has to be a better option when it comes to getting away from these guys. Now again though, when it comes to Priscilla, she's kind of young and reckless. And so for her, killing is the only option. If you're trying to survive by somebody who's trying to hunt you down, then your only option is to kill them before they kill you. But for Storm, it's more of, maybe we are able to show them the wrongs in their actions. Their ways are wrong and they need to find different ways to actually help the world out. But getting back over to the other X-Men, you currently have them heading over to Mir Island. And matter of fact, they do arrive at Mir Island. Now, when they do arrive, we kind of focus on Rogue. And the reason why, because Rogue feels very upset about the idea that her and the rest of the team were sent away to come to Muir Island while Storm and Wolverine stayed behind because she's very worried about the idea that something could possibly happen to Storm or to Wolverine. Now, there is something I forgot to mention, and that is Storm. Around this time, Storm was technically powerless, and so she is waiting for a phone call from Forge who might have the ability to give her powers back to her. And so that is why Storm has been unable to use her powers in this entire story so far. Either way, when it comes to Mormon Tagger, she reminds Rogue 
why she is here. To one, make sure their three friends can heal up properly, but two, to get some proper training. Because right now, you have new members to your team and they need to know how to work with your team before they're able to go out in the field. And so then we jump over to Crimson Commando, Super Saber, and also Stonewall, the three characters who are trying to chase down Storm and also Priscilla. Now this is the moment where you do have most of the members of this group beginning to think that Storm might be actually innocent. Now, the only reason why, because Storm told them, like, hey, you may have found me next to a burning house, but that does not mean I was the one who burned the house down. There is a possibility that I'm actually innocent. Now, we know that Storm is innocent, but the thing is, they don't know that. And so they believe that Storm is guilty. But because she did say that, you now have Stonewall believing that maybe she could be innocent and the possibility that their ways are actually wrong. And so you have the three men argue, but the conversations cut short when you have Crimson Commando realize where Storm and Priscilla are trying to head to. And so he says, listen, this conversation, we'll have it later. It's time for us to go find Storm and also go find Priscilla. And so then we pick up with Super Saber using his super speed as a way to travel around the forest at a faster pace to hopefully find Storm and Priscilla faster than his two two mates would. Now he does set off one of Storm's traps and when he does, well Storm realizes if she is able to stay close to him then he'll be unable to run away and so her goal is to take him out without actually killing him. Now when it comes to Priscilla, she's still down with the idea of killing people and so she begins to push big boulders down the mountain to hopefully crush Super Saber but to also crush Storm as well because she thinks that if Storm is able to take out Super Saber, she will then continue to try to protect Priscilla which means that the other two guys Crimson Commando and Stonewall will still come after them because of Storm. And so her goal is to kill off Storm, kill off Super Saber, and maybe the other two will call off their hunt. But then we pick up with the couple we saw earlier that had hit Wolverine with their vehicle. Now while they're trying to fix up their car, Priscilla arrives. And when she does, at first, she tries to pretend that she is somebody who needs help. Except she then pulls out a gun and shoots the both of them and then takes their vehicle. Killing them and leaving them there. Now Wolverine finds their dead bodies and that right there ticks off Wolverine even more. Now we kind of find out that, well, unfortunately, she didn't get that far. She crashed the car and so now she has no choice but to try to find a new way to get the heck out of that forest. Except before she is able to do anything, somebody comes from behind and knocks her out. Now, while Priscilla's knocked out, that is the moment where you have Stonewall appear. Now, when Stonewall does appear, well, he tries to go after Priscilla, except Storm appears and Storm is able to take out Stonewall. But right after she does that, well, then you have Priscilla wake up wanting to kill Lost Storm because again, she believes that Storm might bring the others over to her and hey, Stonewall just appeared, which means Crimson Commando could not be too far away. Except before you have Priscilla being able to kill Lost Storm, well, Crimson Commando kills her off. And now it's him saying, one down, one more to go. Now it's time for me to kill Lost Storm. Except Wolverine is there as well. Now, Storm does not want Wolverine to actually help. Instead, what she wants to do is take on Crimson Commando on her own. And the reason why, because one, she wants to prove that she is not evil, but two, this is her battle. And so once she's able to actually defeat Crimson Commando, she's all like, listen, I'm not gonna kill you. Even though you wanted and tried to kill me, I'm not gonna kill you because it's time for me to talk to you. It's time for me to tell you 
to do the right thing. Like, yes, you're trying to help out the world, but the way you are doing it is currently wrong. And so you need to find a different way. You need to find a better way to actually help out the world. But first, you need to tell the police what you have been doing up in these woods, killing off people left and right. And maybe they might try to, you know, give you a short sentence. But once you are out, then you must work on being a better person. And this is the first story we're going to cover in today's video because the next two chapters is really more about Dazzler fighting against the Juggernaut. And so then we jump into Uncanny X-Men number 217. Now when we do, we pick up with the new members of the X-Men currently training on Mirror Island. Now when it comes to the new X-Men, we do have to talk about a few different things. The first is that Dazzler. Dazzler has been on her own for a very long time. Matter of fact, ever since she first appeared in Marvel Comics, she was just over there. She was a mutant, she knew about the X-Men, she had worked alongside with them, but never truly had been a part of the team until Uncanny X-Men number 213, really 13 and 14, and we have skipped over 14. And the reason why, because in that storyline, a character known as Malice had taken over her body and looked to the X-Men to stop her. Now, once the X-Men had stopped her, she had joined their team. But the problem is though, she feels like she's not good enough to be on the team, but at the same time, there's still some bad blood between her and Rogue. Because in the early days of Rogue's appearances in Marvel Comics, she was the bad guy. She fought against the Avengers, but also fought against the X-Men. And so even though she's good now, Dazzler still remembers the days where she had fought against Rogue. But on top of that, she still feels like she's not able to be part of the ranks of the X-Men. Now, Psylocke, she's also trying to fit in because she's still learning how to use her powers in a more attack and defense kind of ways. And so right now, it's all really new for most of the new members, except possibly Longshot and Rogue. But at the end of their training session, you then have Banshee say, hey, come inside, it's time for breakfast. We did see Callisto having a conversation with Mormon Tagger, and this is a way to remind us about the Mutant Massacre storyline. Because remember, the Mutant Massacre storyline was about the idea that the Morlocks were being hunted down by the Marauders. Now, most of the Morlocks, they were killed off, but some were saved, but they were seriously injured. And so they were also brought over to Mir Island as a way to get healed up. And so you have have more going over to Callisto to talk about the idea of how the Morlocks are doing because she is their leader. Now this leads into a small battle between Callisto and also Dazzler and the reason why because Callisto wants Dazzler to realize that she cannot just get by by her looks, that she has to learn how to fight because now she's part of the X-Men and that is a very huge thing. You're going to run into different kinds of battles and you need to have a better understanding how everything works. Now when it comes to Dazzler, it makes sense because she has been on her own for many years. And I'm not saying that she didn't have any kind of big adventures, but a lot of things she has done were not as big as what the X-Men had done over here. And so for her on the X-Men, she has to learn how to actually fight now and work with a team. And that is really important. But also for a long time, Dazzler was a pop star for many years in Marvel Comics because the world had no idea that she was a mutant. But when the world found out she was a mutant, and when the world began to hate mutants even more, she had no choice but to find a way to perform in different kind of ways until she was unable to perform. And so now it's Dazzler realizing that 
her entire life has completely changed. And fighting against Callisto did not help as well because now she's being constantly reminded that she needs to learn how to fight with the X-Men, how to be a better fighter. And so with it all happening in the training session, you have her leave and go into town wanting some alone time. And this leads into her battle against Juggernaut. And what I mean by that is, while you have Dazzler in town trying to just chill out, well, that is the moment she sees Juggernaut drive by. When he does drive by, she goes to chase him down because she knows that he's a well-known bad guy. And usually, if he's around, he's about to cause some problems somewhere. And so, she goes out of her way to try to stop him. Now, this is the Juggernaut. We have seen literally different members of the X-Men up to this point struggle to fight against him. And like I said, Dazzler is new to the X-Men. And yes, she has been fighting other bad guys in the past, but nobody like the Juggernaut. And so this is a whole new kind of challenge for her. Now at first, when it comes to Juggernaut, he said, listen, I'm here to do a job. But I'm not here to hurt you. Now, the reason why he doesn't want to hurt her because he is a huge fan of her music. He's all like, listen, you are a great artist. I want to make sure you and I have a good connection, a good bond, and we can go our separate ways. But for Dazzler, she knows that he's a bad guy, that he's up to something. And so she tries to use her powers against him. Now, her powers don't really do much to Juggernaut. I mean, yes, she can blind him for a short period of time, but that's really it. And so she keeps trying to push herself over and over and over again. On top of that, she did get hurt in their battle. And so at the tail end of this chapter, it does look like she had possibly died in the arms of Juggernaut. And he was not trying to kill her. He was all like, listen, just leave me alone. I'm a huge fan and I want to make sure nothing happened to you. But she kept trying to go after him to make sure that he could not cause any problems. But because she pushed herself so much, we're left to believe that Dazzler had died in the arms of Juggernaut. But then we jump over to Uncanny X-Men number 218, where we do pick up with Polaris and Havoc. And matter of fact, they're going through a particular moment right now where they almost get run off the road. But the reason why they're here now, because this begins the process of possibly bringing these characters over to the team again. Because after Chris Claremont had taken over the X-Men, his main goal was to kind of push away the old characters and bring in the new characters. And so when it came to Havoc and Polaris, they were one of the first two to basically leave the team right after Claremont brought in the new X-Men. Now they would stay around for different storylines here and there, but most of the time they kind of stayed on their own. Now when it comes to the two characters, like I said, this is going to begin the process of the possibility of them rejoining the X-Men once again. And so that leads us back over to Dazzler. Now when it comes to Dazzler, as we saw at the end of the last chapter, we were left to believe that she had possibly died. Now we already know she didn't die. Matter of fact, she was buried alive because Juggernaut believed that she had died. But now with her being buried alive, there is a possibility that she might die now, except she does not. And the reason why, because the X-Men were able to find her. Because let's not forget, she did try to go into the city to have a good time to clear her mind. And when she did that, somebody saw her leaving and chased after the Juggernaut. And so because of that, he was able to call over to the X-Men and say, hey, your friend disappeared and try to go after the Juggernaut. And I have no idea what happened to her. And so the X-Men began to search for her, which they were able to find her very easily and unbury her. But now this is the X-Men saying, what is wrong with you? Because the thing is, we are supposed to be a team. We should be working together. And so this is kind of like the moment where Dazzler realized that no matter what, 
this is her life. She's part of the X-Men and she has no choice but to go ahead and work with this team and try to adjust to her new life. Now that is the moment you have the X-Men get a call over the radio about Juggernaut currently attacking the city. And so you have our new X-Men here say, we should go and possibly deal with that problem. And so that leads into our four heroes working together to fight against the Juggernaut. Now, this is really huge. And the reason why, because this is the first time you have these four characters working together. That's really huge right there, because these four characters are all mostly new to the X-Men team. Rogue, not really, but the other three, yeah, most definitely new. Psylocke, she had been around for a while, but she was more of a reserve member. The other two, they are freshmen on the team. And so they have to learn how to fight alongside with Rogue and Psylocke. But either way, it's still kind of cool to see the four heroes come together to actually defeat the Juggernaut. Now, once they're able to do that, they get word that this entire time was Juggernaut just trying to keep them busy long enough so that Black Tom would be able to rob a bank. And so for our heroes, they're kind of upset about the idea they fail for the whole keep the superheroes busy long enough so somebody else can do something else over there. And so they're saying, listen, even though we failed to technically save the day when it comes to Black Tom, at least we were able to work together and take down a powerful threat. And so this is why I kind of want to cover this storyline right here to kind of tell you guys the X-Men team is going to get reshuffled. You're going to have some old folks are gone and new folks come in. But then we have to jump back over to Havoc and Polaris. Now, when we do, you have our two heroes going out of their way to check in on some campers at a camping site. Except when they get there, they kind of find out all the campers have been killed off. All their equipment has been ruined. And the question is right now, what happened to the campers? And we come to find out they were killed off by an alien race known as the Brood. And the only reason why we know that because the Brood used special kind of creatures as a way to travel across the universe. And that special kind of creature is here right now dead on Earth, which means the Brood had used this creature to come to Earth and the Brood are a very nasty kind of aliens that could cause a lot of problems for our heroes. But this is Okay, so getting back into our coverage over the X-Men, as we work our way up to the fall of the Mutant storyline, we do pick up with New Mutants number 47, 48, and 49. Now, this is a three-part story arc that comes right after the Mutant Massacre event. And the reason why, because remember, when it came to the New Mutants, they only had one chapter in the entire Mutant Massacre crossover. And the reason why, because at the end of their chapter they were teleported away over to limbo and the reason why because they were being chased after by a character known as magus now when it comes to magus he is a technarch and when it comes to technarchs they're better known as techno organic beings now when it comes to magus at this point in time in marvel comics he was known as the most powerful technarch on his home world now the reason why he was chasing after the new mutants because of his son Warlock who's also a technarch because on their home world when the time comes for the child to prove that he is worthy enough to replace their parent they have to kill off their parent and so when he came to Magus he felt like it was time for Warlock to see if he was worthy it was time for Warlock to try to kill off his father now Warlock did not like that idea at all 
and so he ran back over to Earth and hid with the new mutants. And over time, you would have Magus appear and try his best to grab his son and take his son back over to their home world. But almost every single time, he fails. And so when it came to the tail end of New Mutants number 46, right in the middle of the Mutant Massacre crossover, Magus appeared, but Magic, the younger sister of Colossus, was able to use her powers to teleport the team over to Limbo. Now, as we dive into today's storyline, we see our heroes in Limbo. But I do want to mention one thing. When it comes to Limbo, around this point in time in Marvel Comics, this was still a new concept. Yes, you did have a lot of different Marvel Comics use Limbo. But the thing was, it was still kind of new. And when it comes to magic, she's still learning a lot about Limbo. Now, when our heroes arrive, the only person to wake up is Sunspot. The rest of the team is knocked out cold. Now, when he does wake up, he sees that they are surrounded by a bunch of demons of Limbo. Now, he does get very concerned. And the reason why, because these demons are ignoring him and the rest of the team. They're going after magic. And the reason why, because around this point in time, she was technically the ruler of Limbo. Either way, they grab her and you have Sunspot wondering what in the world could be going on. What are they planning to do to her? But we kind of find out that they were just trying to heal her up because she is the ruler of Limbo around this time in Marvel Comics. And so they want to make sure that she is okay. Now, once she is healed up, she's then able to help out the rest of the team and get everybody back on their feet. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they do remember that they were trying to get away from Magus because he is a very powerful character a character you cannot take so lightly now with all that being said though while you have our heroes wondering what is their next step well they realize they were unable to escape magus that he actually followed them into limbo now, this battle does not take that long. And the reason why, because our heroes realize they really can't do anything at all when it comes to fighting against Magus. He's a very powerful techno-organic being. And literally, he has the ability to infect you so easily. If he touch you, it's game over. And so for our heroes, they realize that their powers may hold him back for a short period of time, but sooner or later he's going to be able to grab them and then most likely kill them to get to his son warlock now as the battle goes on you have magic say listen i was able to gather up enough energy to open up another portal to hopefully teleport us out of here and in somewhere safe now, the story does shift over to Magneto and Maura McTaggart. Now, again, this takes place right after the Mutant Massacre event. And remember, around this time, Maura McTaggart went over to the school of Charles Xavier to help out the X-Men and the New Mutants take care of any survivors of that event. Now, again, the New Mutants had disappeared and the X-Men are currently handling their own set of problems. Now, around his time, Charles Xavier was not the headmaster of the school. It was actually Magneto. Because around his time, Marvel took the character and was trying to turn into a good guy. And so he became the leader of the school. And he was actually the teacher for the new mutants. Now, when it comes to Maura Metagger, she is very worried about the new mutants because at the end of their chapter of the mutant massacre to the world, they just had disappeared. No one knows where in the world they went to. We know, but they don't know. And so when it comes to Magneto, yes, he is worried, but he does have faith in his students. He believes that sooner or later, they should be able to get back here safe and sound. 
Now, getting back over to the New Mutants, we kind of find out that they have arrived back on Earth, except they have arrived in the past. And what I mean by that is, they have arrived in ancient Scotland. Now, at first, our heroes, they don't know that. To them, it's just Earth, except out of nowhere, they do see some Scottish knights trying to get away from some English knights. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they go out of their way to help out the Scottish Knights because it seemed they were in more trouble than the other group. Now once our heroes are able to defeat the Englishmen, they go talk to the leader of the Scottish men. Now when it comes to our heroes, this is the moment they realize that they are in ancient Scotland because the leader of this group is an ancient king that they have studied in the present day, and that would be Robert the Bruce. Now, I'm not going to sit down and try to talk a lot about Robert the Bruce, and the reason why, because this is his only appearance ever in Marvel Comics. Now, when it comes to Robert, he's very grateful of what the New Mutants were able to do, that they were able to protect him. Now, he does take them in so they are able to, you know, rest up and eat some food. But while you have everybody talking, that is when you have Robert realize that this team of mutants are on the run. They're running away from their enemy. Now, we know who. That would be Magus. But for him, he has no idea who that person is. But when it comes to their conversation, he begins to motivate them, saying, listen, you guys cannot just always run away because sooner or later that option right there will be taken away and then you are gonna have to fight back but the question is will you be ready to fight back or will you not be ready to fight back and will you die and so it's him saying you just have to face your problems head on but at the same time be cautious now when it comes to our heroes once they do hear that they realize that maybe he is right to go back to limbo try to get back to earth and then think of a game plan to get rid of magus now they use warlock magus son to see if magus is still in limbo and he tells the team no he is gone so we should be able to use limbo to get back to our time and so they begin to use the powers of magic once again, hoping to get back to the present day. I'm going to tell you right now, they don't. Matter of fact, they end up into the far future, an alternate future that's well known to the readers of Marvel Comics. And so we then pick up with New Mutants number 48. Now, with this issue, we do pick up with four mutants who are apparently stuck in the future. And that would be Sunspot, Magma, Karma, and also Wolfbane. Now, the reason why these four characters are the only ones stuck in the future is because when it came to magic and she was trying to get everyone back to the present day, something happened and the group got separated and so these four got stuck in the future now we kind of find out that they are currently in the days of future past now this was a timeline that was originally introduced back in a uh, candy x-men number 141 and 142 and that timeline right there the sentinels had won they were able to kill off most of the mutants and kill off all the superheroes who weren't mutants now they also were able to take over north america as well it was a very dark future now at first we were left to believe that that was going to be the for sure future of the Marvel timeline. Now, of course, thanks to comics and really superheroes, that timeline right there is no longer going to be the for sure future. It's now an alternate future. But when it comes to our four heroes in this storyline, they had just arrived in another version of the days of future past. And so this future is not the same one we saw in Uncanny X-Men number 141 and 142. This is a whole brand new one that's just very similar to the other one. Now, with that being said, while you have our heroes realize that 
North America has been wrecked, that most of the mutants have been killed off, well, that is the moment where they are attacked by some sentinels. Now, when it comes to this battle, it's not really fair for our heroes. And the reason why, because most of our heroes, they have abilities that will give them the chance to actually win against a giant robot like Magma or even Sunspot. But characters like Wolfbane at this point in time was not in the best position to fight against a giant robot. Now, luckily for our heroes, Two future versions of their friends had just arrived to save the day, to help them get away from the Sentinels. And that would be Cannonball and also Danny Moonstar. The two future versions of those characters had just arrived to help out our new mutants get away from these Sentinels. Now we do jump back over to the present day where we pick up with Magneto. Now you have Magneto very upset to see how the children were taking care of their rooms. Now guys remember, when it comes to Magneto, he has faith in the idea that the new mutants will come back home safely and then he will be able to continue their teachings, their lessons. And so while you have Magneto currently cleaning the rooms up for the new mutants, well that is the moment he is confronted by Stevie Hunter. Now, Stevie Hunter was a really big character in the early days of Uncanny X-Men where Chris Claremont took over the title. She appeared in a lot of books. Now, she still does in the present day of Marvel Comics. It's just here and there, like small sprinkles here and there. But either way, when it comes to Stevie, she's also wondering if the new mutants are okay. Because like we saw earlier, when it came to Maura Metagger, she was very worried. And so now is Stevie. They both believe in the idea that maybe the new mutants might not come back. But for Magneto, he still believes in the idea that they will. Now we do jump back over to our heroes. And when we do, we kind of learn from our heroes about this version of the days of future past. Now we are told that in this future, that basically the mutants were blamed for every single thing that went wrong in North America. So for example, there was a really bad drought. That was the mutants fault. There was a really bad winter. That was the mutants fault. There was a bad earthquake one year. Again, that was the mutants fault. But the biggest thing that got the mutants in trouble was the idea that a lot of people believe that most of the mutants in America were actually spies from other countries. And so with all those different things coming together, it led into the launch of the Sentinels, which of course led into this dark future where most of the mutants are killed off. Literally, most of the new mutants have been killed off as well. Now, this is also the moment where we kind of find out that some of the mutants were able to escape. They were able to be teleported over to a Dyson Spear that's out in space. Now, here's the thing, because when it comes to this Dyson Spear, the only way to get there is to use someone who has the ability to teleport. And that person would be Leela, or sorry, Lila Chenny. Now, when it comes to Lila Chenny, she first appeared in New Mutants Annual Number One. And again, she has the ability to teleport. Now, she's a very powerful teleporter because she's able to teleport across the universe and so when it comes to Lila Chenny she's their key to finally get off this earth and go over to that Dyson Spear but the problem is she was recently captured by the Sentinels and so now our heroes the present day heroes and the future version of their friends are going to have to work together to finally free Lila to get her out of there and to finally leave the earth because North America is gone. Their home is gone. Most of their friends are gone. There's no reason for them to stay here. Now when it comes to Cannonball, he actually has something up his sleeve. Now really, the rest of the book is going to be the new mutants and also the future version of their friends being able to work together to fight against the Sentinels to get to Lila. Now once they're able to get her, well we kind of find out that 
Cannonball does not plan on to bring the new mutants with him. He plans to leave them on the earth. And the reason why, because he knew that they were going to arrive at that point because magic would mess up when it comes to teleporting the team back to the present day. And so he knew that all he had to do was take care of our heroes just long enough until magic will be able to come back for them and take them back to the present day. If Cannonball and Danny Moonstar of the future takes our heroes over to this new place for all the mutants to live at, well then it could possibly ruin the timeline. It could change the future to something even worse. Now when it comes to our heroes, they're also upset about the idea that Cannonball and Danny Moonstar are going to leave the Earth behind. And when it comes to Moonstar, she says, you don't understand that sooner or later, the Sentinels will then come after us as well across the universe. It might take them a few years to actually reach that point, but they are robots. Time to them means nothing. That sooner or later, they're going to have the ability to travel across space to make sure the job is finished. But again, when it comes to the future version of Cannonball and Moonstar, they're saying, you can't come with us. Thank you for helping us to get Lila, but you're going to have to stay here until your present day version of magic is able to get you and take you guys back to the present day. Now, before we do reach the end of this chapter, we do see our heroes really having no choice but to wait for magic to come get them. But before they are able to leave, you do have Magna being able to bring up a volcano right in the middle of New York to kind of say, we are going to leave our mark in this future to kind of have the Sentinels remember who we are. And so now, in this alternate future, there is going to be a volcano right in the middle of New York. And so we do jump over to New Mutants number 49. Now when we do, we pick up with Cypher, Warlock, Mirage, and Cannonball. Now when it comes to our four characters, they are trapped in an alternate future. And this future, well, mutants are first class and humans are, well, second class. Now here's the problem, because we are told that when it came to the X-Men and New Mutants, they came together to make sure that Charles' dream came to life, that mutants and humans can live together in harmony. Well, that's not the case, because now you are telling us that the mutants are getting what they deserve, but now humans are being mistreated, because humans are not getting the food they need to survive the clothes they need to stay warm, the medical health they need to stay alive, to survive. And so right now, it's kind of like, yes, you were able to help the mutants get what they deserve, but now you are mistreating humans. You're not doing Charles Xavier's dream. And so when it comes to our heroes, they hate this future because they realize this is a failed future. And the question is right now, what different points in time led up to this moment, to this future? And how can they prevent it if they are able to go back to the present day? Those are the big questions right now our heroes have. Now, something else I do want to talk about is the children. And what I mean by that is what happens to humans who have children that are mutants? Well, we kind of find out they're taken away. If you are somebody who has a child that is a mutant, well, the police officers who work for the first class will come out of their way to take your child who is a mutant away from you, no matter what. Even if you are that child's mother, they don't care. They believe the child deserves to have a better life because he is a mutant away from you, who is a human. And that is a huge problem. Now, we actually get an example of that in this storyline because you do have our heroes going out of their way to save two children who are being pulled away by their family. Now, the mom, she is trying her best to fight for her children. She hates the idea of losing them. But when it comes to their father, he didn't care. And the reason why, because we kind of find out he actually sold his kids to make some money because again, humans are being so mistreated in this future, he's all like, listen, 
If I can sell my kids to make some money so that we are able to get some good food, get some good clothes, get some medical help, then yeah, I'm going to do that. But our hero stepped in and said, no, these kids will stay with their mother. Now, we also get introduced to a character in this alternate future, and that would be Katie Power. Now, Katie Power was a character we actually talk about in the Mutant Massacre event. She was part of the Power Pack, a group of children that were given powers by an alien, and they became a group of heroes. Now, with this alternate future, well, she grew up, but she's trying to fight back against the mutants who are causing all these different kinds of problems. And so our heroes are going to work with her. But here comes the next problem though. See, with our heroes stepping in and protecting those children, well, the big boss of this organization in the far future is very upset about the idea that the police officers weren't able to grab the kids they were assigned to grab. And so then you have the officers tell their boss, well, this is the reason why, and showing all different pictures of our heroes to this big boss who we have no idea who it is. But he is so upset, he wants to put together a special team to go after them and to bring them in. Because to kind of find out, there is a group of people who are trying their best to fight back against the mutants, who say humans deserve more than this. Humans and mutants can live together. What you guys are doing is wrong. And so when it comes to the big boss, he feels like that same group is right now working with our heroes. And that is a huge problem. Now, I want to skip over a few pages and actually jump into the point where our heroes have been captured. And the reason why, because they kind of find out who's in charge in this future. And we kind of find out it is Sunspot. A future version of him that turned evil is the reason why this future is basically dark. But we also kind of find out second in charge is Magma. So two evil future version of our heroes is the reason why we have this dark future. Well, really, they're not the reasons why, but they're making sure that everything continues on like it did at the very beginning, the point where mutants took over the world. The main reason why this future exists is because Magneto had built an alliance with the Hellfire Club, and that was enough to begin the process of the mutants to take over the world. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they try to tell Sunspot and Magma what they are doing is wrong because they are not living up to Charles Xavier's dream. Matter of fact, they are doing a horrible job. But for them, they're saying, listen, what we're doing right now is not that bad. And the reason why, because mutants have been mistreated for so long that they deserve this and the humans deserve what they have gotten. But again, it's still not Charles Xavier's dream. With all that being said, you do have our heroes being able to break free thanks to Warlock, except they do get recaptured. And the only reason why they broke out in the first place is because they want to make sure that Katie Power gets away because she's from this time, meaning that if she dies, it could affect the ability of the humans being able to fight back against the mutants. But if our heroes die, then what's the point? Who cares? Because they might go back to the past and begin the process of trying to prevent this future or the possibility that magic might come in and save them and again go back in the past to try to prevent this future. But either way, they find out that in this dark future, two of their friends turn evil and then begin to ruin Charles Xavier's dream. And so we jump into the final chapter, New Mutants number 50. Now when we do, we pick up with Magic, who is currently stuck in Limbo. Now remember, her goal was to use Limbo as a way to travel back to the present day. But unfortunately, things did not work out like she wanted it. And the reason why, because Limbo has been taken over by Magus. And so now all the different demons of Limbo have turned against her because she was the ruler. 
but because she left and now Magus was able to take over, she's no longer the ruler. And these demons do not look at her as their queen. They're trying to capture her. Now, that is the moment you do have magic have the ability to escape, being able to teleport. But the question is right now, where did she go to? We then jump over to the Star Jammers. Now, the Star Jammers were a group of characters who were, well, technically pirates. Now, the leader of the group was a character known as Corsair. Now, Corsair was, or still is, the father to Cyclops and Havoc. But around this time when it came to the Star Jammers, Charles Xavier was part of his team. Let me explain. So. He got seriously injured to the point where he had no choice but to step down as the headmaster of his school, which didn't let Magneto take over. Now, when it came to the Star Jammers, they were able to heal up Charles Xavier. And because of that, he feels like he owes them. And so he has been part of the Star Jammers ever since then. But another reason why he is with them is to be with his girlfriend, his big time lover, Eleandra. Now with all that being said, you do have the Star Jammers currently at a bar, just minding their own business until you have Charles realize there's someone in the bar that he knows very well. He was able to kind of detect their mind. And we kind of find out, it was magic. So now we know what happened. After she left Limbo, she came straight over here, looking for the man she calls as her father, Charles Xavier. Now, once you have Charles Xavier being able to grab her and take her back over to the Star and Jammer ship, you then have Charles Xavier being able to wake her up. Now, once she does wake up, she is so happy to see the man who took her in when she was just a young girl, and that would be Charles Xavier. Now, right after that, you didn't have Charles being able to read her mind. Now, he has been gone for a short period of time, but in that short period of time, a lot of different things had happened. So, for example, the Mutant Massacre. And for Charles Xavier, he hated the idea of hearing that there is another evil group of mutants going around trying to rule over the world. And the reason why, because that goes against his dream. The idea of humans and mutants being able to live together as one. Now, when it came to the mutant massacre, he's also learning all the different kinds of serious injuries the X-Men had taken. Because let's not forget, currently right now, three members of the X-Men are seriously injured. Colossus, Nightcrawler, and Kitty Pride. And so for Charles Xavier, hearing all of this, you're left to believe that he might come back to Earth, take back over to school, so that the X-Men, the new mutants, will be able to actually do a better job, to train the teams in a better way. Now, when it comes to Charles, he has no idea that Jean Grey is alive. He has no idea his original five X-Men have came back together to make X-Factor. So that could be a very interesting moment. But right after that, you didn't have Charles being able to work with magic to go to the two different alternate timelines to save all her friends, the rest of the new mutants. Now, this is a great moment for Charles Xavier. And the reason why, because he's now being able to travel to two completely different kinds of futures, where one future, the mutants had basically failed. They all have been killed off and North America is being ruled by the Sentinels, and that would be the days of future past future. But then the other futures where mutants have finally rose up and gotten what they deserve, but now humans are second class, which again goes against Charles Xavier's dream. And so for him to actually see these two different timelines, these two different futures, and realize that his dream was not achieved in any one of those futures, it really bothers him. And it kind of leaves us wondering, will he rejoin the school? Will he take back over 
kick Magneto out and try to train the new mutants better, to train the new X-Men team better, to make sure they're on their A game. And so then we dive into the final few pages for today's story, where we do pick up with our heroes being able to come together for the first time since the ending of the first chapter, except right after they were able to do that, well, that is the moment they are confronted by Magus. Now, when it comes to Magus, again, he is a techno-organic being which still means that he is mostly technology, which means that you are able to hack into it. And so when it comes to our heroes, they were able to use Cypher's abilities to kind of make up a formula that will allow our heroes to attack or hack into Magus. Because remember, when it comes to Cypher, he has the ability to understand and speak any kind of language across the universe. And math is is technically its own kind of language. And so for Cypher to sit down and understand math at a higher level, he was able to build up a formula that got uploaded into Magus as a way to shut him down. And so with that happening, our heroes have won the day. They can finally go back to Earth in the present day. But the big question is right now, Will Charles Xavier return to Earth to lead the New Mutants, to lead his X-Men team? Because technically, even though the New Mutants were able to come together with the Star Jammers to defeat Magus, it was still Charles there coaching them through every single step. But this is where... And so getting back into our coverage over X-Men comics leading up to the fall of the mutant storyline, we do pick up with new mutants number 51 and 52. Now, this two-part story arc really does focus more on Magneto possibly joining the Hellfire Club, but on top of that, answering a very important question. Will Charles Xavier come back to Earth to lead the X-Men, but to also become the headmaster of the school once again to teach the new mutants? And the reason why that question is really important because at the end of our last video, Charles Xavier read the mind of Magma to get an idea of what was happening on Earth ever since he had left and joined the Star Jammers. Now, because he only read the mind of Magma, he was unable to get a very clear picture of what was happening on Earth. But now because he has all the new mutants there and he's being able to read all their minds, he has a better idea. The idea of the mutant massacre event happening. An evil group of mutants going out of their way to kill off other mutants for the heck of it. On top of that, you have different countries right now trying to make different laws as a way to get rid of mutants or possibly find ways to depower mutants. But the biggest one that really did bother him the most was X Factor. Now let's not forget, when it came to X Factor to the public, they believed that it was a group of humans who were going out of their way to help hunt down mutants to make human lives you know, a little bit easier. But in reality, X Factor is trying to help out mutants and get them out of tight situations and try to teach them how to control their powers and then put them back out there in society. But the problem is though, when it comes to the new mutants, all they know is that, hey, we heard of X Factor and we heard there are really a group of characters who are hunting down mutants and that's really it. And so when Charles reads the minds of the new mutants, he finds out that X Factor is his original five students, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Beast, Iceman, Angel. And so he's left to wonder why in the world X Factor is going after their own kind for. Now we know the real reason why, but for the public, the new mutants and Charles Xavier, 
it's the idea that they're hunting down their own kind and so now he's left to wonder maybe he should go back to earth to try to fix things for the mutant race and this is a really big question because he joined the star jammers but he's also with Iliandra, his alien girlfriend and she knows that most likely he will leave and if he does that means they would no longer be able to be with one another and so we jump over to Magneto and also Storm. Now remember, around this time, the X-Men were currently at Mir Island because half their team got seriously injured in the mutant massacre event. Kitty Pride, Colossus, and Nightcrawler. Now on top of that, Magneto is the headmaster of the school, meaning that he is the leader of the X-Men. And so when it comes to Magneto, he's kind of worried about the new mutants because around this point, he has no idea where they are. We do, but he doesn't. But he also is wondering if he should accept the offer that came from the Hellfire Club. They want Magneto to become the White King of the club. Now for Storm, she says yes. But this is such a huge deal. And the reason why, because around this time, the Hellfire Club was one of the most deadliest foes of the X-Men. And so you are talking about the idea of joining up with your enemies. But for Storm, she says, look on the bright side if you do. One, when it comes to the Hellfire Club, they have a lot of assets that we could use to kind of help us out, but also other mutants around the world. Two, if you do join, maybe you'll be a better teacher than Emma Frost when it comes to the Hellions, her own group of students. But finally, the idea of kind of adding more security to the mansion, to the school, because again, the Marauders are still out there and they might come back to the school to attack the X-Men. And so why not join the Hellfire Club to grab some extra money, but to also add extra defense to the school to protect the school. And so it's Storm bringing up a lot of good reasons why Magneto should join the Hellfire Club but to also do a new game plan called Omega. And so now we jump back over to Charles Xavier and also the New Mutants and the Star Jammers. Now remember, the reason why Charles Xavier is with the Star Jammers because there was a point where he was seriously injured and they were able to save his life. And so because of that, he feels like he's in their debt. He's trying to pay back for what they have done for him. But now he's kind of wondering, should he go ahead and leave, go back to Earth and help out the mutant race or to make sure that his debt is paid? And so for him, it's kind of hard to decide until magic happens. See, when it comes to magic, she's kind of freaking out because for the new mutants and Charles to get back home safely, they have to go into limbo and use limbo as a way to teleport back to Earth. But the problem is, though, when it comes to magic being the ruler of Limbo, when she does use too much of her magic powers in Limbo, it opens up the door to her dark side, something she wants to keep away. And so just hearing the idea of like, hey, you need to use Limbo to get everybody home. She's freaking out like, no. I don't want to do that. Now, also in Limbo, there's also a group of demons who are trying to technically get rid of her. They're trying to say, we don't need you as our leader. We have Sin who can be our leader. And so the idea of facing a war in Limbo, but to also say the dark side of her might come out, it's a lot to deal with. But you have Charles Xavier cross some lines. And what he does is that he tells Karma to use her powers to possess the body of magic to bring her outside of her room. And once that is done, he tells her to use the powers of magic to get everyone home, to make magic open up a portal to lead to limbo that will lead back to Earth. And that's crossing so many lines because a young girl just told Charles, hey, I don't want to use Limbo. I hate using Limbo. I'm scared of my dark side. And here goes Charles saying, mm -hmm, I understand. Hey, Karma, use your powers on her to force her to do what I want y'all to do, which is go back home. And so it happens. 
Like literally it happens. Now for Charles, he tries to say that he is innocent only because the star jammers are currently being attacked and he wants to protect his students. But again, you did cross some lines using one student on the other. Now, he does tell us the readers that he is not going back to Earth because again, he owes so much to the Star Jammers. And once they're out of danger and he feels like he paid his debt, then he'll go back to Earth to continue to help the mutant race against the human race. And so the new mutants, they go back to Earth and Charles stays. Now, thanks to Charles Xavier, even though he was able to get his students back home, well, Magic is very upset because she told him, I don't want to use Limbo at all. And she was forced to. And so she is so upset, she goes back to Limbo, leaving us wondering what the heck she's going to do there. But she does tell our other heroes, once she does come back from Limbo, come back to Earth, she is going to attack the new mutants. And we're left to wonder, will she actually do that? But getting back over to Magneto, we get confirmation that he has joined the Hellfire Club as the White King. Now here's the thing, because after he has joined, well, we learned the Black King, Sebastian Shaw, has something up his sleeve. He has something big planned down the road to do to Magneto. And he also is trying to use Magneto for his own personal reasons. But he's not the only one. We also kind of find out the Black Queen, Celine, she also has something up her sleeve as well. And she's hoping that Magneto and Sebastian will kill each other off so that she'll be able to pull off her plan. But either way, at the end of this chapter, Magneto is a member of the Hellfire Club. And so then we jump into New Mutants number 52. And when we do, we pick up with, of course, the New Mutants fighting against the Marauders. And you're probably wondering, hey Fresh, how in the world did we get to this point right here? Like, at the end of the last chapter, our heroes arrived on Earth and out of nowhere, they're fighting against the Marauders? Well, let me explain. This is a training session. Some time has passed by between the two chapters. And so Magneto came back home to find out the new mutants are back. But now he wants to train them and teach them how to fight against the Marauders. And the reason why, because in the middle of the mutant massacre, when the X-Men came back with injured people, he told them, you guys need to stay here at the school. We have no idea who the Marauders are. Of course, the New Mutants did not listen because two of their friends went missing and they actually traveled through the sewers where the mutant massacre was happening at. Now, luckily for our young heroes, they were not confronted by the Marauders, but they could have been and then could have been killed off. And that is Magneto's point. You guys were supposed to stay here at the school for your own protection. You guys went out of your own way to do your own thing and you could have been killed. And so I want you guys to learn how powerful and how deadly the Marauders truly are. And there is another reason why. And the reason why, because most of the new mutants, they believe that they're on the level of the X-Men, especially Sunspot. He hates the idea of being known as the novice group, that they are a better group than that. They have been together for a while now to the point where they could be almost good as the X-Men. We know that is not true, but in their minds, their young minds, most of them kind of believe that. But for Magneto, no, that's not the case. You need to learn how to protect yourself if you're going to go against my rules and get yourselves into huge trouble. But getting back over to Magic, we see that she has left to Limbo. Well, matter of fact, she's still in Limbo. She never did come back. But with her being in Limbo, she's trying to fight against Sin and other demons who are trying to remove her. Because when it came to our previous video, 
Magus, the father to Warlock, was kind of able to take over Limbo. Matter of fact, spread his techno virus to all the different creatures of Limbo. And so because of that, you have these demons kind of half demonic, half cybernetic, and they're trying to remove her as their queen. But she's trying to regain control of this area. And matter of fact, the leader of the group that's trying to get rid of her is Sin, who used to be her right-hand man. But he's trying to get rid of her, like I said. And so the next few pages is her trying to stop him and regain control. But the problem is he just keeps coming back over and over again. Now we also get a reminder of what happened in the previous story arc. Remember, the new mutants had traveled to two alternate timelines, two future alternate timelines where a lot of dark things had happened. And so when it comes to our heroes, they want to make sure that those two timelines never come to exist. And the question is, how? How can we change the timeline to make sure they don't come? And so when it comes to Danny Moonstar, she says, we just have to take life one day at a time to kind of figure out where it went wrong at or what could have possibly be the reasons why that led into those two alternate futures. And so our heroes just going to have to stay on their A game to make sure those two futures never come around. Now we pick up with Magneto, and when it comes to Magneto, he's very worried about being too harsh on the new mutants, but at the same time, they did go against his rules. He told them to stay on campus. They didn't do that. And so he feels like, you know what, maybe he was a tad bit harsh when it came to the danger room training, but also grounding them to say, you are no longer able to leave the school grounds. Now, that is when he is confronted by, of course, Karma. And when it comes to Karma, she's very worried about her brother and sister. And remember, when it came to the only chapter for the New Mutants and the Mutant Massacre storyline, the reason why the New Mutants went into the city was to look for Karma and also Magic because they went to the city to look for Karma's missing brother and sister. But the problem is, we're now seven issues later after the mutant massacre and there's still no clue of where her brother and sister could possibly be yet. And so she's asking Magneto, can she leave? He says no, because he wants to protect her, but also he's working very hard to hopefully find them. But at the same time, she still doesn't listen. We can tell that she is plotting to sneak away to go try to find her siblings. And so you have the final part of today's video be more of Magneto sitting down with magic. And honestly, I love this conversation so much because it's Magneto wanting her to realize that she's currently fighting her inner demons. She is scared of her dark side coming out. And he says, I get that. For many years, I was a bad guy, and only recently, I turned into a good guy. But the world still has me labeled as a bad guy. But sometimes, I get urges to go back to my old ways, to go back to the days where I was an evil mutant. But when I think of those old days, it reminds me those ways were the wrong ways when it came to helping out the mutant race that my new role is a better role to help out the mutant race. And so he tells Magic, what if you trying to fight against your dark side, your inner demons can be really used more of a motivation to make sure you don't slip up, that you don't turn into that person that you are afraid to become because you're trying to save Limbo. You're trying to get rid of the demons who are trying to get rid of you. You're trying to be the queen of Limbo again but you are afraid of your dark side coming out. Well, why not use your inner demons to motivate yourself to make sure you do not become that person you are scared to become? And once she kind of realized what he is saying to her, just like that, she snaps out of her funk. She's kind of like, okay, he's right. And let me go back to my normal ways and make sure I don't slip up. And the book ends with her going outside to hang out with the rest of the new mutants. But let's not forget, Magneto did join the Hellfire Club. 
But with that being said, Okay, so getting back into our coverage over X-Men comics, leading us up into the fall of the mutant storyline, we do pick up with Uncanny X-Men number 219. Now, we're only covering one book because after this story arc or this one shot, we jump into two crossovers with the X-Men, two different books where the X-Men must fight against two different teams, the Fantastic Four and the Avengers. Now, with that being said, Uncanny X-Men number 219 is really more about Havoc rejoining the team, but also the idea of the death of the X-Men. And you'll see what I mean as we go through this book. Now, this storyline does pick up where our last Uncanny X-Men video left off at. And remember, when it came to the ending of our last video, Havoc and Polaris found a ship that belonged to the alien race known as the Brood, this very nasty insect race. Now, when it comes to the Brood, the X-Men usually have a hard time dealing with them, but this time they're on Earth, and it could possibly lead to the end of the human race. And so for Havoc, he says he has to warn the X-Men about the brood. The problem is, when he tries to call the X-Men, nobody is answering, and so he flies over to the mansion. Now, he also knows that around this time, Charles Xavier has stepped down as the headmaster of the school, and Magneto took over, and so technically, Magneto is now the leader of the X-Men. But when he does arrive, he can't find anyone at first. But then, he does find the X-Men, except they all appear somewhat creepy, and they begin to surround him, and they begin to do different things to him, like, for example, Rogue takes his powers away, and you have Psylocke begin to play with his mind. And so, you're left to believe, at first, that Havoc may have run to the X-Men, who are now being controlled by the Brood, and this could be a very horrible thing. But either way, Havoc does pass out. But then you have Havoc wake up, and we kind of find out what we just saw was a dream. Now, when he does wake up, he is confronted by his girlfriend Polaris, of course, the daughter of Magneto. Now, when it comes to their conversation, we get the chance to learn that Havoc did go over to the mansion to check up on the X-Men, and when he arrived, everything was okay. Except when he came back home, that was when he began to have that dream over and over and over again. And so we're left to wonder maybe the X-Men did something to his mind. Only because every single time he has that dream, the dream only gets worse. And so he feels like the dream is trying to tell him something. And so he tells Polaris, I have to go back over there to just double check to make sure that the X-Men are truly okay. And so Polaris says, go ahead and go, and he leaves. Now, while he does leave, you do see in the far distance, the Marauders are watching Polaris because she is their next target. Now remember, the Marauders are a group of mutants who love the idea of killing off other mutants, but we have no idea who the Marauders are truly working for, but either way, they're getting ready to attack Polaris. Now, while you do have Havoc arrive at the mansion, he realized it is abandoned. Now, he does look around for some clues, and he does find Magneto's diary to kind of learn what the X-Men have been up to. Now, while reading it, well, back at home, Polaris is being attacked by the Marauders. Now, Polaris is a very powerful mutant, not really up there with her father Magneto, but still powerful. But she's fighting against three or four marauders. It's not a fair battle for her. And so, unfortunately, she's just trying her best to hold off against them. And also, Sabretooth is there. And guys, back in the early days of Marvel Comics, Sabretooth was ruthless. And so, Home was all like, I don't care who you are or what power you have. I will just keep coming after you over and over and over again. So get ready to possibly die.
Now, thanks to Magneto's diary, when it comes to Havoc, he was able to learn that recently Magneto has joined forces with the Hellfire Club. Now, we already saw that back in our New Mutant video, and so because of that storyline, we know that it's really more Magneto trying to help out the school in different kinds of ways to also help out the mutant race. Now, once you have Havoc arrive, we also get reminded that Magneto is pretending to be the older cousin of Charles Xavier who had taken over the school, trying to hide his true secret identity from some people because some folks know that he is Magneto and to other people, he's just the older cousin of Charles Xavier. Either way, when he does arrive at the Hellfire Club, he does confront Magneto, wanting to know what happened to the X-Men. But when it comes to Magneto, he's not trying to share that information. He just says, listen, the X-Men are okay, they're somewhere else, and I can't tell you, but if you have a message, go ahead and give it to me, and I'll give it to them. But Havoc still does not trust Magneto, because for many years in X-Men comics, he was their number one bad guy. Havoc had fought against Magneto a couple times, and so the idea of seeing him now a good guy is still hard to get used to. But either way, you have Magneto say you don't realize what's happening right now around the world and he's right you have all these new kind of groups popping up left and right X Factor the Marauders and more to come very soon and so it's Magneto saying dude just chill and try to tell me what you want to tell me but Havoc says no and he walks away now, you do have Havoc call up Mirror Island, and you would think, yeah, the X-Men are over there because the last time we saw them, they were at Mirror Island getting some training done, but allowing different members of their team to actually get healed up. And so Havoc calls over there to only have the phone be answered by Callisto, one of the members of the Morlocks, and she says, no, the X-Men are back in New York. Go talk to Magneto, and he'll help you get a hold of the X-Men. But Havoc already tried that and failed. And so he said, fine, you know what? What about Cyclops? Do you know where I can find my brother? Now, when it comes to Callisto, she's very rude. And she tells Havoc, listen, man, if you want to find your brother, look in the yellow pages and just hangs the phone up on him. Now, when we jump back over to Polaris, She's still fighting against the Marauders, and she is struggling, but she's trying her best. And that is why I say, like, it's not a fair battle for her. You are talking about the idea of four or five different members of the Marauders coming after her at once. And on top of that, they were able to ambush her. She had no time to get properly prepared. And so, unfortunately, we're left to wonder, will she die or possibly get away? But we have to jump back over to Havoc, who is currently following Magneto. He is the only person who may know where the X-Men truly are. And so while you have Havoc following Magneto, they go into the subway tunnels. Now, every single step Magneto takes to make sure that no one is following him, Havoc is doing a good job hiding, and Havoc is also being able to find every single kind of secret door to continue to follow Magneto. But once he's able to get down to the lowest part of the subway tunnels, he does find the X-Men. And the problem is, though, the X-Men are talking about the idea of disappearing. Now, the reason why? Because of the Marauders. And let me explain. Back in the Mutant Massacre, storyline, the Marauders' main goal at first was to go after the Morlocks. At the end of that storyline, Sabretooth did arrive at the X-Mansion and began to attack the different members of the X-Men. And so the Storm, she's kind of worried about the idea of the Marauders trying to come back to finish the job because half their team is injured. Colossus, Nightcrawler, Shadowcat, the other half are still new. The only two members of the team who are technically, you know, veterans are Wolverine and Storm. And so they're saying we have to disappear. We have to make sure the world believes that we are truly dead until our team can one, get trained up, but two, our team can get completely healed up as well. And Havoc cannot believe what he is hearing, except out of nowhere, someone begins to grab him from behind. 
which he does freak out and begin to fight against the X-Men. Now, once you have both sides being able to calm down, really thanks to Psylocke, we kind of find out that at the very beginning of this storyline, when it came to Havoc arriving at the mansion, they mind wiped him because back then they were already plotting the idea of disappearing to make sure the world had truly forgotten about them. And so when it came to Havoc walking in, they were like, hey, we got to make sure he also thinks we're dead or forgets about us because when he he hears the news we're dead he will possibly just move on with his life but now he's back here because Psylocke is still somewhat learning how to use her powers but on top of that Havoc was part of the X-Men Charles taught Havoc how to fight against psychic attacks like Psylocke and so he was able to remember to only come back here to this point but you have Storm say listen we have a lot going on right now currently and we felt like to protect you but to also protect our plan we made you forget and Havoc says that's not fair because I was an X-Men before you were and he's right because right after the original five it was Polaris and Havoc and then you have the new X-Men team come in and so for Havoc he says I have the right to be part of the X-Men no matter what and know what's going on with the X-Men no matter what and so if you guys are going through something then let me rejoin the team. And you have Magneto say, fine, if you're going to, you need to understand that right now, the world is having a lot of problems and those problems are affecting the mutant race left and right. And so if you're going to join us, just know you are about to go down a dark path. But to end today's video, we jump back over to Polaris. Now, when it comes to Polaris, she's still fighting against the Marauders. Unfortunately, she does lose the battle to the Marauders, or really their fifth member who arrives a tad bit late, and that would be Malice. And remember, Malice has the ability to possess your body, and so currently she is possessing the body of Polaris, and now it seems like Polaris will be forced to work alongside the Marauders. But this is What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. All right, so we are going to continue our coverage over X-Men comics as we work our way up to the Fall of the Mutant storyline. Now, the next book we have to cover is Fantastic Four vs. X-Men. Now, when it comes to this crossover, it's really interesting because this was the first step of Chris Claremont removing Kitty Pride from the X-Men. Let me explain. So, when it came to the Fall all of the mutants era of X-Men comics, Chris Claremont felt like it was about time to get rid of some old characters to bring in some new characters. And matter of fact, when it came to the X-Men at this point, they already gained three new members, Dazzler, Psylocke, and Longshot. Now, when it comes to Kitty Pride, yes, she will no longer be part of the X-Men, but should be able to join a brand new team coming down the road, better known as Excalibur. And so this was just a building block to get to that point right there to introduce another X-Men book. Now, with that being said, remember, when it came to Kitty Pride, she got seriously injured to the point where she is unable to turn off her phasing ability. Now, that's a huge problem, and the reason why, because sooner or later, she is going to completely disappear. Her molecules are breaking apart, and so the X-Men must find a way to save her by turning off her phasing ability before she no longer exists. And so getting into today's video, we do pick up with Franklin Richards' having a nightmare. Now, when it comes to Franklin, in this nightmare, he sees his father, Reed Richards, being the reason why both the X-Men and the Fantastic Four are both dead. Now, we're not told how they died, but apparently Reed is responsible, and apparently he knew a day like this would come. Now, 
Here's the thing. Because you have Franklin try his best to stop his father from doing something that could technically turn him completely evil. But to Reed, he tells Franklin, no son, you cannot stop me. Nobody can stop me. Like I said, I knew this day would have come sooner or later. And so you have Reed pick up a book. Now this book is actually his old college journal. But apparently Reed ever since then knew a day like this would come. Now as soon as Reed picks up the book and he opens it, a beam of light shoots out of it and begins the process of turning Reed into Doctor Doom to say that down the road, possibly, Reed is going to be the reason why the X-Men and the Fantastic Four die. And if that does happen, there's a possibility that Reed might become the next Dr. Doom. Now, like I said though, that was a dream. So you do have Franklin wake up, but he wakes up scared and he wants to be comfort. And so he goes over to Reed. Now, like every almost classic Fantastic Four book, when it comes to Reed being in his lab, he somewhat, not really somewhat, he does ignore his family. And so you have Franklin coming to his father looking to be comfort and you have Reese say hey man sorry I'm busy go find your mom matter of fact I'll call her and tell her to take care of you and so he does that and so you have Susan take over for Reed and you have Franklin tell Susan what he saw in that nightmare now for Susan she's kind of like dude it's a nightmare calm down you know what everyone has weird dreams don't worry those dreams will not come to life, except you have Susan going through some old boxes and she finds Reed Richards' old college journal. And as soon as she shows Franklin, he begins to freak out because in his dream, he saw that book be the reason why his father turned into Dr. Doom. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, well, they're currently at Mirror Island with Morim and Tagger and also Magneto as they try to find some kind of way to save the life of Kitty Pride. And so they're wondering what they can do before the possibility of Kitty no longer being around. But while you have the team just hanging out outside or inside trying to find different ways to save Kitty Pride, well, that is the moment where you have Magneto contact the entire team because apparently he got word that Reed Richards might have some kind of device that could really help out Kitty Pride. And so you have Magneto say, hey, I'm going to call up Reed Richards. Now for the X-Men, they're kind of concerned, will the Fantastic Four come? Because Magneto used to be a bad guy for a very long time in X-Men comics, only recently being turned into a good guy. And so to the rest of the world, they still look at him as a villain. And so the X-Men are very worried that Reed might say no because of Magneto. We did jump over to Dazzler and also Longshot because right now they're in the middle of the ocean trying to find a missing fisherman. And honestly, it does not take them that long to find him, except this missing fisherman is going to be very important for the next chapter of this story. But getting back over to the Fantastic Four, you have Reed wanting to spend some time with Susan, except when he tries to, you know, be that good old husband, well, she turns around angry at him because she read his college journal and what she read could possibly bring the end to the Fantastic Four. We then jump over to She-Hulk. Now remember, around this time, She-Hulk was part of the Fantastic Four. Honestly, I would say the Fantastic Five because you have Finn Grimm, you have the Human Torch, you have She-Hulk, you have Susan, you have Reed, like you have five people on a four person team. Either way, let's not forget, She-Hulk is a lawyer and currently she's working on something when it comes to Magneto. That right there is not really important because while she's working on that case, 
Well, she is confronted by Ben Grimm. And you have the two characters have a conversation about how they feel about Magneto. When it comes to She-Hulk, she feels like everybody deserves a second chance. And when it comes to Magneto now being part of the X-Men, there's a good chance that he's actually good. Except for Ben Grimm, he believes that no bad guy will actually turn good. They always stay evil no matter what. And so for him, he says he can never trust Magneto at all, no matter what Magneto does to show that he is a good guy. Now, while you have the two characters talking to one another, they do hear a loud explosion. And a building is falling apart. And so you have She-Hulk and Ben Grimm try to save the day. Now, you also have Magneto appear as well, alongside with the Human Torch. And you have all four characters work together to save this building. Now, here's the thing, because now with Ben Graham seeing Magneto in action, it's him kind of beginning the process of looking at Magneto in a better way. Either way, once you have our heroes be able to save the building, they do ask Magneto, why are you here? He says he needs to talk to Reed Richards. And so we do see our heroes go back over to the Baxter building. Now, when they do arrive, you do have Magneto asking Reed for his help to hopefully use his new device to save the life of Kitty Pride. Now, here's the thing. Reed, he does say yes but he does look depressed and the reason why because he's currently arguing with his wife susan about what she had read in that journal but here's the thing because whatever happened in that journal begins the process of putting doubt in the mind of Reed Richards. And that's not normal, because when it comes to science, Reed is very confident about almost anything in science. But now, he's beginning to have doubts about his invention being able to help out Kitty Pride. And so even though he does say yes, he's kind of like, it's going to fail possibly. Now, Susan does not go with the Fantastic Four because, well, she's upset with her husband, but somebody got to take care of Franklin. Now, on their way over to Mir Island, you have the other members of the Fantastic Four realize there's something wrong with Reed. But the question is, what? And so you have been asked, Reed, hey, dude, are you okay? Now, you have Reed tell Ben, yeah, not really, because I'm having doubt that my device can actually help out Kitty Pride to save her life. Now, you have been tell Reed, why are you having doubt? Like, dude, almost every single time when it comes to science, you are always right, except one time. And of course, that would be the cosmic rays. Now, as soon as Reed hears that, it kind of tells us that whatever was written in that journal that ticked off Susan had to be about the cosmic rays that gave our heroes their abilities, that made them the Fantastic Four. And so because of that, he's now having doubt right now if he is able to save the life of Kitty Pride. Either way, they do arrive to Mir Island. But right after they do arrive to Mir Island, you have Reed tell everyone there that he is sorry. And they're kind of like, sorry about what? And Reed says, I cannot help you. I cannot do this. My device is not going to work. Sorry for wasting your time. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, they get very upset because they're wondering, then what's the point of you being here? You came all the way out here with your device to help us, and now you're telling us you can't? Now, Reed does not tell our heroes why he cannot help them. It's just him saying, no, I cannot do it, because he feels like his device might actually kill off Kitty Pride. Either way, you have the X-Men get very ticked off, especially Wolverine, who wants some answers, who begins the battle between the two teams. And so as we dive into the second chapter, well, we pick up with Wolverine attacking Reed. We are now getting Fantastic Four versus the X-Men. Now, 
here's the thing though guys because all of this could have had been avoided if Wolverine had just sat down and tried to talk to Reed and figure out why Reed no longer wants to help out the X-Men instead of trying to attack Reed. And so with Wolverine attacking Reed, well, Ben Grimm, the Human Torch, and also She-Hulk, they're kind of like, hey, you can attack our man like that. Now we have to jump you. And so while you have those people trying to jump Wolverine, you have the rest of the X-Men want to fight against the Fantastic Four as well as a way to protect Wolverine. And so it's kind of like, oh my God, Wolverine, this is all your fault. This whole fight is all your fault because you could not sit down and actually talk to people. Now, as the fighting goes on, Storm, she does get burned by the Human Torch. And that burn is somewhat important for this story arc. You also have Rogue being able to use her abilities to absorb the powers of Ben Grimm. And so now Rogue is technically a she-thing. But either way, Psylocke arrives and she realizes all of this mess is because of Wolverine being a hothead. Now, there is something I want to talk about, and that would be Franklin Richards. See, around his time, he had the ability to project himself in other locations as long as he was asleep. It was kind of like a psychic projection. Either way, when he does that, he is able to kind of be there, but no one else noticed that he is actually there. And so while you had the X-Men and the Fantastic Four fighting against one another, he had once again project himself over to the island to only see the two teams fighting against each other. And that scared him. And the reason why? Because of his first dream, the idea of his father turning evil. And he feels like that battle right there is the first step of his first dream actually happening. And so when he wakes up and he cries out for his mom, you do have Susan doing a great job trying to comfort her son. But when he tells her everything he saw on Mere Island, thanks to his, again, psychic projection well she's kind of like this is all reed's fault because now it seems like one our child is having a hard time but two what she had read in that journal could lead to the end of the fantastic four now we have to jump over to Longshot, Dazzler, and also Havoc because they're also on Mere Island, but they're inside the actual lab. Because remember, earlier Dazzler and Longshot went out of their way to find a missing fisherman. And so they're trying to see if he is going to survive. Except you have Havoc tell them, hey, the rest of the team right now is fighting against the Fantastic Four. What in the world is going on? we have to go help out our team and so they leave but as soon as they leave the man they saved earlier wakes up except we kind of find out it's not a man it's some kind of machine and he's all like okay it's now time for me to begin my plan but getting back outside you do have more metagger and also storm being able to calm both sides down they kind of say, Wolverine, this is all your fault. The reason why both teams are fighting against each other because you're being a hothead. Now, once both sides do calm down, you have Storm ask Reed once again, please, can you help us out? Can you save Kitty Pry's life? And he says no, because again, he's now beginning to doubt himself as a scientist. Now, right after he says that, you then have that robot man comes out and that robot man begin to change into some kind of projector because this robot belongs to Dr. Doom. And so with the robot now being a projector, it begins to project Dr. Doom, allowing him to have a conversation with the Fantastic Four and the X-Men. Now, when it comes to Dr. Doom, he says, listen, I just got word that you guys need someone to help you out with your Kitty Pride problem. What if I tell you guys I have a machine that's very similar to Reed Richards' machine? What if my machine can actually help her? Now for our heroes, they are quick to say yes, we will go to you for help. Now, when it comes to the Fantastic Four, they tell the X-Men, hey guys, 
Don't do that because even if he does help you out, you are going to be in his debt. And I'm telling you right now, you are going to hate working for that man or working with that man. But for our heroes, the X-Men, they don't care because again, Kitty Pride is on the verge of actually dying. And so right now, they're down to do almost anything to save her life. And so even though you have Reed just saying over and over again, the X-Men are not listening. And matter of fact, you have more of Tiger tell Reed, this is my island and you failed us. So go ahead and go right now. And you have Reed and the Fantastic Four having no choice but to go ahead and leave and watch the X-Men accept Dr. Doom's offer. And so we do jump back over to the Fantastic Four at the Baxter building. Now, this is them having a family meeting. And this meeting is not really a good one. And the reason why, because when it comes to the rest of the team, they have now all read what was in the journal of Reed Richards. And we kind of find out it has to deal with the idea of their origin. Let me explain. So when Stan Lee wrote the Fantastic Four, our heroes were going to travel in space. And he told his team, my rocket should protect us from the cosmic rays. We already know that was actually incorrect. They were hit by the cosmic rays and they became the Fantastic Four. Well, in this what could be a retcon, Reed knew the entire time what was going to happen to him and his team. And matter of fact, he intended for him and his team to get hit with the cosmic rays. And here's the reason why. Because Reed did a lot of studying over human evolution. He wanted to know what would come next for the human race. Now he did read over a lot of papers that were written by Charles Xavier that basically stated the next step was going to be mutants. And that was a huge thing for Reed. He wanted to prove that was not going to be the only next step of evolution for the human race. There could be many different ways that humans may evolve. And that is where cosmic rays got involved. He wanted to prove that cosmic rays could possibly help humans evolve as well. And so when it came to Stan Lee's origin for the Fantastic Four, it's now saying, no, that is wrong. Instead, Reed knew what would happen. He intended for him and the rest of his team to gain powers, to use them as proof as there is another way for humans to evolve. And this is a huge retcon, except you have Reed trying to state that he didn't write this. If he did, he does not remember. But the rest of the team, they don't believe him. They're kind of like, nah, man, you knew. You hid that secret from us, and that's messed up. And so it does seem like to be the end of the Fantastic Four. And so as we dive into the third chapter, we do pick up with the X-Men now in Latveria. Now, while being there, you do have Dr. Doom trying to help out Kitty Pride, but first, he must help out Storm. And the reason why? Because Dr. Doom has a huge crush on her. When it comes to Dr. Doom, he has a lot of respect for Storm to the point where he has been trying to get with her for a very long time. Matter of fact, in one of her first appearances in X-Men comics, the X-Men came over to Latveria and even then Storm was all like, hmm, Dr. Doom seems to like me. And he was kind of like, yo, I really do like her and I want her by my side. And so currently you have him just trying to fix up her burn wound that she had received from the Human Torch in the last chapter. But we have to shift our focus over to Kitty Pride because remember, this entire storyline is about Doctor Doom trying to help her and turn off her phasing ability. Either way, when it comes to Kitty Pride, she's at the point where she wants to commit suicide. She wants to go ahead and let her powers take her away. 
and the reason why so the x-men will not be in dr doom's debt and so she does begin the process of trying to kill herself off now franklin richards is also there as well because remember every single time he falls asleep he is able to psychic project himself somewhere else in the world and once again he's doing it right next to kitty pride but remember nobody can usually see him only he can see the people around him in his projection form and so he does see kitty pride about to commit suicide and he tries his best to stop her to the point where he does wake up her pet dragon which then warns the rest of the x-men what she is trying to do now you have psylocke try to communicate with kitty pride with their minds saying hey listen don't do this we're okay with dr doom helping you he can help you he can save your life please don't kill yourself but again she does not want the x-men to be in dr doom's debt now while she's about to commit suicide flake franklin almost said flaken franklin richards is able to yell out loud to the point where now other people can see his projection and so he cries out to her to say hey please don't do this please stop like the x-men are gonna win you're going to be healed the fantastic four is not going to end it's him crying and hoping that everything works out for both teams and kitty pride seeing him cry made her realize that it's most likely not a good idea to commit suicide in front of him, but at the same time, she kind of got hope thanks to Franklin because Franklin does believe that everything is going to work out. We do jump back over to the Baxter building, and the reason why, because we pick up with Reed Richards telling Gus that he does not believe what he has saw in his journal. Like, yes, it is basically written in a way that he usually writes, but he does not remember writing that. And so he's now beginning to have doubt about his own memory he feels like maybe he did write this maybe he did plan to make the fantastic four and when the rays hit him he had possibly forgotten it's him kind of wondering what is real and what is not real now he wants to sit down and talk to his wife but he can't he feels like he broken her heart because again he changed her life as well without her permission and so instead he goes to check in on his son who is currently going through something at the moment with the whole idea of him just seeing kitty pride about to commit suicide and so you have reed being there for his son and being able to have a great father and son moment and while you have the two characters having this moment Susan sees the two hanging out and that is when she realized okay I don't believe that Reed wrote that in his journal many years ago somebody else did but the question is right now who but we jump over to Ben Grimm who is currently moping around the city now when it comes to Ben Grimm the reason why is because he feels like his best friend purposely turned him into the thing and so for Ben Grimm he feels betrayed but also the idea that he has no one to love now for the hardcore fans out there when it comes to the Fantastic Four let's not forget around his time Alicia Masters was not dating Ben Grimm she was dating the Human Torch and so Homeboy has no one to love and he feels like he is a monster. Now, the only reason he's able to overcome these feelings is when he goes out of his way to save a young girl in a very bad car accident. And once he's able to save her, and you have the mom and the daughter show a lot of love towards him, he realized that even though he may look like a monster, the people don't look at him like that. They look at him as a hero. And so he is able to continue on. 
Now, the ending of the third chapter is really more the idea of the Fantastic Four coming back together as a team. You had every single member realize why they are part of this team, but also you have Reed Richards still having doubt about his device that could have been used to help out Kitty Pride because he feels like there's some errors when it came to his design, but he's now hoping that Doctor Doom will be able to overcome the errors that he had made to hopefully save Kitty Pride. But at least on the bright side, the Fantastic Four came back together. They all have forgiven Reed, but they all believe that Reed did not actually write that journal that somebody else did. But again, the question is who? Now, when we jump into the fourth chapter, we do pick up with Kitty Pride. Now, is Kitty Pride just patiently waiting for Dr. Doom to do something that could possibly save her life? Now, that is the moment where she is confronted by Franklin Richards. And again, this is just him psychically projecting himself into the area now when it comes to franklin he does tell kitty pride the fantastic four are on their way to help her out that his father may have found a way to actually save her life now when it comes to franklin he also mentions the idea of his nightmare at the very beginning of this story because remember he believed the book that was found was going to lead into his father possibly turning into some kind of evil version of himself or become just as evil as Doctor Doom. And because the book has been found, it's Franklin saying, I'm very worried about the idea of my father turning evil or possibly Doctor Doom winning. Either way, you have Kitty Pride and Franklin being able to kind of talk to each other to comfort each other because they're both going through different kinds of things. Now we do jump over to the Fantastic Four, who are right now using their jet to head over to Latveria. Now on their way there, you do have the Human Torch explain the origin of Reed Richards and Doctor Doom. Not completely, but to kind of give us the details of why Doctor Doom hates Reed so much. And we kind of find out that these two characters used to attend the same college. Except as soon as Reed had met Victor, they became rivals in different kinds of ways. Now for Reed, I won't say really he looked at Victor as a rival. It was more that he kind of respected Doom because how smart Dr. Doom was. And matter of fact, wanted to be his friend. But for Victor, it was more of, no, I don't like you. I don't like the idea of someone being as smart as me. And so again, the two became rivals. Now there was a project that Dr. Doom was working on and Reed tried to tell Doom that he had made a few mistakes. But because Doom believed that he was smarter than Reed, he ignored what Reed said. But unfortunately, Reed was right. And so Doom's experiment fell apart. And so ever since that day, Dr. Doom had a bunch of bunch of hatred towards Reed Richards. We did jump over to Magneto and Storm. Now, this is the moment where you have the book kind of give us a quick reminder of something very important about Magneto. Because remember, around this time in Marvel Comics, he was the father to Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver and also Polaris, but around this time you have Magneto beginning to hint at the idea there was a fourth child who came before all three of them, except that child died. There was a fire at his home and unfortunately his powers were way weaker back then and so he was only able to save himself and his wife but unfortunately not his daughter Anya. And so she died in that burning building. And so ever since then, it really did bother Magneto a lot. Now, before he's able to explain more about his daughter, well, you have Dr. Doom project in front of him saying, listen, man, you are out here using your magnetic powers and that's ruining my whole entire experiment that could possibly save Kitty Pryde's life. So please, stop using your powers until I am able to save your student's life. 
Now, before we are able to move on, well, that is the moment where you have the Fantastic Four appear. Now, remember, the Fantastic Four is only here to help out the X-Men to see if Reed is able to actually fix the machine that he was trying to use originally to hopefully save Kitty Pryde's life. But the problem is, though, the X-Men, they're on edge because the last time they saw the Fantastic Four, well, it was a battle. But on top of that, Reed let them down. And so you have the X-Men wondering why in the world are the Fantastic Four here for? Now, once again, it's thanks to certain members of the X-Men, Rogue and Wolverine, where it does lead into another battle. Because at first, when you do have the Fantastic Four land, you have Reed try to talk to Magneto about the idea of having another attempt at saving the life of Kitty Pride. But because Wolverine and Rogue are both hot-headed people, well, they begin to attack the Fantastic Four, who did try to defend themselves. Now, this fight does go on for a few pages until you have Franklin Richard stop everybody to say, guys, look at y'all. You are fighting each other, and right now, Kitty Pryde needs all of us to make it through. So please, Put your differences to the side and try to help one another to save her life. And so this leads into the moment where you have Reed explain what was wrong with his device and most likely was wrong with also Dr. Doom's device. And we kind of find out that their devices are not made in a way to actually help Kitty Pride out. It could possibly make things worse for her because remember right now her molecules are breaking apart to the point where she might disappear completely and so when it comes to their devices well it might actually make things a whole lot worse speed up the process and so is Reed saying dude I realize what is wrong with your device because again is similar to mine except Reed cannot really explain what is actually wrong he's having a hard time trying to figure it out now this is what Dr. Doom wanted and what I mean by that is it technically tells us right here it was Dr. Doom who wrote that in Reed's journal just in case for a time like this where Reed will have doubt himself about how smart he truly is and so right now even though Reed realized what is wrong with Dr. Doom's advice? Reed cannot fix it though. And so is Dr. Doom saying, you know what, Reed? Go ahead and ask me, or we can have Psylocke probe your mind to get the answers we all need. And so for Reed, he hates the idea that it comes down to this moment right here. To reverse the effects of their machine on Kitty Pride, he might have to ask the help of Dr. Doom. But at the same time, he does not want to do that. He does not want to give Dr. Doom something that he may love. And so we see the X-Men freaking out because Kitty Pride is getting worse at a faster rate. You have everybody staring down Reed. You have Reed panicking and you have Dr. Doom just looking at Reed like, yes, I finally won. Except at the end of the book, a few hours later, we kind of find out they were able to reverse the effects of their machine. And now they have begun the proper healing process for Kitty Pride, meaning that sooner or later, she should be able to go back to normal. Just like that. Literally just like that. Now, you have Susan confront Dr. Doom. And the reason why, because she was able to realize that it was Dr. Doom who wrote in Reed's journal many years ago as a way to set up a moment like this. So Dr. Doom has been waiting for a moment like this for a very long time. And of course, it finally came. Now, the book really ends on that note right there. Kitty Pride is now in the process of being healed and most likely being a member of the X-Men are technically on her way out to join a new team. But with that being said, What's going on there YouTube and welcome back to another comic book video. 
All right, so we are going to continue our coverage over X-Men comics as we work our way up to the fall of the mutant storyline. And we do pick up with Avengers vs. X-Men. This was the first time these two teams had fought against each other in a somewhat big event, a huge crossover. Now, this is also, I say personally, the trial of Magneto. And let me explain. So, when it came to Magneto in the early days of Marvel Comics, he was known as the most deadliest villain for the X-Men. But after Uncanny X-Men number 200, well, he turned into a good guy and actually replaced Charles Xavier. He became the headmaster of the school. He began to lead the X-Men. It was him trying to be a better person to actually help out the mutant race. But the problem is though, the rest of the world still looks at him as a villain. And so even though he has been doing a lot of great things here and there, Unfortunately, the world still hates him. And so that's why I say this book is really more of the trial of Magneto. The main reason why you're going to have these two teams possibly fighting against each other. And so getting into today's storyline, we do pick up with the Avengers first. Now around this time, the Avengers were Black Knight, Captain America, Captain Marvel, Monica Rambeau, Dr. Drood, She-Hulk, and also Thor. So a very unique group of members of the Avengers. Either way, when we do pick up with our heroes, they're trying to deal with a meteor shower. Different pieces of a meteor is about to crash into different populated areas of the world. And so you do have our heroes go out of their way to protect the United States. Now, the only reason why they're only protecting the United States because Black Knight basically tells us that when he came to his research, he realized the other pieces of the meteor that is going to fall in other countries like Russia or Australia should land in areas that are not really heavily populated. Matter of fact, there should be no one there at all. So those areas should be okay. But either way, you do have the Avengers come to this one small town, go to their Kmart actually, and try to protect the area from the pieces of the meteor. Now, once they're able to do that, they begin to kind of research or look over one piece of the meteor that had crashed on top of their Quinjet. Now, at first, they realize that the piece that crashed on the Quinjet is very heavy for She-Hulk to actually lift. Now, once they're able to lift it, they also realize it's very magnetic and wondering how in the world is this meteor heavily magnetic. And so you have Black Knight being able to kind of cut off a piece of the meteor to only find metal that has been buried inside the actual meteor. And the question is why? Why is there pieces of metal buried deep inside this piece of meteor? But unfortunately for our heroes, they have no idea where this meteor came from and why there's metal inside of it. Now we have to jump over to Russia. Now around this time, it wasn't really called Russia. It was called the Soviet Union. But either way, over there, you had another superhero team better known as the Soviet Super Soldiers. Now, of course, when you had the Soviet Union go away and turn into Russia, they then changed their name over to the Winter Guard. But at this time in Marvel Comics, they were known as the Super Soviet soldiers. Either way, they're trying to deal with a different kind of problem. See, at a train yard, you had a lot of trains being derailed, causing a lot of problems here and there for our heroes to jump in and actually handle. Now, when it comes to the Soviet super soldiers around this time, you had characters like Vanguard, Ursa Major, Darkstar, 
Crimson Dynamo, and the Titanium Man. Now, each of these characters are able to come together, but then you have the Crimson Dynamo say, the reason why all these different trains got derailed because a piece of the meteor flew by. But for some reason, it had released a huge amount of electromagnetic pulse, which of course threw everything off. And so you have our heroes wondering what is currently going on with that piece of meteor. And so you have all the heroes leave to go research it. Now we have to jump over to Mir Island. And the reason why, because that is where the X-Men were staying around his time in Marvel Comics. Because remember, the mansion is technically no longer safe. With the idea of marauders might possibly come after them. But on top of that, the X-Men have three team members who are currently injured. Nightcrawler, Shadowcat, and also Colossus. And so with those three friends on the sideline, and also with the idea of marauders looking for them, the X-Men had to come to Mir Island. They're also trying to trick the world into believing that they are dead. And so around this time with the X-Men, you have Storm, Wolverine, you have Dazzler, you have Rogue, you also have Longshot as well. Oh, and we cannot forget about Havoc, the brother to Cyclops. Now, like I said earlier, Magneto is also part of the X-Men because again, after Charles Xavier stepped down, Magneto took over. Now, while you have the X-Men trying to relax on Mir Island, they also have a TV nearby them. And this TV is technically talking about different news reports that are happening around the world about the different pieces of the meteor crashing in those different areas. But you do have all these different reports talking about the idea that these different pieces were all magnetic. Now, as soon as you have the reporter say that, you have Magneto realize, oh my God, it's my old base, Asteroid M. Now, the last time we saw Asteroid M, it was destroyed when Warlock was traveling over to Earth. And so for Magneto, he believed his old base was actually gone. But now, come to find out, it never was completely gone. And so those pieces are crashing all over the earth. Now it's Magneto saying he has to go around and find some certain pieces because of his own personal reasons. And so he just leaves without actually telling the X-Men. But Wolverine saw him leave. And so you have Wolverine tell the rest of the team, hey, Magneto just left and we have no idea why which possibly mean it could be him getting into some kind of trouble. Now you do have the X-Men realize that the recent news report is talking about the different pieces of the meteor, which of course was Asteroid M, his old base that was on a meteor. And so you have our heroes realize that if Magneto is out there searching for different pieces of his old base, it could possibly be a recipe for disaster. We then jump over to the Avengers. Now, when we do, it's really more of the Avengers telling us that they got word America, Russia, Australia, and also some other countries as well are all working together to go after Magneto. The news reports that he saw was actually used by these countries to bring him out into the open so that they can actually kill him. Because like I said at the very beginning of this video, Magneto was still looked at around his time as a bad guy, as a villain, even though he had joined the X-Men and tried to be a good guy to help out his people, the world still looks at him as a bad guy because he had committed a lot of crimes. He has killed off a lot of innocent people. And so these different countries are coming together to go after him, to ambush him and then assassinate him because they all knew if word got out that pieces of his old base is crashing around the world, 
he would be very intrigued to find those pieces. And so it made the perfect time to go after him. And so to the Avengers, this is a bad thing because the Avengers and us realize around this time in Marvel Comics, the world is beginning to turn against the mutant race even more, trying to make new laws in almost every country to possibly get rid of them. And so for the Avengers, they realize if they kill off Magneto, not them, but these three, four or five countries, it could really help people out there who truly hate mutants a lot to get more people on their side because Magneto was such an evil person. And so you have the Avengers say, we have to help him and also protect him. And so we do pick up with Magneto going to a certain location to see if he is able to find a piece of Asteroid M. Except that is the moment where he is confronted by, well, the Avengers. Now, the Avengers are not just only here to protect him from being assassinated, but also here to say he deserves a fair trial. We're going to take him to a courthouse in front of a jury to give him a fair trial. But again, they first have to protect him. Now, as soon as they say that, the X-Men arrive as well. Now, the X-Men are only here because they were following Magneto. And so you have the Avengers trying their best to explain things over to the X-Men. Except they get cut off again when you have the Soviet super soldier team arrive as well. Because we kind of find out when all these different countries agreed to work together to go after Magneto, they wanted to use this group right here who would be down to kill off Magneto. America realized they could not trust the Avengers to kill off someone. So why not go and get another group of heroes? Now when She-Hulk steps in front of everyone to protect them from the Soviet super soldiers, well that group right there took She-Hulk's move as a threat because also she is trying to protect Magneto. And so for them, it's kind of like you had just declared war against the Soviet Union. And because we're that team from there, you declare war against us. So now we're going to fight against you to get to Magneto. And so you now have a three-way battle for just one guy. And so as we dive into the second chapter, we do pick up with everyone fighting against each other. Well, honestly, that is not true because you do have the X-Men being able to sneak away while you have the Avengers fighting against the Soviet super soldiers. And so while those two groups are just battling it out, you have the X-Men just being able to grab Magneto and get on their Blackbird and fly away. So honestly, this is a great moment for the X-Men to regroup, but to also have a conversation with Magneto. But we also get the chance to see the other two teams, the Avengers and the Super Soviet Super Soldiers, go against each other and who would possibly win. I'm going to tell you right now, the Avengers win easily. Now, once you have the X-Men being able to regroup with one another, you do have Magneto kind of explain to the X-Men why he was trying to find the different pieces of Asteroid M. And we kind of find out that there's different kinds of equipment on the different pieces of the asteroid that could be used for evil things. And so he wants to make sure they don't fall into the wrong hands. Now I'm going to tell you right off the bat, his main concern is that those kind of weapons could be used as a way to hunt down mutants. And because Magneto is trying to do a better job in protecting and helping mutants, he want to make sure the weapons that he had created is not used against his own people. Now, after telling the X-Men that, you have Magneto tell the X-Men this is something he must do on his own. And so he just leaves once again. 
And so you have Magneto being able to locate the original piece that he came looking for in this area. And once he's able to find that piece and begin to look around this piece of the asteroid, well, he begins to have flashbacks of the days where he was the main villain of the X-Men and all the different problems that he had caused. And so this is him hoping that once he's able to get rid of all these different kinds of dangerous weapons, but to also get rid of Asteroid M for shortest time, that he'll be able to bury the past where he was a villain. Now, unfortunately, while he is trying to get rid of this piece of Asteroid M, well, he's then confronted by the Avengers once again after they were able to defeat the Soviet super soldiers. And so it looks like we're about to get round two with the Avengers and Magneto. Now, luckily for Magneto, the X-Men had arrived to help him out. Even though the X-Men are kind of tired of him just running off and trying to deal with different problems on his own, he's still a mutant. He's still part of the X-Men. And Charles Xavier believes in Magneto. And so those three things is just good enough for them to actually help out once again. And so this time we do get the X-Men fighting against the Avengers, a full on battle. But here's the thing because when it came to Magneto finding that piece of the asteroid and being able to recover the different equipment from that piece of the asteroid, he has set up a bunch of charges to make sure the entire place blows up to make sure that any equipment that he may have left behind cannot be found. And so while you have the Avengers and the X-Men fighting against each other around this piece of Asteroid M, you have Magneto say, hey, we have to leave right now because that place right there is set to blow up. Now, the ending of the second chapter, we do see Magneto being able to put around the area a magnetic field to protect everyone who was near the piece of the asteroid M that was set to blow. And so with him doing that, everyone was able to survive the explosion. But the Avengers were completely knocked out. And so when they wake up, they realize the X-Men were able to sneak away once again, get back on the Blackbird, and now they can leave to possibly go back home. Except they have no idea that a member of the Avengers were able to sneak onto the Blackbird. And that would be Dr. Drood. And when it comes to Dr. Drood, he's using his psychic abilities to hide his appearance, to hide him being there on the Blackbird. And so for the X-Men, they have no idea he is there, but he is there to technically gather intel on why the X-Men are trying to protect a war criminal, but at the same time where the X-Men are going. And so as we dive into the third chapter, we do pick up with the Super Soviet Soldiers. And this is them kind of getting back on their feet after being defeated by the Avengers. But they also realize the X-Men are gone and so is the Avengers. Now the X-Men are flying away in their black jet and you do have the Titanium Man being able to shoot a beam at the Blackbird the X-Men are currently using. Now it's not a powerful beam Beam, it was very small but that small damage to their jet is going to grow over time and sooner or later the X-Men are going to have to land their jet and find a different way to get around the world to get away from the Avengers and also away from the uh, Soviet super soldiers. Now that leads us over to the X-Men who still have no idea that Dr. Drood is currently on the Blackbird. And matter of fact, in the middle of their flight, you have Dr. Drood try to call up the rest of the Avengers to basically tell them, hey, 
I'm with the X-Men, they have no idea I'm here, and sooner or later I should be able to gather enough intel but also a location of where the X-Men are going. Except in the middle of that call to the Avengers with his psychic abilities, well Magneto realized that Dr. Drood was on the jet. Because Magneto has a very powerful mind, his mind is well trained to protect itself against psychics like him. And so you have the X-Men say, okay, we have to drop him off somewhere else so that the Avengers cannot find us. But then you have Storm say, we have to land his jet very soon. Somebody did damage to our jet and that damage is only getting worse. And of course you already know that was the Titanium Man. And so the X-Men do land, but they make sure to drop off Dr. Drood somewhere else before they sneak away. And so we jump over to Singapore. Now the reason why, because the X-Men are hiding out here because this was the nearest location where they had to land their jet. And so Wolverine knows someone out here who could possibly give them a way to transport Magneto to a secure location. And so while you have our heroes just making sure there's no one following them and going their separate ways, we do pick up with Havoc. And you have Havoc currently being followed by a character known as Vanguard. Now Vanguard is part of the Soviet Super Soldiers group. And matter of fact, he is a mutant like his sister Darkstar. Now when it comes to Vanguard though, he has the ability of energy redirection, force field, energy projection and flight so he could be a very powerful threat if he was able to use his powers correctly and originally he could only use his powers when it came to him holding his hammer and also another piece of item as he crossed his arms and that was the only time he could access his powers until he finally learned how to use his powers either way he was able to find havoc who was trying to hide in the crowds of singapore and so you have vanguard trying his best to basically capture havoc but to only be stopped by wolverine and rogue and that tells the x-men they have to get the heck out of singapore now because now the super soviet soldiers are here and they're about to try to capture the x-men all over again and so we do pick up with the X-Men currently on a boat heading towards a secure location. Now on their way there, you do have Wolverine tell Storm while Magneto is not there that he believes that Magneto is most likely hiding something. Because Magneto did go to one particular location to destroy just one piece of Asteroid M. Now all the equipment that was inside of there was also destroyed, but Magneto did pull out his helmet. What was so important about that helmet of his? And so it's Wolverine saying he feels like Magneto is still hiding something and we have no idea what it could possibly be. Now you do have Storm try to confront Magneto, but unfortunately you have Magneto tell Storm, I have to leave because you guys are actually innocent. I'm not. The Avengers and also the Super Soviet soldiers are only coming after you to get to me. If I leave you guys behind, then they will no longer come after you guys. Except the problem is they have arrived already and they are about to attack the X-Men on the boat to get to Magneto. Now when it comes to the X-Men, they're not trying to attack the super Soviet soldiers because one, they're on a boat, and two, if the boat gets badly damaged, then most likely everyone would drown. Also the innocent people who are on the boat who is just minding their business. And so you have the X-Men really trying this time to at least talk to the other group to hopefully get rid of them. But the problem is though, Crimson Dynamo is not trying to listen. And matter of fact, when Wolverine tries to stop him without actually attacking him, you have Crimson Dynamo go ahead and attack Wolverine, which means it leads into a battle between the X-Men and also the S Soviet Super Soldiers. And this is a problem because they're on a boat. And so all their different kinds of attacks is just doing damage to the boat to begin the process of the boat 
sinking into the ocean. Now luckily the Avengers have arrived because the boat was calling out for help. And so you have the Avengers go out of their way to actually help the X-Men get all the innocent people off the boat, but to also get the Soviet super soldiers off the boat as well to save everybody. And it's kind of like, okay, the Avengers realize that the X-Men are not truly enemies it's this third party group right now who's just causing a lot of problems for no good reason. And matter of fact, once you have the fight being done and you have everyone being able to get off the boat, you didn't have the Avengers just go at it on Crimson Dynamo because it was his fault a battle even started on the boat because he was being hot-headed, looking for Magneto. Except then you have all three teams realize Magneto is no longer there, which means that he had disappeared before the fight had even happened. So where in the world did he go to? But before we are able to find out, well, we kind of find out that, well, the Avengers are going to arrest Crimson Dynamo because technically it was his fault that both basically sunk at the bottom of the ocean. And so he's getting arrested and will be taken away. But we come to find out that Magneto was able to sneak onto another boat that's currently going back to Singapore because apparently he's not done. He even says he has some unfinished business there to take care of and then everything should be okay. And so Homeboy was able to sneak onto another boat and pretend that he was there the entire time, even though we know he wasn't. And so, as we dive into the fourth and final chapter, we do pick up with the Avengers paying a visit to the office of Mr. Ronalds. Mr. Ronalds is basically the leader of a special unit that was sent out by America to go out to Singapore and capture Magneto. And they're working alongside with the police force of Singapore to make sure Magneto does get captured. Now, when it comes to the Avengers, they want to know what happened to the other two teams after the ending of the third chapter. And we kind of find out that the Soviet super soldiers went back home to Russia, but the X-Men are currently being held against their will. And the reason why, because one, they were helping Magneto escape law enforcement, but two, because they are mutants. Now, when it comes to our Avengers, they're like, you can't do that. But their conversation does get interrupted when Mr. Ronalds gets word that Magneto has been seen in Singapore. And that means his special force team is about to move in. Now, when it comes to Magneto, he's still trying to be a good guy, still trying to make sure that he does not go out of his way and harm people if he needs to get away from law enforcement. But unfortunately, out of nowhere, he is surrounded by that special force team that was sent there to capture him. And they try their best with all different kinds of weapons to capture him. But again, he's just too powerful of a mutant that he cannot be easily stopped. Now, while while trying to get away, he is confronted by three other mutants, and that would be Lyco, Crawler, and Slider. Now, they belong to a particular group of mutants, but they were sent here to help Magneto get away. And of course, he does follow them. And so you have those three characters take Magneto over to a building that belongs to a new group of mutants, better known as the Mutant Underground of Singapore. In this one particular building, you have different kinds of mutants hiding here because now you have humans in all different parts of Singapore beginning the process of going after mutants to just get rid of them. And matter of fact, we saw that other countries Countries as well. The human race is gearing up to go to war against the mutant kind. Now, with all that being said, the leader of this group is a character known as Light. And Light has the ability to know when someone is telling the truth or not. And so when they want to make sure that Magneto is actually Magneto, they ask him to say, hey, say your name and say you are him. And when he does, Light says, you are telling the truth. Now, when it comes to Light, he reminds Magneto of his early days. He's somebody who still believes that the human race 
should be killed off as a way to kind of make way for the mutants because the mutants are being attacked by the humans too much now. It's time to get rid of the humans. It's time to attack them. Now, while you have Light giving out this speech, the base is actually attacked by that same special force team we saw earlier. Now they're here trying to capture Magneto, but now innocent mutants in this building are being hit left and right. Now, Magneto is able to use his powers to defend himself and the others, but it really does tick off Magneto a lot that no matter where he goes, his own people are getting hurt. Now, you do have Light and the other members tell Magneto to follow them as they go to their backup base. But when we jump back over to the X-Men, they are currently just sitting in custody, minding their business. Now, here's the thing. When they came to the Special Force arresting the X-Men, they didn't make sure to give the X-Men some kind of special equipment that could cancel out their powers. So really, the X-Men could have escaped any time they wanted to. They were just hoping that they could do it in a more peaceful way. But unfortunately, the X-Men got tired of waiting, so they went ahead and busted out of their prison and left to hopefully find Magneto. And so you have Mr. Ronalds get very upset because the X-Men just broke free. And he asked the Avengers to go follow them, and the Avengers say no. Because it seems like you have a huge agenda against Magneto, not because of his past crimes, because he is a mutant. We then jump back over to Magneto, and when we do, we see him and Lyco and a few other members of the Mutant Underground of Singapore go to their backup base, which is on a random boat. Now, I kind of want to focus on Lyco just real briefly, and the reason why, because Lyco has the mutant ability to find other mutants. That right there is going to be very important here in a moment, but you do have Lyco realize that Magneto is working on some kind of device. Now this device, he has been hoping to use this for a very long time, but unfortunately, one person kept standing in his way, but that person is no longer on Earth. So now he has the ability to finish it and actually use it. And so once he does, we kind of find out he has the ability now to teleport people over to him. And so when the X-Men and the Avengers are confronting one another, Magneto is able to tap into the minds of both teams and say, hey, listen, I will bring you guys over to me. Matter of fact, I just want Captain America from the Avengers, but I want all of the X-Men to come here to me. And out of nowhere, those few people are teleported over to where Magneto was at. Now, we kind of find out what else the helmet could actually do. Matter of fact, the third and final ability is the most important one because we kind of find out it has the ability to access the mind of every single person on the planet. But then Magneto will have the ability to erase all the hatred that regular humans have towards the mutant race to hopefully finally bring peace to the entire world. Now, the reason why he could not use this in the past because of Charles Xavier being a very powerful psychic, that he would be able to block the helmet ability of doing that because Charles believes in free will, that they need to actually make the humans believe that mutants are not bad. We can't force them, we have to guide them into a better decision. And so when it comes to Magneto, he's kind of like, I'm down to use this. And the only reason why? Because of Lyco, this young girl who is a mutant, but now she's being hunted by humans no matter where she goes. And that's not fair. Young mutants deserve the right to grow up in a normal life. And that is very, very huge. But here's the thing. Magneto wants to use the helmet on Captain America to see that if he does use it, will Steve Rogers change his mind towards Magneto actually using the helmet on the rest of the people of Earth? Because he does tell Steve, I want to use it, but I feel like it's the wrong thing. And Steve says, yeah, because again, 
free will. So even though Magneto does use the helmet to hopefully erase any kind of hatred that Steve Rogers might have towards the mutants, which we're going to find out is completely 0%, Steve still says you cannot use that helmet because, again, free will. And so after that conversation, Magneto realized, okay, you know what? Steve is right. But on top of that, I'm tired being on the run. It's time for me to go ahead and face the charges that have been brought upon me. Now, this leads us into the court session where you have the trial of Magneto actually go on. And we already knew where this trial was going to go, where you have all these different people basically talking bad about Magneto. The trial is not going in its way at all. Now, when it comes to his lawyer, it's going to be Gabriella Haller. Now, Gabrielle Haller is very important because she's the mother to Legion. She is technically the baby mama to Charles Xavier. Either way, she is a great lawyer. But no matter what she's doing in this trial, they're losing. They are losing this battle big time. And Magneto realized what's currently happening at the moment. That no matter what she says, no matter what he says, no matter what even the witnesses say, Magneto is still being looked in a way as a bad guy. Even though he has turned good and begun the process of trying to do good things to overlook his bad things in the past, he's still being looked at as a villain. But here's the thing, Magneto did some horrible crimes in the past, killing off a lot of innocent people who were just involved because of his master plans against the human race. So even though he did some good things, well, his bad things are even worse, way worse than all the great things that he has done. But the trial does not go his way. And so now Magneto has to wait until they declare what is going to happen to him. And so with this break, you have Magneto think of a game plan. Now, before we dive into Magneto's plan, I kind of want to sit down and talk about what Magneto is thinking here. What I mean by that is Magneto believes the Chief Justice Du Motier, the guy in charge of the entire trial, could possibly be a mutant. And the reason why Magneto believes that because if Magneto goes to jail, that means the humans of the world would believe they have the right to go ahead and freely attack any mutants across the board, which could lead into a war, where then the mutants could use their abilities to defend themselves, to possibly erase the human race off the board. And so, it's Magneto saying the Chief Justice wants to use me to start a war so that mutants could finally have peace. But the problem is, there are going to be a lot of lives lost in that war down the road. That's a bad idea. And so you have Magneto call up Captain Marvel, Monica Rambeau, to go over to Singapore to find Lyco. And the reason why? Magneto wants to use Lyco ability, where again, she is able to see who, who is a mutant or not, use that ability to tell the world that the Chief Justice is a mutant and what his master plan is, and to hopefully have the trial be thrown out, but to also prevent a war, but to also show the human race that there are young mutants who will not have the chance to live a normal life because you humans want to go ahead and kill us off. That's not fair. And so he tells Marvel, go find her. She's the key to stop all of this mess. Except when Captain Marvel goes over to the base, to the underground mutant of Singapore, well, their base has been attacked. Because ever since Magneto got arrested, humans in Singapore got even crazier. They believe they have the right to do anything they want to mutants. That mutants do not have human laws to protect them. And so Lyco, she died. You're like, dang. And so Captain Marvel has to go back over to Magneto but before she does that, she stops by Du Montier's office to listen in on his conversation to see if he is actually a mutant. 
And when she does stop by Motier's office, she begins to hear a conversation he's having with someone else about the idea of starting a war. Because again, the humans are really big on killing off the mutant race. If Magneto goes to jail, that war would actually start. Now, when it comes to Magneto, he was wrong about Dumatir. Matir is not a mutant. He's a human who wants the war to start so that humans could use their weapons to eradicate the mutant race. And so for Captain Marvel, she realized that Magneto was half right, but still half wrong. And so she goes back over to Magneto to tell him what she had learned. Now for Magneto, he realized what he has to do here. He says, you know what? I got this. And so he begins to call for his helmet. Now, let's not forget. His helmet has the ability to erase any kind of hatred in anyone's mind towards the mutant race. And so once the helmet comes to him, right before his sentencing is about to be stated, he used the helmet to erase any kind of hatred in the mind of Du Matir to hopefully change the outcome of the trial. Because once you have the trial come to the closing part, where it's time to see if Magneto is actually guilty or innocent, Motir says he is actually innocent. So all trials, all trials, sorry, all charges have been dropped. Magneto won the trial. He is happy like no other. But then he realized something. The other judges who were up there with Motir did not say anything at all when it came to him saying Magneto is free to go. He believed that the other judges up there would throw a fit about the idea of letting Magneto go. But none of them did. And so that is when Magneto realized he just got played, basically. They were planning on releasing him so that the humans could build on the hatred of a mutant getting free of no charges, being able to walk away without going to jail, to basically say there's a possibility the entire actual trial was fixed, which technically it was now because of Magneto using that helmet. And so the story ends on that note because now it's Magneto saying, I could be the sole reason why the war between humans and hum or humans and mutants may have begun. And this is where What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Alright, so we're going to continue our coverage over X-Factor, and we're going to pick up with issues number 18, 19, and 20. Now, today's video is going to be about the idea of X-Factor fighting against the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse. Now, you may have noticed I said issue number 18, and the last time we saw X-Factor, it was about issue number 12 at the tail end of the Mutant Massacre storyline. The reason why we're skipping over a few books because those books were never re-released in a digital format for me to read. And so unfortunately, if I'm going to read those books, I have to find them in a physical format or read them illegally. And I'm not going to do either of those choices. Now, on top of that, those books were never collected either. Well, I heard an omnibus is coming out very soon, so possibly we can come back and cut those books down the road. But either way, we're going to go ahead and jump into the next story arc that I am able to read, which again is going to be Apocalypse sending out his three horsemen, not four yet, against X-Factor to make their days even harder. And so as we dive into today's storyline, we do pick up with X-Factor number 18. Now, the opening pages of this book kind of tell us what we have missed in those few books we had to skip over. 
For example, Iceman. See, there was a short period of time where he had disappeared from the book. And the reason why? Because he had a crossover with Thor in a two-part story arc where those two characters went up against Loki. The problem was, though, Loki had changed the powers of Iceman. Technically, power him up made him a whole lot stronger, but at the same time, Iceman is no longer able to control his powers. And so, occasionally, he might actually freeze himself. And so, our heroes have to go out of their way to unfreeze him almost every single time he tries to use his powers. Now, there is something else we should mention, and that would be the idea of Richter. Richter was another mutant they were able to save in those few books we had to skip over. And when it comes to Richter, he has powers very similar to Avalanche, the ability to make earthquakes. And so he has been saved by X-Factor and they are going to begin the process of training him. Now there is two more things we have to mention here guys, and that would be Cameron Hodge. Cameron Hodge is beginning to show his true colors. The idea that he did not really join X-Factor to help out mutants, he really joined X-Factor as a way to build up the hatred in humans towards the mutants. And you see what I mean as we go through this book. But on top of that, Cyclops believes that Jean Grey is the Phoenix, and that is going to be very important in later parts of this chapter and the next one. Now, I do want to shift my focus onto Rusty and also Skid, two people who are currently being trained by X Factor who could sooner or later become superheroes like the rest of the X Factor team. Now, remember, Rusty has the ability to control fire, and Skid, she has the ability to create a force field around her body. Now, the reason why I want to focus on these two characters is because they were introduced early on in the series, but they were able to produce a relationship with one another, which honestly is a great thing. But Skid is now afraid to fall in love. And the reason why, because she had heard the stories of Cyclops and Jean Grey, the idea that Jean Grey turned into the Dark Phoenix and became crazy. Now, let's not forget, in the earlier parts of our coverage over X Factor, we had learned it was never Jean Grey, that it was the Phoenix pretending to be Jean Grey while Jean Grey was actually inside some kind of cocoon healing up her body at the bottom of the bay. And so when it comes to Skid, she does not have the full picture, but she's still afraid of the idea that she might become the Phoenix and their love might possibly die as well. And so it kind of brings in more drama for these two characters. Now, later on in the day, we do pick up with Cyclops and Rusty having a training session with one another. Now, while the two characters are training, it does lead into a conversation about when Cyclops first realized that he was actually in love with Jean Grey. Now, while the two guys are talking, they don't realize that Jean Grey is there listening in. And so, unfortunately, this conversation is going to break her heart. And the reason why, because you have Cyclops tell Rusty that at first, their love did not count because they were children. It was puppy love. But he realized when they got older that he really did love her. But the problem was, though, it wasn't Jean Grey. It was the Phoenix. And let's not forget, the big moment that kind of established their love took place in Uncanny X-Men number 132, but that was right in the middle of the Phoenix Dark Phoenix saga. And so, of course, it didn't count because that wasn't Jean Grey. It was the Phoenix pretending to be Jean Grey. And so you have Cyclops tell Rusty, at first, I truly did believe I was in love with Jean Grey, but now I don't know because that wasn't her. It was someone else pretending to be her. And so he now believes their love is most likely not even real anymore. And Jean Grey, she hears that. It breaks her heart and she runs away. The problem was though, she was carrying a bed with her mind. That bed crashed on the ground. Cyclops overhears the crash and realizes that Jean Grey was there. Now, while you have all three characters moving around, 
Well, Cameron Hodge is watching them. And this begins the process of us seeing how truly evil this character is. And what I mean by that is, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, he did not join X-Factor to actually help them out with the idea of helping out mutants. Instead, he joined X-Factor to build up the hatred towards the mutant race. Let me explain. Because remember, when they came to X-Factor, when they first came together, they told the world that they were a group of humans who were going out of their way to hunt down mutants to help out the human race. But in reality, they were a group of mutants mutants going out of their way to find other mutants who may need their help to learn how to control their powers. It was a new take to what Charles Xavier did when he first formed the X-Men. And so you had Cameron Hodge being the man in charge of their advertisement, their PR man. And so when it came to Cameron, he kept putting out commercials, say, if you need help, call in X Factor. The problem is though, every single new commercial is getting worse and worse with the idea of saying mutants are evil, mutants deserve to be destroyed. And when it comes to Cameron, he's lying to their face saying, hey, I'm only doing that so that we can get more calls and you can find more mutants. But in reality, he's like, no, I am trying to build up the hatred towards the mutant race. But on top of that, he belongs to a group known as the right. And the right is one of many groups that are trying to get rid of the mutants across the board. Matter of fact, Cameron is the leader of that group. And so while you have Cyclops talking to Cameron about his latest commercial, Richter powers go off. And when it comes to Richter, X Factor was able to save him from a small group of people that belong to the right. But Richter powers only begin to go off again when he saw Cameron. And the reason why, because he remembers Cameron's voice. He remembers that Cameron is the leader of the right. And so when it comes to Cyclops, at first he's wondering why Richter is freaking out and he goes talks to Richter and Richter says, I remember that man's voice. I believe that he is the leader of the right. But before Cyclops is able to get more information, well, Jean Grey walks in and she's wondering why the building is shaking. We know why, it's because of Richter. But she believes it's because Cyclops is freaking the kid out. Except you have Cyclops snap back at her saying, you have no right to barge into this room and question my methods on helping this young boy. You have no idea what we were talking about or what he is going through. Now Cyclops, he storms off. The building stops shaking because Leech is there. And remember, Leech has the ability to cancel out other mutant abilities. And so with Leech being there, Richter powers are brought back to normal. But you have Jean Grey tell Leech and also Artie to stay here at Richter while she go chase after Cyclops to figure out why in the world this man is having so many mood swings. And that leads into Cyclops going into the office of Cameron Hodge to log into Cameron's computer because Cyclops is starting to believe that Cameron is not really a good person, that Cameron might most likely be up to something. But the problem is though, in the middle of his computer session, the Phoenix appears. Now, this is where I'm going to explain something else we had missed when it came to the books we had skipped over. Because when it came to Cyclops, he went back home to Alaska to finally talk to his wife, Madeline Pryor, and his son as well. But the problem was though, when he arrived at their house, the house was completely cleared. But on top of that, his wife and his son have disappeared as well. And so he's kind of like, what happened to my wife and my son? But all the clues point to the idea that they have been killed off. And so for Cyclops, he is basically a broken man. And so now with the Phoenix appearing on his computer screen, he is truly believing in the idea that Jean Grey is the Phoenix and she is playing mind games on Cyclops. And matter of fact, let's not forget that Jean Grey was following Cyclops. And so she walks into the office and the 
projection of the phoenix disappears right behind Jean Grey. And so when Cyclops looks over and sees the phoenix disappearing, he believes that Jean Grey is the phoenix. Now, something else to mention is that when it comes to Cyclops, the reason why he truly believes that Jean Grey is the Phoenix, because what happened back in San Francisco in the previous issues that unfortunately we cannot cover, because apparently she used her powers to extreme heights and she was able to pull something off. And so because of that, Cyclops believes that Jean Grey is the Phoenix. But either way, while you have the two characters going back and forth using their powers against each other, you have Cyclops confess his love for Jean Grey all over again and talking about the idea of actually helping her become a better Phoenix this time. But you had Jean Grey say, I'm not the Phoenix though. Like, I have no idea what you are talking about. But on top of that, you have Jean Grey say, you don't love me. You loved the Phoenix. Those moments you had where you thought you were falling in love with me was with her. And so now because you believe that I am the Phoenix, that you now have the chance to be with me again. That maybe this time everything's going to work out. But honestly, it can't work out because you're not looking at me as me. You're looking at me as the Phoenix. And so you have the two go back and forth until Leech is able to arrive and use his powers to cancel out Cyclops powers and Jean Grey powers. And once that happens, you have Cyclops realize, oh my God, Jean Grey is not the Phoenix because at first he believed that it was her who stopped his optic blast, but it was Leech. And so that is the moment where you have Cyclops realize Oh, you're not the Phoenix. You're just a regular person. What in the world is going on? And once you have Cyclops realize that and look over back into the room where he was at Cameron Hodge office, he sees the computer is basically sending out a hologram of the Phoenix to trick Cyclops into believing it was the Phoenix. And once you have our heroes realize that this was a trap, or not a trap, but more something being done by Cameron Hodge, it begins to show that X-Factor cannot trust that man. And what is that man truly up to? We then jump over to Apocalypse. Now, when it came to Apocalypse by this moment, he only had three of his four horsemen. And so we see him talking to somebody and talking about the idea of turning that person into his fourth horseman. Here's the thing though, because this person had apparently almost died and he had saved that man's life. And now he will give the man the ability to have his powers back, but to also go after people who took his powers away. But as we dive into issue number 19, we do focus on Cyclops and Jean Grey again. And you have Cyclops kind of feel like his mind is completely broken. The idea that his wife and child are most likely dead. The idea that he let Cameron Hodge push him to the point to believe that Jean Grey was the Phoenix. But on top of that, Cameron Hodge is most likely a bad guy. He kind of feels like he should not be here until one, his mind is actually straight again. But on top of that, he, he feels like X Factor should break apart. It should disband because honestly, the entire operation is falling apart. Angel is dead. Cameron Hodge is evil. Cyclops cannot think straight. Iceman powers are currently not working right. Like nothing is going right for this team at all. But either way, when it comes to Jean Grey, she's trying to re-establish the idea of staying together and keep Charles Xavier's dream on. But for Cyclops, he can't do that because when it comes to Charles Xavier's dream, he will be so upset to hear that his students are out there pretending to be mutant hunters and not really just going out there helping out mutants in a better and easier way. And so for Cyclops, this entire team needs to fall apart now. 
we then jump over to Iceman and Beast. Now, when it comes to those two characters, they're also with Caliban. Caliban had joined X Factor in those few books we had skipped over. He's kind of like replacing Angel, who is believed to be dead at the moment. And so when it comes to our three heroes, they were sent out into Manhattan by Karen Hodge to look for Boom Boom. And Boom Boom was another new mutant who had joined X Factor who was supposed to be training alongside with Rusty, Richter, and also Skid, and Leech, and also Artie. So they had a lot of trainees around this time in X Factor comics. Either way, when it came to Boom Boom, she had disappeared. She just ran off. Matter of fact, she has her own book right now with a few other characters better known as Fallen Angels. And so, while Iceman and Beast are looking for her, she's over there in that book having her own adventures. And we're not going to cover that series. But you have Iceman and Beast trying to find her. Now, while out there, they do run into a crowd of people who begin to hate on them because they realize that Iceman and Beast are two mutants. And this goes back to Cameron Hodge all over again because Cameron Hodge is putting out advertisements that are basically saying that mutants are evil. They should be killed off left and right. And so now the hatred towards the mutant race is growing even faster. Now, while you have Iceman, Beast, and also Caliban out there looking for Boom Boom, well, they have no idea that they are being watched by no other than Apocalypse. Now, while Apocalypse is watching over those members of X Factor, well, his three horsemen that he had recruited so far are fighting against one another to kind of see who is the most fittest of them all. Because remember, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's really big on the idea that if you are weak, you do not deserve to live. You deserve to be killed off. Only the strong may survive and leave the earth in a better direction. Now, if you are somebody that have been classified as weak, then Apocalypse will wait for you to at least try to show that you can become a strong person. But if you can't do that, then yes, he will kill you off. Now, with all that being said though, when it comes to Apocalypse, he kind of gets tired of his three horsemen fighting against one another to see who is the fittest of them all. And he says, look, if you want to prove something to me, go out there and fight against X Factor. And they do leave. Now, while they're leaving, you then have Apocalypse check in on the fourth person that he is slowly turning into his fourth horseman. And you had this person tell Apocalypse and us that he knows that Apocalypse is playing with the minds of his other three horsemen. Now, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's kind of like, yeah, I am. Why in the world would I deny that? Because matter of fact, I'm going to do the same thing to your mind once the process is done with you changing into my final fourth horseman, which is going to be death. Now, getting back over to Cyclops and Jean Grey, you have the two characters trying to teach Leech how to control his powers because sometimes his powers are really great and other times his power is not really that great. Because remember, Leech has the ability to cancel out other mutant abilities and that would be great if they're fighting against someone. But just imagine that you are about to die and your powers are the only way to save your life but Leech is next to you and your powers are canceled out and then you die. And so for the X Factor, they're trying to teach him how to kind of control his powers. Except while you have Cyclops and Jean Grey trying to teach him, you have the rest of the trainees run into the room to inform Cyclops and Jean Grey that Beast, Iceman, and Caliban are currently fighting against the three horsemen of Apocalypse. And so that leads into X Factor and also the three horsemen of Apocalypse fighting against each other. Now, while you have the two sides fighting against each other, you do have Cyclops mention the idea that these three horsemen are really proving to be an actual challenge for our heroes. Matter of fact, our heroes are having a hard time winning this battle. Now, while you have the 
two sides fighting against each other, you do have Cyclops tell Iceman to freeze the entire area around them, to basically hoping to freeze the three horsemen as well. Now, let's not forget, in the last chapter, we had learned that Iceman powers are technically not under his control anymore because he was in a storyline with Thor and Loki have gave Iceman a power up. And with that power up, well, Iceman no longer has control of his powers. And so if he does try to push himself too much, he might actually freeze himself again. And if that happens, they might not be able this time to unfreeze him. But for Cyclops, they have no choice. They have to go ahead and freeze the entire area, but to also save the innocent lives who could be affected by this battle. And so when Iceman does that, he does freeze the three horsemen of Apocalypse. And so it does look like our heroes have won, except you have Apocalypse go ahead and use the ability to teleport his three horsemen away. And so of course the bad guys got away now. But for our heroes, they also realize a crowd of people are forming around them. Now when it comes to our heroes, they're hoping that this moment right here really shows that mutants are not evil. Because let's not forget that when it comes to X-Factor, when they are wearing their regular X-Factor clothes, they are pretending to be regular humans who are mutant hunters. But when in their mutant X-Factor clothes, they go with the names X-Terminators, a group of mutants who are out there trying to get rid of X-Factor, but also trying to use that name as a way to prove that mutants are not evil. And so with the X-Factor team right now being looked at as X-Terminators, they're hoping the crowd of people will realize that they just went out of their way to save their lives from the three horsemen of Apocalypse. We then jump back over to the base of X-Factor. Now, when we do, we pick up with the trainees of X-Factor, who are making lunch for everyone who's part of X-Factor, and the main team has not come back yet from their last battle against the three horsemen of Apocalypse, but they're on their way back very soon. Either way, while you have the trainees making lunch, it does lead into an argument between Rusty and also Richter. And the reason why the two arguing is because what Richter had heard Iceman when X-Factor had saved him in those few books we had skipped over. See, when it came to Iceman, he said that mutants should only be judged by what they have done, not by who they are. And that is really, really important. Iceman is correct. Except when it comes to Richter, he said, how dare Iceman say that, but him and the others go out in the world pretending to be mutant hunters, only helping the idea that mutants should be hunted down. Because let's not forget, this period of time of Marvel Comics, mutants are beginning to see more hatred towards them than they ever did before. And so right now, what Richter is saying that what X-Factor is doing is not really helping mutants out. It's only making things a whole lot worse. And so you have the two characters begin to argue with one another. Now, here's the thing, because you do have Richter powers begin to kind of go out of control basically making a small earthquake. But luckily, X-Factor had just arrived back to the base. Now, when X-Factor comes back to their base, they got two people who are currently injured. First off is Iceman, because again, Loki had given him a power-up. And so because of that, Iceman is no longer able to control his powers, and he is basically freezing himself. And so they have to use Leech as a way to kind of cancel out Iceman powers so that he will not freeze himself over and over again. The other person would be Beast. And the reason why I'm saying Beast because in the last chapter, and I forgot to mention this, Beast got touched by one of the four horsemen of Apocalypse. And of course, that would be Pestilence, who has the ability to give someone illness some kind of random diseases. And so right now, Beast is fighting some kind of disease in his body. And so now X-Factor is down to members currently. And so you have Jean Grey, Cyclops, Caliban trying to help out Iceman and Beast and tell the other people, the trainees, hey guys, go ahead and leave the room and let us handle this. 
Now, the rest of the book, I really am going to skip over it so we can kind of go ahead and wrap up today's video. And the only reason why, because the last few pages of this chapter is really more of Rusty trying to help out the humans. And what I mean by that is because Iceman went ahead and used his powers in the last chapter and froze the entire Central Park area, you have Rusty say that he should use his ability to kind of get rid rid of the ice to minimize the damage done in that area but to also say like listen mutants can also be helpful not dangerous the problem is though when rusty is out there he is technically caught in the middle of a gang group who are going around trying to hunt down different people who could possibly be mutants and so when it comes to rusty being a mutant those gang members are beginning to come after him now luckily for rusty he does get saved by skid richter and also artie because remember Artie has the ability to connect his mind to someone else's mind. And so when it came to Rusty, you had Artie connect his mind to Rusty's mind to realize that Rusty was in danger. Artie goes and gets both uh, Skid and also Richter to say, hey, Rusty is in danger. And the rest of the chapter is basically those three heroes coming to save his butt. But then at the end of the chapter, you have Rusty being able to use his fire abilities to get rid of all the ice in Central Park, but to also leave a message behind that technically says mutants can be helpful, not dangerous. And that is why I'm going to go ahead and skip the ending of issue number 20. I just want to make sure that we at least did cover what happened into it, because as we jump into the next story arc, we building our way up to the fall of mutants and everything gets a whole lot more serious. But with that being said, this is where I'm going to end today. getting into today's video we do pick up with x factor being confronted by cameron hodge their pr person for their group now remember when it came to x factor it was the original five x-men coming together to keep charles xavier dream alive the idea of helping out mutants and teach them how to control their powers but to also have a day where humans and mutants can live together in harmony now, when it came to X Factor, they had this bright idea to pretend to be a group of humans who were mutant hunters, who were helping out the human race. But in reality, they were a group of mutants who was using that to find mutants that they can help and actually teach. And so when it came to Cameron Hodge, his main goal was to get the word out there to the world. And matter of fact, it was his idea that X Factor does the whole pretending to be a group of humans. Either way, with him being their PR, he kept putting commercials out there that kind of spread the hatred towards the mutant race. And the idea of them trying to help out mutants kind of look bad on them because now they're known as a group of mutant hunters and more and more humans are beginning to hate the mutant race all because of these commercials. Now, you also had X Factor realize that Cameron Hodge is up to something, which we already know what it is. He's part of a group better known as The Right, another group in Marvel Comics that is trying to get rid of the mutant race. Now, in our last video, he had tricked Cyclops into fighting Jean Grey. And even though Cyclops has no proof it was Cameron who had tricked him, Cyclops and the rest of X-Factor knows that they cannot trust him. Now they're wondering why in the world did he come back to their base? And it's all because of Angel's will. Because remember, in the few books we had to skip over, we had learned that Angel had committed suicide. And so because of that, it's about time for his will to be released to everyone who was close to him. And so when it comes to Cameron, he is hoping that in the will, he had received something from Angel that could possibly hurt X-Factor down the road. 
Now, while you have the different members of X Factor getting ready to leave to go hear the will of Angel, we do see they're being watched by Cameron Hodge. Now, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, he was technically fired just a moment ago by X Factor, but he's like, I'm not going to leave just yet. I want to stay here and continue to watch you guys. And so that is when he realized that they have hope in two things. One, in the will of Angel, they will see something that could possibly help them continue on X Factor. And two, they also still have hope in the idea that humans and mutants can live together in harmony. And that last one right there really does bother Cameron a lot. He wants to make sure that dream never comes to life. And so he calls up somebody and tells that person it's time to go into Plan Beta. And we're left to wonder what in the world is Plan Beta? Now, on their way over to the courthouse, you do have our hero see a huge body of people standing outside the courthouse protesting. Now, this huge amount of people are really broken up into two groups. The first group is being led by a reporter known as Trish Gilby. Now, when it comes to Trish, she really hates the idea that there are mutant hunters out there. She really loves the idea that mutants can live along with humans in harmony. But with the idea of mutant hunters being out there, she really hates X Factor a lot. Now, even though our heroes are pretending, they don't know that. And so, of course, they're getting even more hatred. Now, the other group hates X Factor as well, but for a completely different reason. Because you had the X Factor team fight against the three horsemen of Apocalypse. But here's the thing, when they're out there using their powers and wearing their mutant outfits, they're not known as X-Factor, they're known as X-Terminators. And so with their battle against the four horsemen of Apocalypse and Central Park, and also causing a lot of damage, you have this other group wondering, where was X-Factor to stop X-Terminator? Not realizing that, those two groups are really the same people. But either way, once you have our heroes get inside the actual courthouse to hear the will of Angel, we come to find out the only thing mentioned is that everything he has goes over to Cameron Hodge. The money, the entire Operation X Factor, it goes straight over to Cameron Hodge. And so Cameron won. And so if our heroes want to continue on with X Factor, they're going to have to work under the man they currently hate. And so when our heroes leave the courtroom and go outside the courthouse, they are confronted by Trish. Now here's the thing, Trish does inform our heroes that she got word that Cameron Hodge was somehow able to change how the will was supposed to go, which means that there is a possibility the will was not supposed to be give everything over to Cameron Hodge. Instead, most likely give it to somebody else possibly a member of X Factor like Cyclops or Jean Grey. But the problem is though, nobody knows the actual truth. But she also says that he was the one that had told the doctors to get rid of Angel Wings. Now, before X Factor is able to get more information out of her, Cameron Hodge walks outside a courthouse where you do have our heroes inform him that they are not going to work for him at all. If they're going to continue X Factor, they're going to do it in their own kind of way. Now, right after they say that, you didn't have Cameron tell his operatives to go ahead and begin Plan Beta. And we kind of find out that Plan Beta is really more the idea of spreading more hatred towards the mutant race. And what I mean by that is, out of nowhere, you have a group of people wearing battle suits yelling out, death to the mutant hunters, death to X Factor. Because again, to the public, X Factor is a group of humans who are going out of their way to hunt down mutants. And so now you have these people 
wearing robotic suits but pretending to be mutants who had came here to kill off mutant hunters. But in reality, these are operatives who are working for Cameron Hodge. Either way, because there's so much chaos, most of the people there are not able to take a good look and see, oh wait, it's a guy in a robot suit. But because, again, there's so much chaos, they're like, oh my god, we're all being attacked by some random mutants. Now, you do have X-Factor try their best to take down a few robots, but the problem is, though, they can't use their powers like they want to to help protect them and other innocent people in the area. And so, they have no choice but to go ahead and disappear. And so, they go hide in the sewers. But you have Cyclops tell Jean Grey, those guys were not mutants. They were regular people in robotic suits pretending to be mutants as a way to spread more hatred towards the mutant race. Because now they can say, look, mutants out of nowhere appeared and began to attack a random group of humans all because of some mutant hunters. That is not okay. Innocent people possibly got hurt or even worse, killed off. But right after that attack is over, Cameron Hodge is able to be interviewed by Trish and you have him continue the idea of spreading more hatred towards the mutant race by saying, look, this is another example of the idea of why mutants are so evil, why mutants should be killed off or locked away. Because look what they did. They came out of nowhere to attack a group of mutant hunters, but now innocent people who were just bystanders also got hurt as well. This is not okay and that is why X-Factor is around to take care of the mutant race. Now while he was giving out that interview, well he was being watched by no other than Apocalypse and you have Apocalypse just laughing because Homeboy is getting ready to send out his four horsemen to do some damage to the human race, especially his latest horseman, which is Death. And we have no idea who that person is just yet. But getting back over to the base of X-Factor, we do pick up with the trainees. And remember, these were different characters that X-Factor had saved and they were beginning the process of teaching them how to control their powers. But with that being said, they're back at the base watching TV and just saw what happened at the courthouse. But before they are able to actually react and have a conversation, well, more of those guys in robotic suits arrive at the base of X-Factor to kill off their trainees because they are mutants. And so as we jump into the next chapter, we do pick up with our young heroes being attacked by the members of the right, the operatives working for Cameron Hodge. Now, here's the thing. Our young heroes, they're not trained for an event like this, but unfortunately, they have no choice here. If they want to survive, they're going to have to do what they can to survive. Now, when it comes to Richter, he's very important for this section. And the reason why because Richter was captured by them in the past. When X-Factor found Richter, they were freeing him from the right in those books we had to skip over. And so he knows the right very well. He knows what kind of torture they put mutants through. And so when it comes to our young heroes, they're trying to get away, but they can't. Now, you do have Caliban there as well. And when it comes to Caliban, he is one of the main team members, but unfortunately, he didn't go with the rest of them when it came to Angel's will. And the reason why, because of his body appearance. There's no way he can go out in the public and pretend that he is a human. Everyone would know right off the bat that he is a mutant. But with them being left behind at the base, it's technically up to him to help protect the young heroes. But he's taken out just like that. And this is very huge. And so we do see our heroes trying their best to make it back over to their base by using the sewers that can lead them back to their base. Except you have our heroes realize that everything happening to them 
is because of Cameron Hodge. He has been planning this for a very long time. And let's not forget that Trish, the reporter, she told Hank, aka Beast, what she kind of knew about Cameron Hodge. And so because of that, our heroes realized that when it came to Angel's will, Angel's wings, Angel's death, that was all being controlled by Cameron Hodge. The entire operation of X-Factor is being controlled by Cameron Hodge. He did all of this as a way to build up more hatred towards the mutant race. And technically right now, he's winning. And they have basically helped him to win. But getting back over to the base of X-Factor, we do pick up with Boom Boom. Now, Boom Boom is one of those characters I just kind of like for unknown reasons. Like, no matter what, I'm going to read a book if she's in there because, honestly, she's a very funny kind of character. Either way, when it comes to Boom Boom, she has the ability to create small energy explosives to kind of use as a weapon against her enemies. Now, here's the thing. She was one of the few people that X-Factor has saved and brought her over to be a trainee to kind of learn how to control her powers. But the thing was, she ran away. Matter of fact, she ran away and joined a team of characters known as the Fallen Angels. Now, that series had wrapped up by the time this book came out. And so, it was about time to bring her back over to this series. Either way, when she tries to come back to X-Factor to apologize for well, running away, she realized that one, she's having a hard time getting inside, but once she does get inside, she realized the entire base is being controlled by different operatives of the right. And currently, they're taking away every single young mutant who was there at the base of X-Factor. Now, they're not going to take away Caliban, but everyone else. Now, while she is hiding, she also hears where they are going. And apparently, they're heading over to Arlington. Now, we have no idea what that means for right now, but for her, it must be somewhere important. And so she sneaks onto the plane as the plane begins to fly off back towards Arlington, but the plane is also holding the young mutants that had just been kidnapped. But then you have the main X-Factor team arrive at their base, and when they do, they realize the entire place is completely wrecked. But on top of that, the young mutants that they were taken care of have been kidnapped. And so they realize they must have been taken by the right. Now, they do find Caliban. He was left behind. And once our older heroes are able to wake him up, he tells them, listen, I was knocked out, but I slowly regained consciousness and I heard where they were going next. They're heading over to Arlington. Now, when it comes to Iceman, he realized what that could possibly mean. Arlington in Virginia. Now, guys, real quick. I'm going to tell you, when I saw the word Arlington, I thought they meant my state, Texas, because we do have a city in Texas known as Arlington, where the Dallas Cowboys play, but I was wrong. Either way, it does tell our heroes they need to head over to Virginia to hopefully find the young mutants that have been kidnapped. But after a few hours later, we do pick up with Boom Boom. Now, when it comes to Boom Boom, she does arrive in Arlington, Virginia after following the right for a good period of time. Now, she realized that they had arrived at some kind of museum. Now, this is a museum, so to the public, it may seem like a normal place, but in reality, it's also a secret base for the right in the back offices. And so when it comes to Boom Boom, she begins to walk around the place to hopefully gather enough intel about what is currently happening inside this building. Now, while she is trying to do that, well, security realize who she is. And they're kind of like, hey, she is a mutant. And on top of that, she was saved by X Factor. She's one of the ones that we were missing. We have to go ahead and grab her right now. Except she tries to make a phone call back to New York to tell X Factor where to find her. But unfortunately, she has to run away because those few security guards are about to catch up on her. 
And so getting back over to the trainees of X Factor, well, you have the right beginning to torture them. And you have Richter inform the rest of the group what really happens when it comes to them being captured by the right. The right is planning on using mutants as weapons. And so what they try to do is torture you in different kind of ways to hopefully control you down the road to again, use you as a weapon for their own personal gain. Now, real quickly, we do jump over to Apocalypse. Now, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's getting ready to send out the four horsemen. Now, let's not forget, he just got his fourth horseman, which is Death. And we have no idea who Death is, but apparently he wants to make sure that Death is ready by giving him a test. Now, when it comes to the other horsemen, they don't believe that Death is all that impressive because apparently the only ability he has is to fly. And so out of nowhere, you had his horsemen be able to clear the test with no problems at all. But we're still left to wonder who could possibly be the fourth horseman of Apocalypse. But then, getting back over to Boom Boom, she does see Richter is currently being tortured by the right. They are trying to turn him into a secret weapon or just some kind of weapon to use against their enemies. Either way, you do have Boom Boom being able to actually save him by breaking him out of his torturing device. Now, while you have the two characters trying to get away, well, unfortunately, they run into the leader of the entire operation, and that would be Cameron Hodge. Now, like I said earlier though, we kind of already knew that he was part of the group, but now we know that he is actually the leader of the group. And so everything that has been going on with X Factor was being done by him, except a few things being done by Apocalypse. And so when we jump into the final chapter for today's video, we do pick up with X Factor breaking into the actual base that belongs to the right. Now, while they are doing that, I kind of want to focus on Beast. And the reason why, because remember, Beast got really sick when it came to Pestilence touching him. And remember, Pestilence powers is to give you a random illness. Now, Beast has been able to recover, but apparently he's not able to think straight to the point where it seems like he no longer has an interest in science or possibly his mind is beginning to change into a animal state of mind. Either way, you do have our heroes continue on to hopefully find their trainees and get the heck out of there. And so when we jump over to Cameron Hodge, we see him still continuing to torture the trainees of X Factor. Now, while doing that and hoping to turn them into weapons, well, that is the moment he realized his base is being attacked by X Factor. Now, he's not worried. And the reason why? Because he planned this. He knew that sooner or later, X Factor would come after for their trainees. And so now it's him saying, okay, you know, what make sure you guard this room but i'll make sure to handle x factor so that we are able to move on to the next part of our master plan now when it comes to x factor they run into a room that was specially made for them the room is made to contain them and their powers do not work inside of there. Now that is the moment where they are confronted by Cameron Hodge. Now when they do see Cameron, he tells them that he has been planning this for a very long time. Matter of fact, ever since college. Let me explain, because remember, the only reason why he was able to join X Factor as their PR is because he was close friends with Angel but they were friends in college. But back in college, angel wings were not developed yet. And so he looked like a human. But once angel had gained his wings and came out as a mutant, well, that began his hatred towards the mutant race. And so ever since then, he has been plotting to hopefully get rid of the mutant race. Either way, when it comes to the room that was specially made to contain X Factor, well, they were able to break free. And once they do that, they continue on to hopefully find Cameron, but to also find their trainees as well. 
But we have to jump back over to Apocalypse. And the reason why? Because this gives us our first appearance of Archangel. Yes, you heard that right, Archangel. This was the moment where the world found out that he was still alive. And when I say the world, I meant the real world, not the comic book world. Because again, we were told back in X Factor, I want to say number 14 or 15, that Angel had committed suicide. And so to all his friends, he was dead. But we come to find out Apocalypse had saved him and turned him into his fourth horseman, Death, Archangel. Now when it comes to Archangel, you right now have him fighting against the other horsemen to only see who is the strongest. And whoever is the strongest will become the leader of the group. Now that battle right there does not take that long where you have Angel being able to defeat the other horsemen so easily to prove that he should be the leader. And so the rest of the book really does focus more on X Factor and their trainees fighting against the right. And so when we jump back over to them, we also kind of find out that Cameron Hodge is wearing a special kind of armor. And this armor protects him from Cyclops optic blast. Because when it comes to Cameron, he realized that if you take out Cyclops and Jean Grey, the rest of the X Factor team breaks apart. Like they can't function without those two members of the team, which honestly is not completely true because of Iceman. And what what I mean by that is you do have the right being able to put on some kind of belt that cancels out the powers of Iceman. Now when it comes to the belt, it was technically programmed to Iceman's original stats. But let's not forget, he disappeared from the book for a short period of time and jumped over to Thor books. And when he did, Thor and Loki, really just Loki, gave Iceman a power up. And so Iceman is even more powerful than he was about almost 10 issues ago. And so when it comes to Cameron, when he made that belt, it was made for Iceman's original power level, not his new power level. And so Iceman was able to break free and then break the armor that Cameron was using. And then you have Cyclops being able to give the finishing blow. Except the problem is though, when he does that, we kind of find out Cameron was never there. Well, he was in the building, but he wasn't there when it came to our heroes fighting against him. They were fighting against a robot. The real Cameron was able to get away and most likely trying to find a new way to attack X-Factor in the mutant race. But a day is saved. X-Factor is able to leave alongside with their trainees. Now, getting back over to Apocalypse, well, he was watching X-Factor the entire time, and he has been wondering how strong they truly are. Because again, let's not forget, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's really big on the idea that the weak deserves to die, and only the strong deserves to live. And so when it comes to Apocalypse, he was watching X-Factor the entire time, and he still feels like they need more tests to see how strong they truly are. And so he does tell his horsemen, get ready, it's time to fight against X-Factor. And so while X-Factor is wondering where they can go with their trainees, out of nowhere, they are teleported away over to what seems to be the base of Apocalypse. And this leads What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we are finally here. We are going to jump into the Fall of the Mutant story arc. Now, this was the second crossover ever done in X-Men comics, but it was a tad bit different from the Mutant Massacre crossover. And what I mean by that is, when it came to the Mutant Massacre, it was an actual crossover, meaning that you had all the different books being able to cross over with one another. You had X-Factor, X-Men, New Mutants, Thor, Daredevil, and also Power Pack being able to cross over into each other books. 
except when it comes to fall of the mutants you don't really have all these different kind of teams or characters being able to jump into each other books the entire point of this crossover is to begin the downfall for the mutant race and what i mean by that is before this story arc the mutant race was already getting a lot of hate from the human race but at this point right here in Marvel Comics, you have the humans begin to hate the mutants even more. We hit an all-time low to the point where you're going to have new teams or new enemies pop up and try to begin the process of getting rid of the mutant race. Now, when it comes to X-Factor, their new enemy is not really a human, it's really more Apocalypse. But his goal is not to get rid of the mutants, but to get rid of the human race. But with Apocalypse being here, he's going to bring in more problems for the mutant race rather than actually help out the mutant race. And you see what I mean as we dive into today's video. And so getting into today's storyline, we do pick up with X-Factor arriving to Apocalypse Base. Now remember, Apocalypse Base is technically this floating ship or floating spacecraft that he had basically built out of unknown technology. Now at the end of our last video, we saw X-Factor getting teleported away, but we were left to wonder where to, and now we know where they were teleported over to the base of Apocalypse. Now, when they are confronted by Apocalypse, they are kind of surprised to see him again. Because remember, the last time they saw Apocalypse, he honestly did not try to fight against them. Matter of fact, he used other mutants to fight against X-Factor. And once the battle was no longer going his way, but also his plans were beginning to fall apart, Homeboy dipped out, and our heroes were left to wonder who in the world was Apocalypse and what could he possibly be up to. But here he is again now, and he says, I want you guys to join my side because I'm trying to help out the mutant race. And what I mean by that is, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's really big on survival of the fittest. Now, that is really important because with Apocalypse, he believes that weak people do not deserve to live. Only the strong deserve to live. Now, here's the thing though. He believes that humans are weak. And so with that, they deserve to die. Now, the only reason why he thinks that because when it comes to humans, they are full of fear. They are full of hatred. They are full of greed. And that shows weakness in their blood. And so for Apocalypse, they have to go. And he is hoping that X-Factor will join his side. He has been watching them. He realized that they have gone through really different kinds of tragedies. But they had overcome those different kinds of tragedies. And so that was another example of the idea that they are strong people strong mutants that should join his side and so he says your whole idea of trying to accomplish charles xavier's dream is stupid there's no way that humans and mutants are going to be able to live together in harmony so why not go ahead and join my side and help me wipe out the human race now of course you do have x factor say no like hey we're the good guys here. You're the bad guys. Why in the world would we join your side? Now, here's the thing. Apocalypse kind of knew that they were going to say no, but he still had a little bit of hope in the idea of them joining his side. But either way, he does release his three horsemen all over again to fight against our heroes. And of course, that would be war, pestilence, 
and Feynman. And so now, with those three horsemen being out there, they are going to fight against our heroes. Now, here is something else I do want to mention, and that would be Pestilence. Because the last time our heroes fought against the three horsemen, Beast got very ill because of her. Because that's her ability, to give you random illness. And so, when Beast got that, he was able to recover, but it began to make him stronger. But here comes the bad side effect. With him getting stronger, he's becoming, well, not as smart as he used to be. And so, he's technically not really thinking things through when it comes to fighting against the Four Horsemen. But either way, you have X-Factor in the Four Horsemen battle against each other. And this is Apocalypse trying to show them that, listen, I pick these guys because they are strong. They are actually capable of actually defeating you. And once they do that, I'm hoping that you realize that I'm the better choice. But to also help you get revenge against the humans. The humans were the ones who got rid of your best friend, Angel. Now remember, we had to skip over a few books. Angel had committed suicide, or we were left to believe he did. We kind of got the idea that Cameron Hodge had possibly killed off Angel and made it look like he committed suicide. But in reality, he didn't do that. But either way, you do have our heroes trying their best to fight against, well, the three horsemen. Now, as the fight goes on, you have Apocalypse kind of get tired of the idea of watching X-Factor fight against the three horsemen. Watching X-Factor be able to somewhat bounce back every single time they get knocked down by one of the three horsemen. But this is also Apocalypse saying, it's about time for me to introduce the fourth and final horseman. And that would be... Archangel. Now at first, our heroes have no idea who this man is, but then Jean Grey realized who it is. It's Warrington. It's Warren. It's Angel. They're kind of like, oh my god, you're alive. Because again, they believed that he had committed suicide. Now they kind of got the idea that Cameron Hodge had possibly killed off Angel and made it look like he committed suicide, but here he is right now. And you have Apocalypse say, I saved him. It was humans that broke this man down, took his money, took his wing, took his soul. It was me who brought him back up again. It was me to help him realize that humans deserve to be killed off. They are weak, pathetic. And that is where he comes in. He is my death horseman. And he will bring death to all humans across New York and possibly the world. Now, you do have our heroes try their best to fight against Angel. Sorry, Archangel. But they lose the battle so easily. They are defeated and then bound to these different devices to make them watch what happens next. And so we kind of find out what Apocalypse is about to do next. See, when it comes to Apocalypse, he does tell his four horsemen, it's time for you guys to go out there and attack Manhattan. It's time for you guys to begin the process of killing off the weak. Of course, killing off the humans. Now X-Factor, they can't do anything about it. And the reason why? Because they're bound to those devices. Now, here is something else I do want to talk about. And that would be Caliban. Because remember, when it came to Angel's death, he died. And of course, he was replaced by Caliban. And Caliban was part of the Morlocks. Now, the Morlocks were a group of mutants who lived under New York in the sewers. And the reason why, because sometimes when a mutant gains their abilities, their body also changes as well, to the point where they're no longer able to hide in the public. And so, you had a group of mutants go down into the sewers to live a somewhat normal life. But the thing was, when it came to the Morlocks, most of them were killed off by the Marauders. Their home was lost thanks to the Marauders. And that took place 
back in the Mutant Massacre storyline. By the way, we do have a playlist covering that entire event. Either way, when it came to Caliban, after losing his home, he wanted to stay with X-Factor, which he did, and so he replaced Angel. Except when it came to the Three Horsemen and also X-Factor fighting against each other, well, everyone forgot about Caliban. And so when he reappears, our heroes believe that he is going to release them from their bound devices. But he doesn't. Instead, he says, listen, I saw what happened to Angel. He was turned into Archangel, a weapon to be used by Apocalypse against a human's race. But now I realize I want the same thing for myself as well. And so he walks over to Apocalypse and says, I want you to do the same thing you did to Archangel. Turn me into a weapon that you can use so that I am able to get revenge against the people who have hurt me. And of course, he is talking about the Marauders, the evil mutant group. And so that is his goal. And so now one of the members of X Factor has joined Apocalypse's side. And so as we dive into the next chapter, well, we do pick up with the four horsemen of Apocalypse just going on a rampage. They are literally attacking the entire city, causing damage to almost every single building in their path. Now, here is something else I do want to mention. When it comes to Apocalypse, he does begin to talk about what is happening around this point in X-Men comics. And what I mean by that is, earlier I told you guys that Fall of the Mutants is technically the beginning point of where you had the human race try to think of new kinds of ways to get rid of mutants. And so when it comes to Apocalypse, he also mentions that the American government is beginning the process of making new laws that could affect mutants to hopefully remove them from America. And so when it comes to Apocalypse, that is another reason to why to kill off the human race. Because look at them. They couldn't just adjust to us being around. They couldn't actually fight us in a fair battle. Instead, they try to make laws to get rid of us. That is a weak person kind of move. And the only reason why they are doing that because they don't fit in when it comes to the schemes of the future of evolution. And so it's Apocalypse saying that is another reason why they deserve to be killed off. Now, when it comes to X Factor, they are able to break free from the containments. And once they're able to do that, they begin to, well, do some damage to the ship that belongs to Apocalypse. Now, here's the problem, though. Our heroes have no idea how this ship actually works. And so with them just going around and just trying to wreck the entire ship, well, that begins a new problem for our heroes because now the ship is beginning to absorb all light and energy from Manhattan, which could be a very huge problem down the road for our heroes. Now, because it did cause a lot of damage to the actual aircraft, you do have Jean Grey and Cyclops be thrown off the actual aircraft. And unfortunately, they can't find their way back onto it because on the outside of the aircraft, well, it looks invisible. You can't see it. And so our heroes are wondering, what in the world can they do next? And you have Cyclops say, well, we have to focus on the Four Horsemen because they are continuing to attack Manhattan. Now, when it comes to Iceman and Beast, they're still on the aircraft that belongs to Apocalypse. And so you have our two heroes wonder, what can they do on the aircraft? How can they stop Apocalypse? And so you then have Jean Grey try to have a conversation with one of the four horsemen of Apocalypse, and that would be Feynman, better known as Autumn. That is her real name. Now, here's the thing about Autumn, though. Jean Grey realized that she is a young girl who was most likely tricked 
by Apocalypse to join his side. Because when it comes to Feynman, or Autumn, she was a young girl that had an eating disorder. Now the reason why she had an eating disorder, because of her mutant ability. Where every single time she would try to touch food, it would just turn to dust. She was basically destroying any kind of meal that was put in front of her. Which of course led to her being unable to actually eat. And so with that all being said, she gained an eating disorder. But Apocalypse said, I can help fix that for you. I can help control your powers, but at the same time, you will be able to eat again. Now with all that being said, it's Jean Grey trying to help her realize that she's helping out an evil mutant. But for her sake, it's kind of like he's helping me out. He's actually helping me control my powers. Now in the middle of their battle she is actually teleported away into a Captain America book which does tie into the fall of the mutant storyline. Now we do jump over to Cyclops who's fighting against war one of the four horsemen of apocalypse now when it comes to war we actually saw him in the mutant massacre event where apocalypse appeared to recruit him because remember he was a soldier that was seriously injured he was paralyzed from the neck down now of course thanks to apocalypse he was able to repair his body where we come to find out that war has the ability to cause explosions by clapping his hands. Now when it comes to war, the reason why he wants to kill off the humans is because he was a soldier that was seriously injured. And the American government is not giving out any kind of money to help other soldiers who are in need. Instead, most of their money goes into creating more weapons to help them win wars across the world. And so for war, the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse, he believes that the human race deserves to be killed off. Because how do you not care about other people who are suffering? That is not okay at all. Now, when it comes to war, he is stopped by Cyclops. And once he's stopped by Cyclops, you have Jean Grey and Cyclops being able to regroup. And so we jump back over to Iceman and Beast trying their best to fight against Apocalypse. Now here's the thing though, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's trying to warn them that the more damage they do to his aircraft, the most likely this aircraft is going to crash into Manhattan, causing a lot of damage across the city. And so even though he tells our heroes that by the time he does, it's too late. Beast and Iceman done a lot of damage and you had the aircraft beginning to hit different buildings in Manhattan. And so we jump back over to Cyclops and Jean Grey who are on the outside of the aircraft and just watching this aircraft begin to hit buildings left and right. And that is a huge problem. Now when it comes to our heroes on the outside, they want to find a way to help out Iceman and Beast. But unfortunately, they can't do that because they are confronted by Archangel. And here's the thing, Archangel is trying to kill them and Jean Grey is not trying to fight back because she still believes that her best friend, the man that she almost fell in love with is still inside there somewhere, that she may have the ability to actually reach him. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, he's more saying no, our friend is gone. We have no choice here. We have to go ahead and fight against our old best friend. Now, while you have our two heroes trying their best to fight against both death, but also fight against pestilence, well, that is the moment you have the power pack arrive to help out X-Factor to fight against the horsemen of Apocalypse, but to also make sure the aircraft does not crash into Manhattan. Now, you're probably wondering, hey, Fresh, who in the world is the power pack? Now, we saw them back in the Mutant Massacre storyline. They only had one chapter and that was it. But when it comes to Power Pack, they are a group of kids, children, who had received powers from an alien. That's all you really need to know about Power Pack. 
because every once in a while they do have a crossover with the X-Men. Like again, for example, The Mutant Massacre. And they also have a chapter in this crossover as well. Either way, they had just arrived in time to help X-Factor find a way to defeat the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse, but to also make sure that aircraft does not crash into Manhattan. And so once you have everybody being able to get back on the aircraft, you do have Archangel trying his best to kill off his old friends. Now it does lead into the moment where he does cut Iceman in half. Now real quick, this was still the era where we had no idea how Iceman powers truly worked. And so we're still trying to figure out how powerful he really was. And so even though Archangel had cut Iceman in half, well he was in his ice form. And so he is able to put himself back together. But you have Iceman tell Archangel, hey man listen, I wanted you to believe that you had killed me off. Because I knew my death would break you out of apocalypse control. And honestly, it works. And so you have Archangel no longer trying to be a horseman of Apocalypse. Now, when it comes to the aircraft of Apocalypse, so much damage was done, it is for sure about to crash into Manhattan. And so you have Apocalypse wanting to leave with his two horsemen and his new recruitment. And that would be Caliban, because remember, Caliban wants revenge against the people who had destroyed his home, which was the Marauders. And so he is hoping that Apocalypse will be able to give him the same upgrade like he did for Archangel. And so while you have Apocalypse leave, Archangel is no longer a horseman of Apocalypse, but now Caliban is. But on top of that, this aircraft is about to crash into Manhattan. Now, luckily for our heroes, they were able to crash the aircraft into the Hudson River. Now, after doing that, they're then confronted by a bunch of reporters. Now, like I said earlier, when it comes to the fall of the mutant story arc, this is the beginning point where you have the humans begin the process of trying to find more ways to get rid of mutants. The hatred towards mutants has now reached an all new high. And so as soon as X-Factor gets out of the aircraft, they are instantly blamed for what happened to the Hudson River with the aircraft crashing inside of it. But you have Cyclops say, no, it wasn't us. It was an evil mutant. But here's the thing, we are X Factor and we are here to basically tell you that no matter what, we are going to try to make sure that humans and mutants can live together in harmony. You may hate us, but we don't hate you. And so please allow us to show you the right way when it comes to treating us because we are also humans. Yes, we are mutants, but we are still humans of Earth. And so this is Cyclops saying, only judge us for what we have done. Don't judge us for who we are. Now that ends X-Factor issue number 25. And so getting into the next chapter is actually going to be a tie-in from the Power Pack series. And we pick up with issue number 35. Now guys remember, when it comes to Power Pack, they were a group of children that had received powers from an alien. And then with those powers, they became a young superhero team. Now when it comes to their parents, they have no idea that their children is actually a group of superheroes. Now something else I do want to mention about this tie-in most of this chapter takes place before the last chapter. Because remember, in the last chapter, Power Pack appeared out of nowhere to help X-Factor fight against the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse. But the question was, where in the world did they come from? This book right here answers that question for us. And so when we jump into this chapter, we do pick up with Power Pack being grounded. Yes, you heard that right, they are grounded. Now, not all of them, really only the older siblings are grounded. And matter of fact, the youngest one, 
Katie, she makes fun of her siblings for being grounded. And with them being grounded, unfortunately, they, all they can do is just read their books and watch whatever that she is watching on TV. Now, their parents are not home at the moment. And this is going to lead us into how in the world they got involved in the Fall of the Mutant story arc. Because while at home, you do have their father call them and say, hey, where is your mother? I have been trying to get a hold of her. And you have the kids say, hey dad, mom is not here. Matter of fact, mom is back in the city riding the subway. She might be home very soon. But the problem is there is a blackout. Now this blackout is being caused because what is happening between X Factor and Apocalypse. And so with this battle out there happening, you have the entire city losing energy left and right. And matter of fact, when it came to the last chapter, you had Apocalypse tell our heroes with them trying to destroy his aircraft, well, it began to absorb energy and light, which means that it began to cause blackouts all over the city. Now, when it comes to the power pack, they begin to get very worried about their mother, who's out there in the city that currently has no power. But on top of that, you have the news reports come in on the radio talking about what is happening in the city, with X Factor fighting against the Four Horsemen of of apocalypse and there are places getting blown up left and right because of those battles and so you have power pack begin to get worried about their mother now they realize they can't leave because they are grounded well you have katie say i'm not grounded and i want to make sure that our mother is okay and so she leaves the house to go look for her mother now, when it comes to Katie, she is able to find a subway train that her mother is on. But that subway train is currently being attacked by pestilence. And remember, she is one of the horsemen of Apocalypse, and she has the ability to give you a random illness. And so, of course, we see her right now giving everyone on that subway train some random disease. Now, you do have Katie try to jump in and fight against pestilence. But the problem is, though, Pestilence is able to touch her, and of course, that begins the process of seeing young Katie getting very sick, and so she has no choice but to run away, but luckily, she was able to have Pestilence stop attacking the train that her mother was on. Now, when it comes to the rest of Power Pack, the way they get involved in this mess is that they get very concerned about their younger sister, but also their mother. And more and more reports are coming in about what is happening in the city. And so you have our young heroes say, we have to go out there and find our sister and find our mother as well. Now, here's the thing, because as soon as they say that, they see Apocalypse aircraft flying over them and they realize okay some things are popping off right now in the city and we got to at least help out where we can and so they leave to go find their sister first now once they are able to find their sister they realize there's something wrong with her we already know what it is because she was touched by pestilence and so you have the other members of the family try to heal her up now at first they're also being affected by whatever disease that she had received from pestilence. It's very contagious. But once you have the power pack come together and use the combination of their powers, they were able to heal her and themselves up just like that. And then they realize they got to go help out with X Factor when it comes to fighting against the four horsemen of Apocalypse. Now, we can technically skip over the next section, and the reason why, because it picks up where we saw in the last chapter, where you had X-Factor and Power Pack work together to fight against the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse. Now, at the end of that battle, you had X-Factor tell the kids to go help out in other areas, because right now, a lot of people are being affected by this battle, while you have X-Factor go back onto the aircraft to have one last battle with Apocalypse. And so getting into the next section of the story, we see that Power Pack was the reason why Apocalypse aircraft has landed in the Hudson River. Now remember, we saw X Factor in the last chapter land that thing, but apparently it was thanks to the Power Pack team that kind of 
helped out with the idea of the ship not crashing into the Statue of Liberty. And so that's really important for them because they did help out and they did save a lot of lives and also save the lives of most likely X-Factor as well. And really, their chapter ends with them being able to get home in time before their mother had arrived back at home to make it seem like they never left at all. And that's really it for their chapter. And this is where we are going to end the first part of our coverage over the fall of the mutants. The next video is going to contain two more tie-ins, one for Captain America and one for the Hulk as well. And then we jump back into the main storyline once again with X-Factor. But with that being said, guys, please leave me a Okay, so we're going to continue our coverage over the Fall of the Mutant story arc. And we have to cover a Candy X-Men issues number 220 all the way up to 223. Now, this is going to be a three-part story arc where we do see the X-Men getting involved when it comes to the hut for Madeline Pryor. Now, the reason why I say the hut for Madeline Pryor is because because let's not forget, over in X Factor Comics, Cyclops believes that his wife and his son are supposedly dead, but in reality, they're still alive. Well, we know Madeline is because we covered a video earlier where we saw her being attacked by the Marauders. Now, she was able to get away and she was taken over to a nearby hospital. And so now you have the Marauders getting word that one, she's still alive and two, she's now beginning to ask questions about what in the world had happened to her. And so now we know the Marauders are trying to chase after her and supposedly try to kill her but scott summers has no idea but when it comes to the x-men well they're going to get involved when it comes to her being hunted down by the marauders but before we are able to dive into that storyline, we have to jump over to a Candy X-Men issue number 220. And the reason why, because we pick up with Storm about to leave the X-Men, just temporarily. And the reason why, because she wants to restore her powers, because she lost her powers thanks to Forge. And so she is hoping that if she is able to find Forge, that he may have the ability to give her powers back over to her. And so her goal is to leave to go find him. But before she does leave, she has a conversation with Wolverine. And the reason why, because she wants to put him in charge of the team while she is gone. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he honestly does not look at himself as a leader. And so with him thinking that, he says, no, I cannot lead the team while you are gone. Have somebody else do it. Why not Rogue? Now, here's the thing. Storm loves every single member of the X-Men, but when she looks at the team, she knows Wolverine is the veteran of the team. He's the best person to be left in charge of the team. Now, if he was not around, then yes, she would ask Rogue, but the rest of the team besides him and Rogue are basically new members. Psylocke, Dazzler, Logshot, these are new team members who are still learning how to be on the X-Men. And so for Storm, no, he is the best choice. And so she tells him, why did you think I came after you for? Why did you think I came here to talk to you for? Because no one else can lead the team. Only you can. And so he says yes. Now the story does jump forward four days and we pick up with Storm arriving at Eagle Plaza. Now remember, when it comes to Eagle Plaza, this was the research and development facility that was being run by Forge. And so this is why she came here for, to hopefully find Forge 
there. Except when she walks in, well, one, the power to the building has been cut off. Two, the phone lines are dead, which that makes sense. And three, all different kinds of security weapons are currently depowered as well. But she also realized the entire building is a complete mess. And that is not like Forge at all. And so when it comes to Storm, she realized something must have happened to Forge. But the question is, what? And so did on the rooftop of the building, we do pick up with a character known as Naze. Now Naze was the instructor to Forge many years ago. He taught Forge how to use magic. And the reason why? Because he was hoping that Forge would be the one to fight against a powerful demonic being. That's going to be very important for this storyline. But when it came to Forge, he was not really down with that idea. And so he left that life behind to go join the army. Now when it comes to days, he's apparently at the same building that Storm is at. Except he was currently doing some kind of ritual but in the middle of that out of nowhere well it seems like he was taken over by some demonic being and when it comes to this demonic being it realized that storm is also in the building and this mysterious being who has taken over the body of days is very happy about the idea of storm being there but shifting back over to Storm, you have Storm continuing to walk around the building. And while she is doing that, the power comes back on. Now when it does, you then have all these different kinds of holograms beginning to play different kinds of moments from the past when her and Forge were hanging out. Now, let me remind you guys, when it came to Forge and Storm, the last time these two characters met up, we saw the beginning of them two falling in love with one another. Matter of fact, it seemed like they did fall in love with one another. Now, even though Forge did take the powers of Storm away, she still has some kind of feelings for him and so all these different kind of holograms that are playing past moments of their love it makes her very upset but wondering why in the world did forge program these holograms to constantly play all these old memories but either way as she's walking around she then hears a loud scream and to her she thinks it's a female but when she goes into the other room she sees forge hooked up to some kind of machine. Now, at first, she does freak out, but then she realized, okay, this is a hologram. But then she is confronted by Naze. Now, when it comes to Naze, he tells uh, Storm, this was my doing. All the different holograms being turned on right now was for me to see how much you still love Forge, but to also test you as well to see if you were ready to actually help me out. Now, the reason why he's saying that because he taught Forge many years ago how to use magic to fight against a demonic being known as the Adversary. Now, like I said earlier, Forge did not stay behind to keep learning magic to fight against the demonic being. And so you have Nay saying, that was his downfall because now the adversary was able to take over the body of Forge and that is a huge problem. And so Storm, I need your help because you're the woman he loves. You're the woman who still loves him. I need your love and his love to help me save Forge, but to also have Forge use the magic I taught him to get rid of the adversary. Now, when it comes to Storm, She's not down with this idea at all because the only reason why she came here was to get her powers back. That was it. But now it's kind of like, hmm, if I want to get my powers back, I have to help out Forge. I have to save his life. Even though we had a real bad fallout, he is the only key to get my powers back. Now, you can also tell that Storm still has feelings for Forge. So even though she does hate him, she still loves him and realize it's the right thing to do to go and help him. And so she agrees. Now, when she walks away, we see Naze give us an evil grin to tell us that, hey, 
This is not Nays at all, that he was taken over. But unfortunately, now he has Storm on his side to complete some kind of task. The question is, what is that task? Now, when we jump into Uncanny X-Men issue number 221, that is when we dive into the idea of the hunt of Madeline Pryor, because we also get our first appearance of Mr. Sinister. Yes, this was the first time anyone saw him in Marvel Comics, and this was the first time we learned that he was the leader of the Marauders, which means that when it came to the Mutant Massacre, it was him who had sent the team to go in the tunnels and begin the process of killing off the Morlocks. Either way, he's very upset with his team about the idea of not being able to kill off Madeline Pryor, because like I said earlier, she was able to get away from them and she went to the hospital and she's been there ever since the time we saw her a couple videos ago. And so now you have Sinister saying, you guys are going to finish the job this time. You will not fail at all. Please kill her off. Now, Sabretooth, this is hilarious. Sabretooth thinks, you know what? I don't know who you are talking to, but I am Sabretooth, and nobody can talk to me like that. Dude, Sinister did not care at all. He said, hush, you work for me. You are going to do what I ask you to do, which is find Madeline Pryor and kill her off. But then we jump over to the X-Men. Now, when we do, we pick up with Dazzler, who's currently in the Danger Room. Now, with her being inside the Danger Room training, well, her training program is her fighting against Rogue. And this is going to lead into a huge problem. And the reason why, because it's Dazzler really expressing the idea that she still does not trust Rogue at all. And the reason why, because Rogue used to be a bad guy when she first appeared in X-Men comics. And she had tried to kill off Dazzler multiple times. And so for Dazzler, it's kind of hard to adjust to the idea of working alongside with someone who had tried to kill you. And even though Rogue has shown multiple times that she is a good guy now, for Dazzler, she does not care. She still looks at Rogue as an enemy. And so while you have Dazzler in the training room, Rogue sees what she is doing in the danger room and gets upset about the idea that Dazzler doesn't trust her. But before you have the two characters able to talk to one another, you have Psylocke say, hey, Wolverine is calling for every single member of the X-Men for a very important meeting. We did jump over to Storm just real quickly because you have Storm and Naze arrive at the Grand Canyon. Now we already know this is not Naze at all, but he's still pretending to be Naze. And so you have the fake Naze tell Storm, we have to go on a spirit walk. We have to walk the rest of the way to hopefully find Forge, to hopefully save Forge from the adversary. And so you have Storm agree. Now again, this is still Storm showing us that she still has some kind of love for Forge because she's still kind of concerned for him. But at the same time, you have Naze, the fake Naze, pretending to flirt with her to kind of keep her on his side long enough so that he is able to use her to accomplish his own goals. Now, the rest of this chapter is really more of the X-Men heading over to San Francisco. And the reason why, because, well, Madeline Pryor is there. Wolverine got word that Madeline is there because she called up the X-Men wondering, one, why she's there, and two, where is her husband Cyclops? And so you have Wolverine inform Havoc, hey, man, your brother left his wife behind by herself, and now she's in San Francisco. Where she should be is in Alaska. Either way, as soon as the X-Men arrive at the hospital, well, you have Psylocke tell the team, we are not alone. The Marauders are here as well. And so this leads into a few pages of really the X-Men fighting against the Marauders, 
trying their best to save the life of Madeline Pryor. But at the same time, they're trying to learn more about their enemies who just keep coming after them over and over again. And so it does take a while for this battle to actually end. But the tell end of this chapter, you have Rogue and Dazzler find out the Marauders have a new member on their team and that would be Polaris. Now, Polaris did not really turn evil. She's being possessed by Malice, another mutant that has the ability to possess your body. And so even though our heroes see Polaris as the new leader of the Marauders, in reality, it's Malice in control of Polaris' body. But with her having control of Polaris' body, she's also able to use the powers of Polaris which is really a hard challenge for Rogue and also Dazzler, but the battle must continue on. Now we do jump into Uncanny X-Men number 223. Now, before we dive deep into this chapter, I do want to mention that we are going to go ahead and skip over a lot of content so that we are able to just go ahead and wrap up today's video. And so we do pick up with Storm and Naze once again. Now, when it comes to our two heroes in the Grand Canyon, it has reached nightfall. And so they're going to go ahead and build a campfire and then just take a break and wait until the morning to continue their search for Forge. Now, while you have our two heroes resting, well, out of nowhere, a random woman appears. Now, when it comes to this woman, she does beg for our hero's help because she says that she's been followed and attacked by someone close to her. And we kind of find out it is her brother. Now, at first, you do have Storm and Naze wanting to protect her from her attacker, her brother. But we kind of find out that was a big fat lie. That her and her brother are actually working for the demonic being known as Adversary. The being that Forge was supposed to stop many years ago. And so now it shows this being is now beginning the process of trying to attack Naze, but also trying to attack Storm as well. And matter of fact, when it comes to the young lady who appeared at first as somebody who needed help, she turns into a creature, making it very hard for Storm and Naze to actually win. But after a few pages, you do have our heroes being able to defeat her and her brother. And that is great because now Naze and Storm can really take a break, but also have the ability to continue on to look for Forge. But getting back over to the X-Men, the rest of the chapter is really more of the X-Men fighting against the Marauders. And honestly, it's a great battle, but you have the X-Men being able to win this battle almost really easily. Matter of fact, you have Wolverine being able to defeat Sabretooth very easily. And I feel so bad for the guy because this entire storyline, he has been getting his butt kicked left and right. But you do have our heroes being able to save Madeline Pryor. But the question is right now, what to do with her? Like, do you call up Cyclops and say, hey man, we found your wife. Um, She's not dead. She is actually alive and well. What should we do with her? But then on top of that, you have having find out that Polaris is now on the side of evil, on the side of the Marauders. Now, at first, it was Havoc believing that she's actually evil, but you had Psylocke say, no, I read her mind. There are two minds in her body, which means that she is being possessed by someone else. And that right there does bring some comfort to Havoc, but at the same time, she still leaves with the Marauders. And so for Havoc, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow, the idea that you just lost your girlfriend, to the side of evil. But this is where we are.
Okay, so getting back into our coverage over X-Men comics as we work our way up to the fall of the mutant story arc, our crossover, we do jump back over to Uncanny X-Men number 223 and 224. Now you're probably wondering, hey Fresh, we already have been covering Fall of the Mutants. Yes, you are correct. The only difference is that when it comes to Fall of the Mutants, it's not really a proper crossover. So you do have three different X-Men teams, X-Men, X-Factor, and also New Mutants. But the three teams, they don't even cross over in this supposed crossover or this supposed X-Men event. Each X-Men team is handling their own certain kind of problems. And so when it comes to X-Factor, their main problem was dealing with Apocalypse in Manhattan. When it comes to the X-Men, well, their main problem is technically taking place in San Francisco with the idea of finding Madeline Pryor. Now remember, around this time, Madeline Pryor was married to Cyclops. And so over in X-Factor Comics, he has no idea that his wife is even alive. But she is. But here's the thing. She's now wondering where is their son? And that would be Nathaniel Summers. Of course, that would be Cable down the road. But we have no idea where he is at and neither does she. But luckily for her, the X-Men were able to save her from the Marauders. And so now the question is, where do we go next after bringing in somebody who is now looking for their son? And so getting into the opening pages of Uncanny X-Men number 223, we do pick up with uh, Crimson Commando and Stonewall joining Freedom Force. Now remember, these are two characters we saw in Uncanny X-Men number 215 and 216. In that two-part story arc, we had learned that these two guys were World War II superheroes. But after the war had ended, they were forced to retire. The problem was they realized the world still needed them. And so they came out of retirement and began to use their powers to hunt down bad people. Now, they would kidnap people and then release those people in the forest to actually hunt them down. Now, they did that to Storm, but Storm was able to convince them that what they were doing was actually wrong. And so they turned themselves in over to law enforcement. Now, we kind of find out they're joining Freedom Force now. Now, remember, Freedom Force was a team we saw in the earlier parts of our coverage over the X-Men that was put together by the government as a way to take care of different problems around the world, especially in America. Now, when it came to Freedom Force, it was just Mystique's old team, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, being relabeled with a new name and working for the government. So you're talking about Mystique, Blob, Pyro, Avalanche, and Destiny all now working for the government, but now being introduced to their two new members. We also kind of find out the third person of the original group we saw back in Uncanny X-Men number 215 and 216 is also alive, and that would be the Super Saber. And we saw him for a short period of time in that two-part story arc, we believed that he was dead, but kind of find out here that he is alive and he's also joining the team. Now, out of nowhere, you have Destiny scream. And when she screams, Mystique gets very worried because we have to remember, even way back then in the 1980s, Mystique and Destiny were in a relationship with one another. But you have Destiny try to use her ability to see possible futures of what happens to Rogue. But apparently, the only thing she sees is pure darkness. The idea of the X-Men are no longer going to be around. Like, she was focusing on Rogue, but once she could not see Rogue, she tried other members of the team. But as well, she could not see their future, which means the X-Men could possibly die down the road. And so then we check in with Storm and we currently get reminded that she's on a spirit walk with a character known as Naze. Now we learned in our last video that this is not Naze at all 
This is some other kind of being pretending to be Nays as a way to do something horrible to Storm and possibly forge down the road. Because the original Nays was somebody who taught forge magic to hopefully use that magic to fight against a demonic being known as the adversary. Now remember, in our last video, Storm was trying to find Forge to hopefully have her powers given back to her. She was trying to regain her powers, but unfortunately Forge had disappeared. And so you have this fake Naze tell Storm that he is somewhere in the Grand Canyon and they're walking around trying to find Forge to hopefully help him because apparently Forge is being controlled by that demonic being, again, better known as the adversary. And so you have Storm just doing her best to keep pushing forward. But Naze, the fake Naze, is now pretending to be seriously ill to the point where now Storm is going to have to take care of him. Now we also cannot forget that technically tension is high right now between humans and mutants because the last few story arcs by Chris Claremont, he's trying to paint the picture that you have more and more humans beginning to hate on the mutant race. And this is beginning the process of new groups popping up left and right to find new ways to actually attack the mutants. Now this one page is really showing the racism when it comes to the humans who are hating on mutants and you actually have people trying to convince them like hey what you are doing is wrong the idea of hating on mutants but now you have more and more humans no longer caring we did jump over to the X-Men, and when we do, we see them in San Francisco. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, they're sticking around here because, one, they had just saved Madeline Pryor, two, they're wondering what are their next moves, and three, let's not forget, the X-Men are still trying to paint this picture of the idea that they are dead right now to the entire world. They want the world to believe they are no longer alive. Either way, you have the X-Men also training in this old prison. Now, we have to remember that most of the X-Men around this time are new members. Longshot, Dazzler, Psylocke. Now, Rogue been on the team for a while, but she's still labeled as a new person because most of the old team members are injured, have left the team, are currently on a different team. And so now Wolverine is in charge of the X-Men until Storm is able to come back and retake her position. But this is also Wolverine wanting to teach the new X-Men team members, hey guys, listen, fighting is very important. And not the idea how to fight, but to know when you actually won a fight. Because you have Ro thinking that she was able to take down Wolverine so easily. But once he's able to get the upper upper hand on her and show her that she got too cocky, that she always needs to be on her toes, you have the other team members realize what Wolverine is trying to teach them. Because out there in the real battle scene, you're not going to have someone just give up so easily. They're going to play dirty until you are able to actually win. We did jump over to Madeline Pryor. And this is really important for future story arcs down the road. Especially the Inferno story arc we're going to cover here in a couple of weeks or months. Either way, when it comes to Madeline Pryor, she's wondering why her husband has not been looking for her. Now, what she does not know, he has been trying to find her and their son. But unfortunately for Cyclops, he was told that Madeline and their son had never existed at all. Now, we already know that is a huge fat lie. But for Cyclops, he's kind of wondering, okay, if I'm being told one thing, then how in the world I'm going to prove that they are all wrong, that she is alive? How can I find her? How can I find our son? And so that is the big issue. But also for Madeline, she's wondering, where is her son? Because everybody she goes to, they're telling her, hey, we have no records of a child named Nathaniel Summers at all, which means you have to be lying to us or 
you have gone crazy in the head and believed that you had a son. And so you have having just, you know, running by, but he sees Madeline on a cliff and thinking that she is about to commit suicide. And so then we jump over to Storm and Naze. Now, when we do, you have Storm beginning the process of trying to help take care of Naze. But she does give him some medicine. Now, when it comes to the medicine, it's supposed to help him fight against the poisoning that he had received in our last video. Now, right before he's able to drink some of the medicine, he does ask Storm to also drink some of the medicine as well, just in case she was also poisoned like he was in our last video. So she does take the medicine, but this begins one heck of a mind trip for Storm, because out of nowhere, you have a huge bear appear, and this is really a huge bear, but Storm Storm cannot do much to it because she does not have her powers. She needs to find Forge to not just help Forge out, but to also have Forge give her powers back so that she can be an X-Men again, a true X-Men again. But either way, once she's able to lose the bear, she then runs into a huge snake. And again, she's trying her best to fight against the snake. But while fighting against the snake, she realized the weather has changed. It was a sunny day, but now it's a full-on blizzard. And so after getting rid of the snake and tries her best to climb away from all the fighting she had just done with the bear and snake, she realized behind her is no longer a blizzard. Matter of fact, the ground behind her now turned into some kind of battlefield for some kind of war, possibly the Vietnam War. And the question is, why? Now, when she turns around and look at the very top of the cliff, she sees Forge. And so once she finds Forge, she realized that this is an evil Forge who is talking about the idea of helping out the adversary. And when it comes to Storm being around, she could be the final piece to help him actually achieve that goal. Now, you do have Storm out of nowhere being able to stab Forge, which of course does kill him. But... After he is supposedly dead, we come to find out that this was just a vision, a whole mind trip to help Storm realize that she has to kill off Forge because if she doesn't, Forge could be the reason why the adversary arrives in the real world. And that would be a huge problem. Now again, that is what Naze wants or this fake Naze wants because after you have Storm tell Naze, I realize I have to kill Forge to save the world. Homeboy is just smiling creepily behind her, telling us, yeah, he's actually evil. And so getting back over to Madeline Pryor, well, we kind of find out that she was about to commit suicide, but luckily for her, Havoc stopped her because you have Havoc say, listen, don't do this because if you believe that your son is still alive and we know that he has to be alive, don't do this. You want to be there for your son once we are able to find him. Yes, my brother may have failed you, but let's not fail your son here. And if you are looking for people to care for you, love you, then look at the X-Men because we are a family. And that is this chapter, but... This also could be the beginning of Havoc possibly falling in love with Madeline Pryor. And so when we jump into Uncanny X-Men number 224, we do pick up with Storm saying goodbye to Naze. Now, when it comes to this goodbye, it's really more Naze saying the final part of this spirit walk is really up to you. If you want to be able to stop Forge, it all comes down to you. Now, before Storm leaves, she does ask one question. She wants to know more about the adversary. Now, when it comes to Naze 
He does not really dive much into the actual origin of the character, but he does tell Storm that when it comes to adversary, his main goal is, again, to recreate reality. And the reason why? Because he is a trickster. And sometimes tricksters love the idea of pulling strings. Unfortunately, the strings that he is pulling are the lies of innocent people. But when it comes to adversary, he's really big on recreating the universe in his own image and once he gets bored in what he had created he tries to do something new he tries to change things up because that is who he is either way you didn't have nays kiss storm now we're left to believe the reason why he did this because he had grew a bond with her but at the same time this is not really Nays. It's some demonic being that is pretending to be him. Now, you also have Storm kind of take that kiss to heart, which I kind of find a tad bit weird. And the only reason why, because she admitted earlier she still has feelings for Forge. But here you are now kissing the man who's kind of like a father to him, even though we know it's not really Nays. Either way, Storm walks away to go on the final part of her spirit walk. And so we then pick up with Freedom Force. Really, we pick up with Valerie Cooper, the person in charge of the actual team. Now, when it comes to Valerie, she's having a press conference about a new law that's about to come out saying that anyone who has superhuman abilities has to register with the American government, especially mutants. Now, when it comes to Valerie, she is the president's national security advisor. That is a very important role and why she is the leader of Freedom Force. But with that role, she began to bring up the problem of the mutant race because you do have mutants out there that are very dangerous. And matter of fact, she used the battle between the X-Men and the Marauders in her last video as an example of why mutants are dangerous. Because thanks to that battle, you did have a lot of innocent people be affected by that battle, which was a huge problem for her. And so now this law is being made and she's trying to push more and more to her agenda of hey, mutants are dangerous and we need some better laws in place. Now we do jump over to Rogue and when we do, you have Rogue being confronted by Mystique. Now, this is Mystique telling Rogue what Destiny saw when it came to her visions about the idea of all the different kind of futures showed that the X-Men are going to die, including Rogue. And now let's not forget, Mystique and Destiny, they adopted Rogue. They kind of raised her for a short period of time. And so this is Mystique saying, hey, Rogue, listen, um, you're my daughter and my wife, our girlfriend, Destiny, just told me that she saw different kinds of futures where you are possibly dead and I cannot accept that. So leave the X-Men and come with me. But you have Rogue say no. And so Rogue walks away. Now, before Rogue walks away, you have Mystique say, listen, I know you are going to die because the X-Men are going to go to Dallas. Something in Dallas is about to happen. And when it does, you are going to die. But Rogue continues to walk away. And so then you have the X-Men reunite at a prison they're currently using as their base. Now, when everyone comes together, you have Rogue inform everyone what Mystique had just told her when it came to Destiny's visions about the idea that if the X-Men go to Dallas, they could die. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he says, hmm, you know, I know Destiny for a while now, and I've seen some times where she has been wrong. So... We honestly cannot believe right off the bat what she is saying could actually happen. But at the same time, is Wolverine saying we still got to be careful because we still got three team members who are currently injured, Colossus, Nightcrawler, and also Kitty Pride, but also Storm is gone as well. So we're kind of short staffed here when it comes to the X-Men. So if we go to Dallas, we got to be on our A game here. And so you have the team agree to head over there and they also take Madeline Pryor with her. Now, you're probably wondering why take her with you guys? She has no powers. Well, if they leave her alone, there's the possibility of the Marauders coming back after her all over again. 
And so then we jump over to Storm. Now, when we do, you have Storm on the final part of her spirit walk, and she sees all these different kinds of demons. And we're left to believe that these demons are coming from the reality where the adversary is from. And so you have Storm trying her best to kill off these demons left and right, left and right. But once she's able to get through all of them, she finds Forge. Now, Forge is very confused on why in the world is Storm there for, but before he is able to get an answer from her, she stabs him. She stabs him right in the chest. And he tells Storm, I was not trying to open up a portal to allow the adversary into our reality. I was trying to close the portal that was already opened. And once you have Storm realize that Forge was telling the truth, it's too late. The portal is now open. And Nays, sorry, not Nays, because honestly, it's not him at all, but the person that she believed it was, he appears to show her, hey, you were tricked by me. You believed it was really Nays, but I'm not Nays, I'm somebody else. But thanks to Forge no longer being able to close the portal, now the real fun can begin. And you have him say, you two were the only ones who could stop me. But now, with y'all out of my way, it's game time now. And this is where we are going. Okay, so getting back into our coverage over the fall of the mutant story arc, we do pick up with the Uncanny X-Men and their part in this crossover. Because remember, this was not really a proper crossover. You did have three different X-Men teams at the time, but they really did not cross over with one another. They were all kind of handling their own certain problems. So for example, you had X-Factor dealing with Apocalypse, while you had the X-Men dealing with something else completely different. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they're on their way over to Dallas. And the reason why, because they're looking for their team leader, Storm, who went to Dallas to find Forge, because Forge has the ability to finally give Storm her powers back, but they haven't heard from Storm in a good while, and so they're trying to head her to see what in the world is going on with her. Now, before we are able to dive into the main fall of the mutant storyline, we have to pick up with another tie-in, and this tie-in will be the Incredible Hulk issue number 340, where you have Wolverine the Hulk fighting again for the only second time in Marvel's history. The last time these two characters fought against each other was back in The Incredible Hulk number 180. And so, for a lot of people, this was an actual tie-in for the fall of the mutant story arc because it does take place right before you have the Uncanny X-Men get into their main chapters of the entire story. And so we get the chance to see Wolverine fight against the Hulk. Now, there are some things I do want to talk about when it comes to the Hulk around this point in time in Marvel Comics. See, the Hulk is gray. And the reason why, because there was a storyline where Bruce Banner and the Hulk were finally separated from one another, except they realized that Bruce could not survive without the Hulk. And so they had no choice but to go ahead and re-emerge the two characters back into one. Now, after doing that, the Hulk was no longer green. He became, well, gray, like he was when he first appeared in Marvel Comics. Now, when it comes to Bruce, he is currently hanging out with Clay Quartermain and also Rick. And the reason why, because there are a stockpile of gamma bombs out there in the world that could possibly go off. And you are talking about the idea of producing more people turning into hulks in the world. And that would be a very horrible situation. And so you have our three heroes trying to find that stockpile of gamma bombs. Now, they're kind of on this cross-country road trip and they just arrived in Dallas, Texas. Now, when they do arrive, 
there is a blizzard out of nowhere and they're in this vehicle but because of the blizzard they have to pull over now for the hulk he's very upset because he has been inside the vehicle for a very long time and so he wants out to stretch his legs now you do have rick wondering is that really a good idea to let the hulk out in dallas but you have clay say could you or me really stop the man if we wanted to which honestly is no now the hulk and his team are not the only team also arriving in dallas you also have the x-men arriving as well because again they're trying to find their team leader storm who came to dallas looking for forge now they're also being affected by this blizzard a matter of fact you have the dfw airport tell them you guys cannot land here like Matter of fact, you are causing a lot of issues while being the airspace of our airport. You have to get the heck out of here. And on top of that, we have no way to help you land properly in our airport. Now, you do have Wolverine be Wolverine by saying something smart to tower control. But while they are talking, well, they realize something is coming towards them very fast. It's the Hulk. Now, they don't see the Hulk, but you do have Wolverine able to make the Blackbird dodge whatever was coming their way, which again was the Hulk. Now, because they were able to dodge the Hulk, the Hulk continued on to hit another plane that was nearby the Blackbird, and that plane begins to fall out of the sky. Now, you have Wolverine realize the plane is calling Mayday, and so Wolverine tells Rogue to get out there to use her powers to help land the plane properly on the ground, but he also tells Rogue to get rid of the engine inside of the plane, just Throw it somewhere, but pray to God it does not crash into somebody else. Which it does, because it does crash right on top of the Hulk. Which does make him very angry and wondering, why in the world did a random engine just crash on me? Now, Hulk has no idea that he had hit a plane. He knew he hit something, but because of the blizzard, he did not get an actual proper look. Now, when we pick up with the Hulk again, well, he began to get very hungry. And so he went out of his way to find a food truck, which honestly was not hard to do because of the blizzard. No vehicles are able to travel through the actual blizzard. And so once he finds a food truck, well, he begins to eat everything inside of it. But you didn't have the National Guard appear. Now, when the National Guards appear, they see the Hulk and they begin to freak out and they begin to shoot the Hulk and you have the Hulk get very upset about these guys shooting at him and so you have the Hulk try to fight against the guards now while they're fighting a bullet does cause the vehicle to actually blow up and the flames of the vehicle travels to a nearby apartment building and so with that apartment building now being on fire you have Wolverine tell his team hey guys go deal with that fire I am going to figure out what in the world actually caused that fire. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he already knew the Hulk was nearby. And the reason why, because when it came to the Hulk hitting that plane earlier, Wolverine did some, you know, detective work by using his abilities to see what happened to the plane. And he picked up the scent of the Hulk. And when it came to the vehicle that caught on fire, that led to the apartment building getting on fire. Once again, Wolverine had picked up the scent of the Hulk knowing the Hulk was nearby. Now, while Wolverine is wondering what to do, you did have the Hulk appear and begin the process of fighting against Wolverine. Now, when it comes to our two characters fighting against each other, this is really important because like I said earlier, this is most likely the second time these two characters had ever fought against each other in Marvel Comics, but they're both trying to prove something to each other. Let me explain. So when it comes to Wolverine, the last time he was fighting against the Hulk, he was kind of like a savage beast that was assigned to bring the Hulk down. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he's part of the X-Men. And with them being part of the X-Men, he has grown as a person. And he knows to try not to be a savage person anymore, but to try to be an 
actual person. And so when it comes to Wolverine, he's like, hey Hulk, I don't want to fight. Matter of fact, I'm leaving. Leave me alone. But for the Hulk, this is where his part of the battle comes in. What he is trying to prove. Because to the Hulk, he has gotten smarter ever since Bruce and him had re-emerged as one again. And so Hulk has gotten smarter and he wants to prove to all the different people that he had fought over the years that he is no longer that dumb green, you know, huge monster. He's now somewhat intelligent gray monster. And so that is his reason why he wants to fight against Wolverine, but to also prove that he can actually think of a strategy when it comes to fighting against different people and so you have two characters begin to try to show what they have done over the years the problem is they're both failing at it because you have the whole kind of showing that he's still kind of the big dumb gray angry monster he's not properly thinking of how to take down wolverine and when it comes to wolverine he's not being you know rational he's all like you know what you have hit me so many times you have brought back the old me the angry me and so i want to get rid of you as so you have the two characters fight against each other now the fight is actually stopped thanks to clay quartermain using a weapon that's really powerful enough to do some damage to the hulk but with that weapon you have clay say hey hulk what are you doing? You are wasting your time here fighting against Wolverine while you and us should be out there looking for all those bombs that could possibly go off. And so once you have Clay kind of get that message through Hulk's mind, you have Hulk realize, yeah, he's right. Even though I don't like the guy, he's right. And he leaves. But he kind of tells Wolverine, this is not over. And that wraps up this tie-in for the fall of the mutant story arc. And so then we jump into Uncanny X-Men number 225. Now we do pick up with Colossus and just in case you forgot, Colossus has been gone for a short while now. And the only reason why, because back in the mutant massacre storyline, Colossus was seriously injured to the point where he was no longer able to be on the team until he properly healed alongside with Nightcrawler and Kitty Pride, who were also injured. Injured. Now, this is Colossus beginning the process of possibly coming back to the team. Now, you do have Colossus in the city where you had the X-Men fight the Juggernaut a couple videos ago. Now, when it comes to Colossus, while being there, he kind of realized that the X-Men are being blamed for what happened to the city. Even though the X-Men were the ones who had stopped the Juggernaut, they're still getting most of the blame because the city was completely wrecked. And you have Colossus finding out by hearing a bunch of children argue if mutants are actually human. Now there is one boy who kind of says mutants are humans and they're good and bad mutants, but you have the rest of the children look in the idea of mutants not being humans at all. And you have Colossus try his best to, you know, clarify things to make the kids have a better idea of what mutants truly are, but unfortunately, most of the kids are not trying to listen. But after dealing with the children, out of nowhere, Colossus is confronted by a young lady. Now, when it comes to this young lady, she does ask Colossus, can he draw her? And matter of fact, she'll pay him for his drawing. Now, Colossus, he believes that he is a good artist, but not that great. But he's still down with the idea of doing artwork for somebody who is going to pay him. Now, while he is drawing her, well, out of nowhere, she disappears. But then there's a chess piece left behind. But the chess piece looks just like Colossus. And that is very confusing for our hero. But while you had Colossus examining the chess piece, you then have those same children reappear and begin to throw fireworks at Colossus. And the only reason why they're doing that is because Colossus got in the middle of their argument. But while you had these kids throwing fireworks, well, out of nowhere, Colossus begins to turn back into his metal form. Now, this right here is going to be very huge in the next couple sections that we are about to talk about about but we have to jump over to a different character 
And so we then jump over to a place that's between realities. And we do pick up with the character known as the Adversary. Now, the Adversary is the main bad guy for the last couple of videos that we have been doing. He is this demonic being from a different reality that had been trying to get into Earth's reality to begin the process of, you know, recreating the universe in his own image. Now, he has been stopped over the years by Native Americans, but the last person who was supposed to stop him was Forge. Now remember, at the end of our last video, Storm was tricked by the adversary to think that Forge had just gone crazy or Forge was possibly being controlled by the adversary, to only find out that Forge was never being controlled by the adversary. That matter of fact, Forge was trying to close the portal to not let this demonic being be able to reach Earth's reality, but Storm has stabbed forge at the end of our last video which then gave way for the adversary to begin the process of possibly getting rid of the entire universe because when it comes to adversary he's better known as this great trickster he's able to trick people to help him achieve his goal but he's also known as the great weaver because his goal is to keep changing the universe until he is actually satisfied now we do see him talking to Lady Roma. Now, when it comes to Lady Roma, I'm not going to really dive into it right now who she actually is, but she is the daughter of Merlin, and she comes from Otherworld. Now, I want to say around this time that she was the guardian of the Omniverse. I could be wrong about that. If I am, please let me know in the comments below. If I'm correct, again, please let me know in the comments below. But when it comes to Lady Roma, she's trying to fight against the adversary, and apparently the two characters are playing against each other in a game of chess. Now it's not really chess but all the different pieces on the chess board are different characters who are being affected by this storyline, mainly the X-Men. Now when it comes to Adversary, he believes that he has won only because he had removed Storm and Forge off the board. But it seems like Lady Roma is talking about the idea that he has no idea about her other pieces, including Colossus. But getting back over to Colossus, I want to dive into what is currently happening with him. So after having that huge argument with the children, but being attacked by them and going into his metal form, we kind of find out that Colossus is no longer able to just easily turn off his metal form. And this is most likely because of his injury from the Mutant Massacre storyline. And so because of that injury, Colossus just has to try really hard to turn human, but at the same time, he can't keep that form for a very long time. But you also have Colossus in this section expressing the idea of how upset he is when it comes to mutants being hated on, especially the X-Men, a team of characters that came together to not just help, help Charles Xavier achieve his goal, but to also help out the human race whenever they're in danger. And so when it comes to Colossus, he does not understand why the human race hates the X-Men so much, why the X-Men are being blamed what happened to their city, where in reality it was the Juggernaut. Now, you also have Colossus tell us that when it comes to his, you know, powers not working properly, he's also a whole lot stronger, and so he has to learn how to control his strength. Now, he is able to call up his sister, Ileana, aka Magic, and she appears out of nowhere. Now, this is one of those quick brief crossovers between the two X-Men teams, but it's only for a couple seconds here, because you have Colossus asking his sister, can you take me over to where the X-Men are at? And she said, yes, just come with me and I'll teleport you over there with them. But speaking of the X-Men, they do arrive in Dallas, where they do arrive at the place that belongs to Forge. Now, Rogue is flying around on the outside of the building, but she is able to look inside, and she can tell the place is completely wrecked. And you have Rogue wondering what the heck happened there, and she tells Wolverine what she saw. Now, when it comes to Logan, he tells his team, hey, stay behind, let me go inside first to see what in the world happened here, and then maybe later on, you guys can come in as well. Except when you have Wolverine walk in, 
every single machine that was left behind to protect the place begins to attack Wolverine. And so you have the rest of the X-Men work together to get Wolverine out of there. The problem is, as soon as they were able to get out of there, they are confronted by Freedom Force. Now, remember, when it comes to Freedom Force, they were originally known as, well, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, the second version of the team that was being led by Mystique. Now, over the years, she has switched sides and joined the government. Now, the only reason why she has joined the government, because they're going to forgive every single one of them for the crimes that they had forgotten if they had to do different missions for the government. Like for example, go after different criminals, especially mutants, and bring them in. Now we have seen Freedom Force in other books like X Factor, but this is them coming after the X-Men to arrest the X-Men. Now, they're not only there to arrest them, they're also there to help protect the X-Men because of Destiny. Remember, in our last video, Destiny told Mystique that she had been looking into different futures to see what would happen to their adoptive daughter, Rogue. In every single future that she looked into, Rogue and the X-Men were dead. And so it was her goal to kind of find a way to save Rogue and the X-Men to protect their daughter. And so even though Freedom Force is here to arrest the X-Men, they're also trying to protect them. But the X-Men are technically not listening, and it does lead into a battle between both sides. Now, while you have both sides fighting against each other, you also have Colossus appear. And when he does appear, he does kind of help out when it comes to fighting against Blob. But you didn't have Destiny wanting to say again, we are not here to fight you guys. But in the middle of the fight, you did have each side being able to grab a hostage. Freedom Force was able to grab Rogue while you had the X-Men grab Mystique. Now you have the X-Men retreat back inside the building of Forge only so they can think of a game plan on how they're going to deal with Freedom Force. So while you have the X-Men hiding inside the building, out of nowhere, the sky is ripped open and a beam of light shoots right down on the building. And we're left to wonder what in the world is possibly going to happen to the X-Men. And so then we dive into Uncanny X-Men number 226. Now, when we do, we pick up with the X-Men hiding out in the building that belonged to Forge, while you have Freedom Force just standing there, literally doing nothing at all. Now, the reason why they're not doing anything, because of Destiny. She's freaking out about what could happen to the X-Men. And she clarifies that when it comes to what she saw in the future, if anybody is inside the building that belonged to Forge, something bad is about to happen to them. But she has no idea what. And that is very, very huge. And so you have the X-Men hear from Mystique what Destiny is actually talking about. Or what Mystique had learned from Destiny before they arrived at this mission. And so you have Mystique say, we have to leave the building but we also have to get the other people away from the building as well in the surrounding area, just in case anything bad happens to them. But you didn't have Longshot say, hey guys, you know, I'm new to your world, but does your son usually beam down in one area and that's it? Because they were battling in the night. And out of nowhere, this beam of light is glowing right on top of Forge building. And now our heroes are wondering, what's happening? Now we do jump over to two reporters, and their names are Manoli and also Neil. Now when it comes to these two characters, they do remind us what's happening in Dallas at the moment. An entire blizzard in the middle of the summer, which we already know should not be possible. And as someone who lives in Texas, let me tell you, that should most definitely not happen at all. But either way, when it comes to these two reporters, they're realizing that a lot of weird things have been happening in Dallas over the last couple of days the blizzard and now this beam of light that's surrounding this particular area now they are the first two to arrive at the scene when it comes to all the different news channels in dallas but their goal is to get the news out first to warn everyone what they are currently seeing 
we then jump over to Freedom Force and their few hostages of the X-Men, where you have Dazzler being the one to wake up first out of all of the hostages. Now, you have Dazzler also realize that the Freedom Force team is not looking at her, so she should be able to use her powers to blind them just temporarily long enough so that her, Psylocke, and Rogue can get the heck out of there. The problem is Spiral was unaffected by her actual attack and so Spiral was able to begin to attack Dazzler in the most brutal kind of way. She grabs Destiny Mask, puts it on Dazzler's face and then stabs the mask to the face of Dazzler with a knife. So we're left to wonder is the mask really stuck on Dazzler's face? If it is, that really sucks. Now, she does go after Psylocke as well and kind of express the idea that she does not like Psylocke at all because she is a psychic. But before you have Psylocke being able to be killed off by Spiral, you did have Rogue appear. And you have Rogue try her best to also battle against the six-armed sorcerer. We did pick up with Storm and Forge, and we kind of find out our two heroes are on another Earth. Now, this comes after Storm has stabbed Forge in the chest, which means that Forge was unable to close the portal that had allowed Adversary to come into the other Earth, the main Earth. And so the Adversary had put Storm and Forge on a complete different Earth as a way to say, this is your prison, but now you have Storm wondering, what's the point of that? Because if we are two people who have the ability to actually stop you, why would you give us an actual prison where we can live a normal, peaceful life? What is the purpose of that? Now, before Forge is able to explain things to Storm, you did have Forge pass out once again because of his stab wound. But when we jump back over to the main Earth, the main Marvel Universe, we kind of find out that the adversary is beginning to work on reality. You have reality changing all over Dallas, Texas. Different kind of creatures popping up left and right. Different kind of beings from different worlds are coming into Dallas, Texas, attacking innocent people. Now, you're probably wondering, hey, where are the Avengers? Where are the Fantastic Four? Where are the rest of the superhero teams? Well, they can't come to help out because what's happening in New York at the moment, because while this was happening, X Factor was dealing with Apocalypse. And so that is why you don't have a crossover between X Factor and the X-Men because they're so far apart from one another, but they're also dealing with two different kinds of things. But either way, you have Wolverine and Mystique agree to call a truce, to work together to help protect the innocent people from all these different kinds of creatures that have been brought here by the adversary. Now, we do jump back over to Storm and Forge, and I want to establish the idea that time moves differently on this other Earth. Let me explain, because the last time we saw Storm and Forge, Forge was still recovering after Storm had stabbed him. But now we see our two heroes being able to travel across this new world. But months have passed by between the two moments. And so that is how Forge is able to travel now. Now when it comes to Forge and Storm, well, they travel to the same location that you had Forge try to use his magical powers to close the portal on the adversary back on the other earth and so the reason why they traveled to the same location on this earth was hoping to get back home to their own reality but the problem is the adversary made sure that all different traveling points are different areas on this earth and possibly other earths across the multiverse cannot be used by forge and so our heroes are technically stuck there. Now, when it comes to Forge, he's really down with the idea of just staying here and actually making a life. Now, for Storm, she can't do that because she feels responsible for the idea that she released the adversary on their home Earth. And now their home Earth could possibly be a race. But she's also still dealing with the idea that she was tricked by the adversary because the last two videos 
because she believed that she was hanging out with Nays, the guy who was kind of like a father to Forge, to only find out that was never Nays at all. And you have Forge say, you know what? In my heart, I believe that Nays have been gone for a good while. But again, when it comes to the adversary, he is a great trickster. But you have Storm walk away to kind of have some time to herself to actually think, could her and Forge actually build a life on this new Earth? Now back on the main Earth, we do pick up with the X-Men and Freedom Force still trying to help out innocent people, but this leads into an interview between Mystique and one of our reporters from earlier, where you have our reporters asking Mystique, why are you working alongside with the X-Men? You are Freedom Force. You were assigned and put together to go after mutants like these guys right here and other bad mutants across the world. But it's Mystique saying, hey, look around you. Right now, we have no choice but to work alongside with them. But then you have Havoc jump in and say, what makes a hero? Please tell us what makes a hero because multiple times over the years the X-Men have gone out of their way to help protect this earth not just themselves but humans as well and here y'all go again trying to paint this picture as the X-Men being evil that mutants are evil what the heck is wrong with you guys now when it comes to our heroes they have no idea that all of this is being done by the adversary but they do realize it has to be somebody with a huge amount of magic. And the way they learn is that you have Spiral trying to undo what she did to um, Dazzler earlier with the idea of stabbing a knife through a mask onto Dazzler's face. But the problem is now Spiral is unable to fix her spell, to undo her spell. And she tells Colossus and Psylocke, it seems like someone outside of my magical abilities is actually blocking me. And that tells our heroes, okay, that means we're going up against someone with a huge amount of magical ability. And so you didn't have our heroes begin to learn about the adversary by a group of Native Americans who do appear because all realities are being mushed together into one pile of goo, technically. And so you do have this group of Native Americans tell uh, Crimson Commando, what is currently happening here is someone known as the adversary. And this is where our heroes are able to get a small bit of information about their enemy. But unfortunately, the Native Americans are killed off by a group of racist people. Well, it seems to be racist people. But either way, you do have them go ahead and kill off the Native Americans. And so now our heroes are unable to learn anything about the adversary like they were hoping to. Now getting back over to the other Earth, we kind of find out another year has passed by since the last time we saw our two heroes. But you have Storm coming back to Forge and realizing that he was able to build an entire house for him but being powered up by solar power energy. Either way, you didn't have our two heroes being able to come back together and re-establish their love for one another. Now, here's the thing. Because now the question is, what is our heroes going to do now if they're going to stay here on this other Earth or the possibility of trying to find a way back home to their Earth? And so then we jump back over to the X-Men. Now, when we do, we pick up with Colossus going over to Comfort Destiny. Now, this is really important because this is where Colossus learns that Destiny has been looking into multiple timelines to see what could possibly happen to the X-Men if they do things differently in each and every single timeline. But she only got the same outcome over and over again, where the X-Men have died except when colossus walked over she's kind of like wait a second 
you were not in any of my visions at all, which means that you have the possibility to change things when it comes to the future of your team. Now, she does tell Colossus that she has seen all different kinds of futures. If the Earth is going to survive, the X-Men have to die. That is the only way to save the future of the Earth. And so you have Colossus agree and decides to kind of be the one person to sacrifice himself to hopefully save the day. Now Psylocke sees what Colossus is trying to do and you have Psylocke read the mind of Colossus. Now once she does, she learns that Colossus had an entire conversation with Lady Roma. And again, she is the guardian of the Omniverse. And so you have Psylocke say, wait a second, Colossus, if you were technically contacted by Lady Roma, that means she's one, trying to help us, or two, she needs our help to make sure all reality is put back in place. But either way, we have to go to the very top of Forge Building, Eagle Plaza, to hopefully end all of this mess. But getting back over to Storm and Forge, you have our two heroes wondering, okay, what could be our next move here? We can stay here on this earth and begin the next human race on this earth and they become gods as we pass on or we can try to go back home to our earth and help out our friends to defeat the adversary. But the thing is, Storm's wondering, okay, first idea, not really bad. Second idea, also not bad, but the problem is we have no way getting back home. Except you have forced say, oh, don't worry. While you were gone, I kind of thought of a new way that could help us get back home. But we have to go to the very top of that mountain right there to be able to achieve that goal. But getting back over to the main Earth, you have the X-Men and also Freedom Force working together and trying to reach the top of Eagle Plaza. But on their way there, they're being confronted by different kinds of obstacles because reality is constantly changing. Now, they also have a fellow state trooper with them as well, who's kind of helping out, but he is a huge racist towards really anybody who's not him. So mutants, Asians, and the list goes on. But either way, you didn't have Wolverine tell Mystique to take her and her team back to the outside area of the building. And the reason why, because he wants to make sure that if this is a trap, at least there'll be a team left behind to continue to help out the innocent people of this area. And so let the X-Men die, but hopefully you guys can live on. Now, this is really a huge moment because one of the reporters is still there as well recording all of this to hopefully show the world what the X-Men are trying to stand for. The idea that mutants are not evil, that mutants are humans, that mutants are just trying to help out the human race, which is honestly pretty cool. Now, getting back over to Storm and Forge, this is where we're also going to establish the return of Storm's powers. While she was traveling around this new world, Forge was also able to create a device that should help restore her powers. And once he does use it on her, at first it doesn't work properly, but then it does. So guys, the ones who've been in my comment section saying, I don't like Powerless Storm, don't worry, she finally has her powers back once again, which honestly, pretty great. But either way, you didn't have our two heroes begin the process of traveling back over to their Earth, the main Marvel Universe. But while doing that, we kind of find out back on the main Earth, when it came to that state trooper earlier, it was really the adversary pretending to be someone else. But now he realized what's happening, that Storm and Forge are trying to make their way back over to this Earth. And so now you have our villain here kind of upset but also kind of down to accept their challenge. And this leads us into the final chapter of Fall of the Mutants for the X-Men. 
And so that leads us into the final chapter for the fall of the mutants for the X-Men. Because while you have the X-Men inside the Eagle Plaza, you do have everyone outside wondering, will the X-Men actually survive? But on top of that, they're also wondering what could happen to the rest of the world if the X-Men fail. Now, luckily for the X-Men, one of the reporters is with them inside Eagle Plaza. And the reason why I say luckily, because on the outside, they are able to see what the X-Men are going up against thanks to the guy carrying around a camera that's feeding back over to the television inside the van. And so you have the Freedom Force team and also the other reporter being able to see what the X-Men are going up against. Now, there is something I forgot to mention because because yes, she's been part of the team, but she doesn't really play a huge role in this storyline. And that would be Madeline Pryor. And when it comes to Madeline Pryor, let's not forget that she is married to Cyclops around this time, but she has no idea where Cyclops is at. And on top of that, Cyclops has no idea that she is alive because over in X Factor, he believes that his wife is currently dead, not knowing that she's alive and with the X-Men. Matter of fact, when it comes to the X-Men, they never really seen X Factor yet. And so they have no idea that X Factor is is Cyclops, Jean Grey, Iceman, Beast, and Angel, sorry now, Archangel, be the new team of mutants. But either way, because she was with the X-Men, she also went inside Eagle Plaza. Now, while being inside Eagle Plaza, she sees a flashback of young Forge. Now, there is something that some fans may forget about Forge, is that he fought in a war. And because of that, he lost an arm and leg. Now, when it comes to Forge, though, we kind of find out that there was a time where he tried to use the powers of the adversary to actually defeat people who had killed off his fellow soldiers to help him win a certain battle. And so he uses souls of his fallen soldiers to open up a portal from the adversary's realm and release a bunch of demonic beings to kill off the other soldiers who had just killed off his friends. Now, once he realized what he has done, he then called in a airstrike. And now Madeline kind of saw this flashback and she has some bad thoughts about Forge. Now, getting back over to Storm, Forge, and also Lady Roma, we see that they're being held captive by well, the adversary, but he also took over the Starlight Citadel. And so with them being able to control that, he believes that sooner or later, he should be able to take over reality completely and get rid of this universe. But again, he has no idea that Lady Roma has a certain character that she is hoping that could possibly help them win this battle against adversary. Now, when it comes to the X-Men, you have the X-Men see the Starlight Citadel, and their main goal is to find a way up there. But the problem is, every single time they try to get close to it, they get sent right back down, crashing into the ground. Now, they do have a bright idea on how they're going to get up there, and that involves Longshot. See, when it comes to Longshot, his bones are very hollow, so he should be able to carry all of them up there to the Starlight Citadel by riding the currents. Now, I don't feel like that would work in real life, but hey, who knows? So, you do have our heroes being able to fly up to the Starlight Citadel, and that begins the battle against them and the adversary. And so with the X-Men being able to ride the currents and actually arrive at the Starlight Citadel, with Longshot being the first to go in there, he does throw his knives right at the adversary. Now, here's the thing. It actually does damage to the adversary because his knives are covered in iron. Iron is a certain weakness for the adversary. Now, when it comes to Wolverine, he believes any kind of metal should be able to do damage to the adversary. But you have our bad guy here tell Wolverine, no, that is not the case. Your claws are covered in adamantium, and that would not do any kind of damage to me at all. But Colossus, who can turn his body into iron, can actually cause some damage to the adversary. And with Colossus being the hidden piece 
oh, Lady Roma, he was able to do a lot of damage to the adversary. And with him doing that, Rogue was then able to begin the process of absorbing the powers of adversary. Now with her doing that, she was able to open up a portal to begin the process of sending him back home where he came from. And so that leads into the X-Men trying to find a way to push the adversary all the way inside the portal and then actually close it. But that runs into one problem. See, when it comes to the adversary, he is a magical power being, meaning that the only way to defeat him is by using magic. And so even though the portal is open, they can't push him all the way inside because all their powers are not magic based. And Rogue is using her newfound powers that she had gained from adversary to keep the portal open long enough to send him through but then even if he goes through the portal how are you going to close the portal because the portal has to be closed by somebody who knows how to and again rogue doesn't now luckily for our heroes forge does and so you have forge begin the process of trying to push the adversary through the portal but here comes the next problem how are they going to close it? And Forge says, we must use your guy's souls to be the reason why the portal is bound closed to keep him away from this reality. You will be the key that will lock away his reality from ours. Now for the X-Men, even though they hate the idea that they're going to have to sacrifice themselves to be the reason why the adversary is defeated, they know it's the right thing to do as a way to protect the Earth. Now something else to mention is that when it comes to the reporter that had been following the X-Men around, he still has his tape recorder or his camera and he's recording everything that is currently happening. Now this is really important because like we saw in X-Factor, because X-Factor went out of their way to help defeat Apocalypse to protect New York, it's now the X-Men finally being able to have proof that they're not evil. They're getting proof they are really a good team who are now going out of their way to give up their lives to save the entire world. And that's really important. And so you have Forge begin the process of turning our heroes into magical power beings or whatever to actually lock away the adversary reality to make sure that he can never come back ever again. Now, we also come to find out that because the reporter was recording everything, you have this video getting out to the entire world. Everyone is watching this, including Kitty Pride and Nightcrawler. And like I said earlier, they were two of the three characters who got injured in the Mutant Massacre storyline, and so they were removed from the team. But either way, back on Muir Island, they're seeing what the reporter is showing the world. The X-Men had given up their lives to save the entire world. To the world, the X-Men are now dead. And this is really huge. And for Nightcrawler and Kitty Pryde, they're wondering what's next for them. Now for these two characters, this is beginning the process of introducing another X-Men team, better known as Excalibur. Now you didn't have Lady Roma appear after everyone had technically moved on with their lives and she brings the X-Men back to life. Now the reason why she does this because she said, listen, when it comes to the adversary, he can never be locked away. He plays a very important role when it comes to the multiverse. And so unfortunately, he can never be locked away. You guys becoming the locks we're not really going to stop him at all because he would just find another way to come into this reality. But right now he's being punished for what he has done, but he'll try again down the road. But either way, you have Storm say this works out perfectly then. The idea of them being alive, but the world believing that they are dead. And the reason why she is saying that because when it came to the X-Men, Storm and Magneto had this plan to make the world believe that they were dead. Because the X-Men had way too many different enemies just popping up left and right trying to kill off the X-Men. 
But on top of that, friends and families were also being attacked as well because their connection with the X-Men. And so this is Storm saying, this works out great. If the world believes that we are dead, then we are able to move behind the scenes and get paid back against every single person who has done us wrong. And so now the X-Men are alive again and are able to continue on with their mission. And Storm has her powers again. But this is what's going on there youtube and welcome back to another comic book video all right so we are going to continue our coverage over x-men comics as we are covering the fall of the mutants era of x-men comics now with that being said when it comes to fall of the mutants it wasn't really a proper crossover it wasn't like you had the x-men crossing over with the x-factor team or x-factor crossing over with new mutants each of the three X-Men teams were handling their own different kinds of problems. So X-Factor had Apocalypse. X-Men had the adversary. You had different things going on for different teams. Now, like we did when it came to X-Factor and X-Men, we're going to cover some of the books for the New Mutants as we lead into what their part was when it comes to the Fall of the Mutant crossover. And so we're going to cover about four or five issues of books that kind of lead into their chapter in the Fall of the Mutants. Now, the first few pages for the New Mutants is really more of the New Mutants getting ready to go to a party. And the reason why, because Cannonball has a girlfriend known as Layla. Now, when it comes to Layla, she was kind of similar to Dazzler in some areas because she was also a rock star. The only difference is that when it came to Layla, she had the ability to teleport across the universe. And usually what she did was she created a field of energy around her. Anybody inside that field of energy would teleport alongside with her. But either way, over the years, she did use her powers for personal gain by going around to different planets and stealing different things to make some money, but also being a rock star back on Earth like Dazzler. Either way, when it comes to Lila, she invited the new mutants to her big time party. And for Cannonball, this is a huge thing. You are talking about the idea of meeting your girlfriend's friend group and you want to make sure you fit in but you're also bringing your friends as well you want to make sure they fit in as well and so you have almost all the new mutants getting dressed you know they're all dressing kind of different and they tell Magneto that they are leaving guys real quick I love Magneto's face when he sees some of the outfits of the new mutants because he's wondering what in the world are you guys wearing now, when the new mutants arrive at the party, they, you know, they kind of freak out at first. Really just cannonball. Everyone else in the group is really relaxed and trying to have a good time. Now, when our heroes walk inside the party, they do see another fellow kind of getting into an argument with Lila. Now, when it comes to this argument, we do learn very quickly that this guy and his group of friends are really aliens and apparently they want Lila to do something for them. Now the way we actually do learn all of this is that when you have Lila tell this guy, hey, leave me alone and stay with your friends, when she walks away, he goes and talks to the rest of his group in their alien tongue. But Cypher, who's one of the new mutants, had the ability to understand almost any language across the board to kind of realize that those aliens right there wanted Lila to do something for them, but she said no. But also, it seems like they're very upset with Cannonball. And so now they're going to possibly try to do something to Cannonball to remove him to have Lila accomplish their task. And so you didn't have one of the aliens release small pellets on the ground. Now, these small pellets, they do make 
cannonball collapsed right in front of Lila, which is embarrassing because they were just dancing and having a good time. And so you have Cannonball leave the dance floor to gather himself. But that is when he is confronted by another member of the alien group who begins to talk to Cannonball in a way of saying, look at you, dude, you have Lila, one of the hottest people in the party right now. And you just embarrass yourself right in front of her by collapsing like that. So you know what? You need to go back out there and show her who you are. You need to win the battle against other men who are also trying to get at her as well. And so you have one of the aliens give Cannonball some pills by saying the pills will make him feel a whole lot stronger and put some courage inside of him as well. And so he does take the pills believing what they are going to do. But in reality, the pills do the exact opposite. As soon as he does get out on a dance floor, he begins to hallucinate. He begins to get very drowsy to the point where he has to walk off the dance floor again to get some fresh air. He goes to a nearby balcony and now the aliens can begin their next step of their plan. Now, luckily for Cannonball, on his way over to the balcony and with the aliens following him, well, Cypher and also Wolfbane were nearby. And they kind of realized, hey, it looks like Cannonball has been drugged. But on top of that, it looks like he's being followed by those aliens. And so they want to make sure that he is okay. Except when they get to the balcony, well, Cannonball is being flown away with the aliens to an unknown location. And so while you have the aliens taking Cannonball somewhere else in the city, he does wake up and begins to use his powers as a way to get away. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to Cannonball, when he does use his powers to shoot himself like a rocket all over the area, he's very durable, very hard to bring down. But at the same time, he still has been drugged and the drugs are still working through his system to the point where he's unable to continue on for a very long time when it comes to using his powers. But while using his powers, he does run through a certain tower in the city. Now that tower right there is going to be important in the next chapter. But either way, you have Cannonball trying his best to get away from these guys. And so the rest of the chapter is really more of the rest of the team realizing that Cannonball needs their help. And so with the powers of magic, they were able to teleport right over to where Cannonball and the group of aliens were at. Now, as soon as they arrive, they are able to easily defeat the group of aliens. And you didn't have Danny Moonstar use her abilities to read the minds of the aliens and pull out an image to see why in the world they came to Earth and why they wanted Lila so badly. And we kind of find out because Lila was a great thief in her past, they wanted her to use her abilities again to steal a special set of jewels, but she said no earlier. And so this was them trying to find a different way to make her do the job, but they failed. And so with them failing, you didn't have magic say, you know what, you guys deserve to go to Limbo for a short period of time to learn a lesson. And once you have learned that lesson, uh, maybe I'll let you out of limbo. And so that wraps up the first chapter. Now, at first, this chapter may seem not really that important, but it does for, for other chapters down the road, especially the moment where you had Cannonball run into that tower earlier. Now, when we jump into New Mutants number 56, we kind of begin a new story, but one particular part from the last chapter will play a major role in this story. And so we do pick go the New Mutants having breakfast. Now, while they're eating, they're discussing what happened at the party. And for the ladies, they're talking about the men at the party that they were at. But then it all comes down to Magma, Who's on her mind right now? Who could be her crush? Now, when it comes to Danny Moonstar, she's able to read your mind, but able to take what she sees in your mind and project an image of what you're actually thinking. And so when it comes to Magma, she is thinking of a character known as Empath. 
Now, Impact is part of a team known as the Hellions, and they were just the evil version of the New Mutants, and they're being led by Emma Frost at her school. But either way, when it comes to Magma, she gets very upset with what Danny Moonstar did by showing everyone at the table who is her crush. It is Impact. Now, there is another reason why Magma is very upset, and the reason belongs to her father. See, when it comes to Magma, she comes from a country known as Nova Roma. In that country, I want to say she was the princess of the country, but either way, her dad technically did send her away so that she is able to learn more about her mutant ability. But recently, she had received a letter saying, hey, it's time for you to come back home. Come back home and, you know, begin the next generation. You heard that right. Her father wants her to get married and have a child. And for Magma, that is not okay for her father to ask. But at the same time, she does not feel like she fits in with the new mutants either. And so she's kind of wondering where does she belong, but she's also thinking about impact. Now we do jump over to the Hellions. Now when it comes to the Hellions, they're just eating breakfast at the Hellfire Club in New York. Now with Emma Frost being their teacher, she's also part of the Hellfire Club. So it makes a lot of sense on why they're there at the Hellfire Club. But while being there, they're watching the news while they're eating their breakfast. And they kind of find out that Bird Boy, a new character, has been released from his prison thanks to Cannonball. And so when they're watching the news and they see Cannonball literally destroying the tower in the last chapter that had released Bird Boy, they believe that the new mutants want Bird Boy for their own personal reasons. And for the Hellions, they cannot allow that. And so they get dressed to leave and to hopefully find Bird Boy before the new mutants do. Now on their way out, you also have Emma Frost stopping them to talk to Impact about the idea of beginning the process of her hidden plan. Now, when we jump back over to the New Mutants, they're also watching the news as well. And they realize what Cannonball did, which Bird Boy being released, they're kind of like, okay, we have to go find him. It's our fault that he's out there. But at the same time, it's the New Mutants thinking that Bird Boy could possibly be a mutant. And so they want to go out of their way to help him. Now, while the team is getting ready, you have Magma still very upset with Danny Moonstar. Matter of fact, she does not want to go on this mission at all, but at the same time, she still has to because this is her team, and she wants to make sure they are okay when they go on this mission. Now, when it comes to Bird Boy, I'm going to tell you right off the bat that he is not really a mutant at all. He's a different kind of being. As a matter of fact, we'll talk more about him later on, but when it comes to the new mutants and also the Hellions, they both arrive at the scene at the same time which means you're going to have both teams fighting against each other to have the chance to hopefully get Bird Boy. And so the battle does last for a few pages, and you have both teams beginning to use their powers in different kinds of ways to help them win this small war for Bird Boy. But then you have the new mutants realize there is a way to actually win. If Bird Boy is a bird, that means he likes fish. So why not go out of our way to collect a huge amount of fish and then bring them over to Bird Boy to then trap him and bring him back to the school? Because our heroes still believe that Bird Boy is a mutant, but... I'm telling you now, he's not. And so as the fight goes on, it does get to the point where you have a standoff. See, you had Danny Moonstar and also Magma riding their Pegasus, but there was an incident where they both crash landed with some of the Hellions. Now the Hellions, they're holding on to Danny Moonstar. Now it's not very clear on what the Hellions are going to do with Danny Moonstar, but Magma is very concerned for her safety. And she's unconscious right now so magma really can't wake up danny to help her get away from the hellions now i know i said earlier that when it came to magma she has a crush on empath but empath also has a crush on magma and he realized that 
Magma really does care a lot for Danny Moonstar. And this is a woman that he does care for. He wants to make sure that he still has a chance to get with her. So why crush the chance to just help his team win against her team? And so what he does, he used his abilities as an empath to make his team members feel differently when it comes to Danny Moonstar to let her go and hand her over to Magma. But the rest of the team realized the only reason why he did that is because he has some kind of feelings for Magma. And so you have Magma being able to grab Danny Moonstar, but then you have Magic appear with a pile of fishes to trick Bird Boy to come towards them and the new mutants are able to teleport back home to their school. Now, when the new mutants arrive back at their school, they do arrive in the danger room and they're able to use the danger room to change how the area looks to make Bird Boy feel more at home. Now, that leads into Danny Moonstar finally apologizing for what she did earlier to uh, Magma. And you have Magma forgive her, but you didn't have Magma say, after, you know, a short while here of me thinking, I kind of realized that I don't want to stay here anymore, but I don't want to go home either. And so I'm going to transfer over to, and guys, I am going to mispronounce the state name. Please forgive me. But you have Magma saying, I'm going to transfer over to the Massachusetts Academy to be part of Emma Frost School to possibly be close to Empath. And so as we dive into the third chapter, well, we pick up with the new mutants still not telling Magneto about Bird Boy, who is currently in the danger room. And so you have Magneto being the teacher of the school, the headmaster of the school saying, you guys need to go to danger room and properly learn how to use your powers. Yes, you have gotten better, but there's always room for improvement. So let's go ahead and head down there right now. And the new mutants, they're trying their best to distract him or change his mind but unfortunately he still goes down to the danger room now when they arrive he realized they left on the environment system for the danger room because again they were trying to make bird boy feel at home and so as soon as magneto turns it off bird boy begins to freak out because he's wondering where in the world am i the entire room looks like metal and so you have the new mutants having to teleport inside the danger room to hopefully calm down Bird Boy. Now, after a while, they're able to do that. But then you have Magneto kind of looking like, hey, is somebody going to tell me who in the world is Bird Boy? And so that leads into the new mutants telling Magneto, hey, this is Bird Boy. And the reason why he is here, because we believe that he's actually a mutant. Now, when it comes to Magneto, he does use Cerebro to kind of get a better read on Bird Boy. And after using Cerebro, he tells the team, well, he's not human, but unfortunately, Cerebro can't really tell if he is a mutant or some kind of other being. But unfortunately, we're going to have to wait. So Bird Boy gets the chance to stay for the time being. And so while you have Magneto doing that, you have the new mutants get back to studying for their midterms. You also have Wolfbane beginning to build a bond with Bird Boy. Now she does go out of her way to ask Cypher to use his ability to try to communicate with Bird Boy. But this is where we kind of see that Bird Boy is kind of making Cypher a tad bit jealous. That Cypher is realizing that Bird Boy is getting all the attention from Wolfsbane. And that is not okay at all. And so when she asks him, hey, use your abilities and try to see if you're able to communicate with him, he says no. And they actually get into a small argument. But either way, you have Bird Boy and also Wolfsbane walk away. Now, when it comes to the new mutants, they also have other problems besides Bird Boy. The idea of Magma actually transferring over to Emma Frost School. It's the big day. She's leaving with Emma Frost. Now, for Magma, she's saying, listen, 
It was my job to come here and learn from the new mutants, to learn from Charles Xavier and other people. But to possibly learn more about this world, I have to learn from other groups like the Hellions and Emma Frost. And so she leaves. Now, you do have Emma Frost kind of hint at the idea of the possibility of some of the Hellions actually coming to Charles Xavier school down the road possibly but still this is magma officially leaving the new mutants and it really does bother the new mutants a lot but also magneto now when it comes to magneto he feels like he failed as a teacher because it was his goal to kind of make sure that everyone is okay at the school but here we go with magma he feels like if he tried a tad bit harder with her maybe she would not left to go to emma frost school but she still did and so you have the new mutants realize that Magneto is just kind of feeling down about her leaving. And so their goal is to cheer themselves up and hoping with them being happy, he'll be happy. But getting back to Bird Boy, you didn't have the team think of the idea of, okay, if Bird Boy is possibly a human or possibly a mutant, well, that means he should do some human or mutant activities like going to the mall, getting some food, or possibly going to the movies. And so they give Bird Boy a disguise and they use the powers of magic to teleport over to the nearby mall to see if maybe these different kinds of human activities will do some good for Bird Boy. It doesn't because as soon as they go over to a restaurant and they order a bunch of food, Bird Boy begins to freak out. Not in a bad way, well yes in a bad way because he does go crazy all over every single person's food, but it's causing a scene at the restaurant to the point where they have no choice but to leave. But as they are leaving, you do have Cypher pay for all the damages, but Bird Boy went ham on every single person's meal to show that Homeboy can truly eat. And so their next goal is to take him to the movies. But before they are able to go to the movies, well, they realize that when it comes to the way he is dressed and the way he is look, Bird Boy is causing a huge scene in the middle of the mall. Different people are beginning to question him. And so you have our heroes realize they have to go back home like right now and so they realize that they can't do it just right here in the open they had to go somewhere that where no one can see them teleporting back home to the school and they realize the best option would be the movies it's really dark in there here comes the problem because as soon as they walk inside the movie the movie is playing and it caused bird boy to freak out and so you have our heroes once again using their powers in his dark theater room to hopefully grab Bird Boy and to be able to teleport back home to the school. Except when they get back to the school, Magneto is there and he's very upset because he got word from the mall about how his students had technically destroyed a table at the restaurant. Really, it was Bird Boy, but still, the new mutants were involved. And so he was very upset about the idea that one, they're not studying for their midterms, but two, they took Bird Boy out of here and he caused a scene at the mall which could bring more pressure on the actual school. And so you have Magneto saying, we are gonna go ahead and call the police to have him removed from our school because there's no way that he can stay here because he's not human. He's something, but he's not human. And so you have Wolfbane and other members of the New Mutants being very upset about the idea of him possibly leaving until you didn't have Cypher use his ability to actually communicate with Bird Boy. Now, when he does that, Cypher realized why Bird Boy acted the way he did at the restaurant because the way he was trained by people that had created him. He said to Cypher that when it comes to having food, that means that he was good. When there was no food, that means he was being bad. And so when he saw all that food in front of him, he's all like, oh, I've been really good. And so he assumed all the food was for him. And so now with the new mutants having a way to communicate with Bird Boy, there is a chance where they could possibly train him so that they can keep him. 
Now, when we jump into the final chapter for today's video, we pick up with the new mutants beginning to use the abilities of Cypher to teach Bird Boy how to actually speak. Now, at first, he does struggle because you are talking about the idea of a person or this could be a person that's half human, half bird and most likely has a bird brain. But you do have Cypher being able to actually teach Bird Boy some words as a way to communicate with the actual team. Now as time passes by, you have Bird Boy look outside and he realizes it's nighttime and he wants to leave. But you have the new mutants not allowing him to leave, but they're wondering why does he want to leave so bad? What's out there? Where is he trying to go? And so they then try to use TV as a way to keep Bird Boy distracted long enough so that one, they can go back to studying, but two, hoping that maybe watching Sesame Street will actually teach him some words that he can use to help communicate with the team. But while you have the show continue on, they show a tiger. Now, for some reason, Bird Boy begins to freak out and wants to actually attack the TV. But luckily, our heroes were able to step in his way and stop him again. But this is another example of something deep is going on in the mind of Bird Boy. But the question is right now, what? Why is he acting this way in the first place? And so they change the channel. And when they do, a commercial comes on talking about food. And you have Bird Boy being able to say the words of hamburger, you know, fries, things like that to say, hey, I want that right now. I want some food. And so you have Magic being able to, you know, use her powers to teleport over to a restaurant, grab some food, and bring it back to Bird Boy. But it really shows that he is improving when it comes to using certain words. And so then you have the team want to sit down with one another to hopefully figure out where did Bird Boy come from? Because honestly, that could kind of help understand the character a tad bit more. Now they do show him different maps to see if he has an idea where he is from and right off the bat he says okay you know what I think I came from somewhere in Greenland or somewhere nearby it now they're also going off the information from the reports that talked about Bird Boy before he was put in that tower that Cannonball broke earlier in the storyline. And so with those reports, but also the way Bird Boy's acting to different kinds of maps, they kind of got an idea of like, okay, somewhere off the coast of Greenland is where he is from. Now we also find out that anytime he sees a picture of a zoo, he begins to freak out even more. And that gives our heroes a tad bit more of information information to work with. Now, time passes by, and once again, it's nighttime, but you have Bird Boy beginning to freak out when he looks outside and sees the moon, and with him seeing the moon, he just goes crazy and busts right out the window, flying away. Now, the new mutants, they heard the noise, and when they run into his room, they realize it's too late, he's gone, but they have no idea where in the world he is going. Now, we get the chance to follow Bird Boy, and we see him go right over to a nearby burger shop to buy a bunch of burgers and drinks and shakes as well. Now, we have no idea what he is trying to do with all these different kind of items, but apparently he's in a hurry. And so once you have Burger Shop stop freaking out and give the Bird Boy everything he wants, he flies away to his next location. Now our heroes are able to catch up to him and actually stop him. But again, they're wondering, where were you going? Why are you trying to fly away? And so you have Danny Moonstar being able to use her powers to connect her mind to his mind and to pull out images to see what he is thinking about. And we kind of find out he is worried about his friends, not the new mutants, but the friends he had at the lab that apparently he had escaped from. Because he says, listen, if they were not acting right in the eyes of the person in charge of the lab, they didn't get any food but also the testing was very brutal. And so you have Bird Boy trying to go back to the island to feed his friends. That was his goal. But the problem is homeboys in New York, 
his friends are back near an island near Greenland. And so you have our heroes realize that it's possibly best for them to go ahead and help out Bird Boy to help his friends. And so you have Magic use her abilities to teleport the team right over to the island that they were able to see in the mind of Bird Boy. Except when they do arrive, they are surrounded by a bunch of creatures. And this leads us into the new mutants chapter of Fall of the Mutants, which should be. What's going on there, YouTube? And welcome back to another comic book video. All right, so we are going to continue our coverage over the fall of the mutants. And matter of fact, this is going to be our last video for this era of X-Men comics. Because remember, when it came to fall of the mutants, it wasn't really a proper crossover. You didn't have all the different X-Men teams crossing over in each other books. Instead, each X-Men team had to face their own certain kinds of problems. Problems. So when it came to X-Factor, they had to deal with Apocalypse. When it came to the X-Men, well, they had to deal with Adversary. But when it came to the New Mutants, well, they're going to have their own particular problem. Now, when it came to the fall of the Mutants, every single storyline ended on a good note. With X-Factor getting a lot of love for defeating Apocalypse, the X-Men having the ability to now hide in the shadows. But when it comes to the New Mutants, the idea of the fall of the mutants really hit this title really hard. Because by the end of the storyline, one of their team members is going to die. Now, the last time we saw our heroes, well, they met a new character known as Bird Boy. Now, when it came to Bird Boy, at first, we were left to believe if he was actually a mutant or a human, to only find out that he's only half human, half animal. We also learned that he came from an island, and on this secret island, there is a laboratory where there was him and other kind of creatures being tested on left and right, day in and day out. And a lot of times, they were tortured in that laboratory. And so when it came to our heroes, once they had learned that Bird Boy had other friends who were just like him, half human, half animal, they agreed to help him free his friends who are still being held on that island. Except when they had arrived on that island, well, they were surrounded by different kind of creatures that had lived on that island, but unfortunately, they don't know that they are surrounded. They don't know they are being watched. And so while you have our heroes walking around the island, well, that is when we come to find out who the island belongs to, a character known as the Animator. Now, when it comes to this character, he's also the one who had created these half-animal, half-human creatures. But the way he acts towards them, you can tell he only looks at them as slaves to help him accomplish different kinds of tasks or different kinds of experiments. But when it comes to him, we also learn that he is working for the right. Now remember, the right is a group of humans that had came together and being led by a character known as Cameron Hodge and their main goal is to get rid of the mutant race. And so it seems he was hired to help them achieve that goal, except we have no idea how yet or what is his game plan to help out the right to achieve that goal. Now, when it comes to the animator, even though he does work for the right, his main goal is to finish his experiments. But he's also intrigued to learn why in the world the new mutants are on his island. But getting back over to our heroes, as they are walking around the island, they are then confronted by more creatures who are very similar to Bird Boy. And when it came to Bird Boy, when he was able to escape, he gave them hope in the idea that they will also find ways to escape. Except 
with him coming back here and bringing humans, they are beginning to hate him. And the only reason why, because of them, the only human they know is the doctor who has been torturing them day in and day out. And so even though Bird Boy came back with help, they look like humans. And they believe that these humans are also there to torture them as well. Except you didn't have our heroes try their best to explain that no, they're on their side. They want to help these creatures escape this island and have a somewhat normal life. But we have to jump back over to the school of Charles Xavier, where we do pick up with Sunspot and Warlock coming back to the school. Now, there was a period of time these two characters actually left the team and kind of formed a different team in their own separate book. But of course, came back when that series had wrapped up. Now, as soon as they arrived, they set off all the alarms at the school because it's nighttime. And so they were confronted by Magneto. Now, once you have Magneto realize it's just Sunspot and Warlock and they're coming back home, he's very happy. But then he realized the rest of the team did not wake up when the alarms went off, which means they're not at the school. But getting back over to our heroes, while they are talking to Bird Boy and other creatures who are just like him, well then the alarms go off. Now these alarms are technically being used to put these creatures in some kind of trance to make them go through something known as the maze. If they are able to accomplish the maze, one, they'll get the chance to live, two, they'll get food, and three, they'll get their own kind of promotion into another group of creatures. But again, as soon as those alarms go off, every single creature in the area begins to enter the maze. And you have our heroes go alongside with Bird Boy, who is also in a trance. But their goal is to hopefully accomplish the maze, find the leader of the island, and stop that person and free the creatures. But while they're going through the maze, they see how hard it is, but also they're finding dead bodies of other creatures who are very similar to Bird Boy to kind of show what is happening here. Now, while you have our heroes walking around this actual maze, they're then confronted by more creatures, but these creatures are way bigger. But also, these are creatures who are really down for working for the animator. And so, for our heroes, they have no choice but to fight against these creatures. But the problem is these creatures are very well trained and also very strong. And on top of that, you have some characters who really can't do much when it comes to fighting against creatures like this. And so unfortunately, our heroes lose. And they also get captured by these creatures who are working for the animator. And he tells them, take them over to the next room. Now, once you have our heroes wake up and are being confronted by the animator, this is also where we kind of see his real hatred towards these animals or half human, half animal hybrids that he had created. Because as soon as you have the new mutants mentioned, they gave Bird Boy a name, he gets very upset by saying, you are an animal, you are not a man, you do not deserve the right to have friends. You do not deserve the right to have a name. I don't know why you think you should, but you shouldn't. And it kind of shows that same hatred goes over towards our heroes because they are mutants as well. Because to him, they're not humans. They're not man. They're mutants. They're just like animals. And so to him, they're also people or creatures that do not deserve a name. Do not deserve the right to be called human do not deserve the right to live like a man or woman. And that kind of shows what kind of character he is. Now the opening pages of the second chapter gives us a tad bit more information about this character. We kind of find out that he is scared of Cameron Hodge. Now Cameron is the leader of the right, the same group that hired this man to work on a project to make sure that the mutant race is not able to survive, not able to grow. Matter of fact, 
find a way to stop the idea of more mutants being brought into this world, but to also make sure that humans are able to survive and still be the bigger race, the first class race. But either way, we kind of find out he's not working on that assignment. He took the money of the right, he took the money of Cameron and began to work on his own experiments. And that is a huge problem because Danny Moonstar, one of the new mutants, she has the ability to connect her mind to someone else's mind, to pull out your worst fears and project that worst fear as an image for everybody to see. And so she pulled out the worst fear of the animator and realized he's scared of Cameron Hodge finding out that he is not doing what he was assigned to do. Now, there is one character I do want to focus on, and that would be Rain Sinclair, better known as Wolfbane. And the reason why, because when it comes to Wolfbane, she was raised 14 years by her father in a very serious Catholic household. Now, before her powers had manifested, he was already harsh on her. But once her powers came out and she was able to turn into a werewolf, he looked at her as some kind of work done by the devil, sent by the devil, and he began to hate his daughter even more, and basically calling her a body full of evil, even though she is a great person. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up because Doug, aka Cypher, who has the ability to communicate with almost anybody or anything in the universe, he began to talk to the other creatures that were created by the animator. Now, those creatures began to talk very rudely about Wolfbane. And so you have Doug try to protect her, but he gets smacked right in the face. And then you have Wolfbane get upset and turn to her wolf form and try to attack those creatures. Except she stopped very quickly. But once she is stopped, she begins to think that maybe she truly is evil. That maybe she's only an animal. Because all animals have some kind of lust inside of them. And so because she reacted the way she did when Doug got hit, she now began to believe that maybe she is just an animal, but an evil animal like her father had called her many years ago. Getting back over to the school of Charles Xavier, we do pick up with Magneto. And you have Magneto, you know, getting very concerned about his students, wondering where in the world are they? And so he leaves to go over to the Hellfire Club. Because around this time, he had joined the club as the White King as a way to help get funding to protect a school from different kind of enemies like the Marauders. And so he's the White King over there. There, and he feels like with the idea of being part of the actual group, he should be able to use their tech to find his students. And so he leaves. But you do have Sunspot and Warlock finding the clues that were left behind by the rest of the team and realize where the team is actually yet. And so they head over there. Now, we do jump over to the animator in the island once again. And when we do, we really focus more on the animator here because we do learn what is his actual end goal. We kind of find out that, yes, he was hired by the right and also Cameron Hodge to find a way to hurt the mutant race, to make sure they are not able to outgrow the human race to make sure that no more mutants are being brought into this world. Except he took the rice money and began to do his own kind of experiments, these human hybrid creatures. But his end goal is to sell these creatures off to different countries around the world because he realized that when it comes to humans, we are able to accomplish a lot of great things. But there are still some things out there that we are not able to accomplish because of different kinds of reasons. But that is where his creation comes in. These hybrids. Yes, they are animals, but they think like humans. And so they are able to use their animal abilities to help regular humans accomplish more great things across the world. And so his goal is to take his creation and begin to sell it to different countries around the world. Now, anytime Cameron calls up, you have the animator tell Cameron a huge 
fat lie about what he is truly working on. In his last phone call, it has Cameron realize that the animator is doing something, has something up his sleeve. And so you have Cameron tell his uh, plane to go ahead and head over to the island because he wants to make sure that his investment is going in the right way. Now, right after the call had ended, some time does pass by, and you do have the new mutants being able to break free. Now, you would think, okay, this is their chance to finally take down the animator, free all these creatures, and then finally go back home. Except, right when it seems like they are about to win, Cameron Hodge and the right appear. And he's able to tell his soldiers to take out the new mutants, which they do, very easily and then he is able to realize that all his money was going to waste when it came to hiring the animator to accomplish his certain goals now this leads us into what i said at the very beginning of our video that somebody is going to die so when it came to cameron hodge he does take our heroes as hostages and begin the process of putting those characters onto his plane and about to take them back over to his new base somewhere in the world except bird boy and other creatures who work alongside bird boy begin the process of helping to free the new mutants from Karen Hodge containers. And so now our heroes are able to fight against him and his soldiers and hopefully be able to defeat them to finally be free. But like I said, this is where you have somebody going to die. See, when it came to Wolfbane, she almost got shot by the animator who also broke free from being a hostage from the right. And he had a gun in his hand and his main goal was to shoot Wolfbane because he looked at Wolfbane as an animal, not as a human. But on top of that, because she also is a mutant. And so right when he pulls the trigger and it looks like Wolfbane is about to die, well, you have Cypher jump in front of the bullet, taking the bullet, and of course began to bleed out. And so then you have our heroes continue to fight against the right and now realize that one of their own has been shot. Now, when it comes to Cameron, he realized that he is losing this battle and he's already upset because back in X Factor comics, New York was attacked by Apocalypse and his base out there was also attacked by Apocalypse. Not really attacked by Apocalypse, his aircraft just crashed into the actual building. But either way, he's still very upset about losing his base, but now this project is also a failure. But he does try to leave the island, except one of the sea creatures, that is half creature, half human, grabs the plane and bring it right down into the ocean and it blows up. And so we're left to believe that Cameron Hodge is dead. If that's the case, the right no longer has their leader. Now, once our heroes realize the day is over and they can finally relax, well, they look over. And they see that Doug has been shot. And by the time they get to him, Doug is dead. Now, as we dive into the final chapter for today's video, I really want to focus on magic here for a brief moment. See, when it comes to magic, she had a huge connection to Limbo because there was a period of time of her life where she was raised in Limbo. Now, thanks to different storylines over time in X-Men comics, we had learned that she had a darker side to herself, better known as the Dark Child. Now, the Dark Child form is kind of like this demonic form that she was given to her thanks to her having connection to Limbo. Now the thing is, she was kind of able to lock away that form, but her fear is that she might turn into that darker version of herself. And so when it comes to Doug's death, she begins to go crazy and begins to attack different members of the right that was still on the island after the battle was completely over. And so when it comes to magic, she takes that member over into Limbo to have him be tortured by her demons. But then when she comes back to Earth, she still looks like her dark child form. Now she does turn back to normal, but it kind of shows that 
Doug's death is bringing out the worst in the rest of his team. Now, when our heroes arrive back home, they wonder, where is Magneto? Now, when it comes to Magneto, he went over to the Hellfire Club to use their resources to hopefully find the new mutants. Except, when he arrived there, well, he finds the place has been almost completely wrecked. And the reason why? Because what happened between Apocalypse and X-Factor? And matter of fact, you have the other members of the Hellfire Club show Magneto the footage of the fight. And that is when he realized that he knows some of the members of X-Factor. Now, let's not forget, because when it came to X-Factor, they were a team that was going around pretending to be a group of humans who were going out of their way to hunt down mutants to help out the human race. But in reality, they were trying to help those mutants and try to train them so that they're able to control their powers. When it comes to Magneto, he only knows the first part, the idea that they're human hunters. And so he's wondering why these old people that he used to fight against like Cyclops, Jean Grey, Iceman, and the list goes on, are helping out X-Factor. But he's also seeing what's happening with the X-Men. And let's not forget, at the end of the X-Men Fall of the Mutant chapters, well, the world believes that X-Men had died when it came to fighting against the adversary, but in reality, they had survived. But when we jump over to the new mutants back at home at the X-Mansion, you're still having these characters dealing with the death of Doug, which honestly makes sense because Doug only died recently, but they're now beginning to blame themselves in different kinds of ways. Wondering if they did things differently, would Doug be here at the moment instead of being dead? Now, when it comes to our heroes, they're also beginning to realize that they're gonna need each other if they're going to overcome the death of Doug because this is just too much to handle on their own. They need to support each other to get over this. And honestly, it's going to be a while until they are able to actually handle something like this. Now, this leads into a big moment for Magneto because when it came to Magneto, when he find out the new mutants were back at home, he was very happy, except when he walked in and realized that one of the members of the new mutant, Cypher, is now dead, he goes into complete rage mode, getting very upset about what happened to Doug. Because when it comes to Magneto, even though he had turned into a good guy and trying to become a great headmaster at Charles Xavier School, he still has some hard feelings towards the human race. And so to find out a human has shot and killed off Doug, it really ticked him off a lot. But at the same time, he's still angry at the new mutants because the new mutants were supposed to stay at home, study for their midterms, except they went out of their way to help out this one group of creatures to give them freedom and now one of their own is dead. And so Magneto is at the point of saying, you guys are not allowed to leave because every single time I tell you guys to stay here, do not get into any kind of trouble, you leave and get yourselves in some kind of trouble. And guess what happened? Someone died this time. And now I have to call his parents, inform his parents that their son is now dead. How I failed as a teacher. How I failed as his protector. And Magneto is just ripping them a new one because he is just so angry. But then Magic gets angry as well. The reason why she gets angry because Let's not forget, a while back, when she was having a hard time dealing with the idea that she may have a darker side to herself, the Dark Child, well, Magneto was there to kind of help her work through those problems and bring her back over to the good side. And so, she looked at Magneto as her shiny knight armor to now seem as this angry man who is punishing her for something she did wrong, even though it was their fault that their team member had died. 
but because they're still so angry because of what happened to Doug. And now you have Magneto just adding on his anger. She snaps and she begins to try to attack him. Now, luckily, she does calm down. But in the middle of that attack, you begin to see her dark child form coming out very slowly. And then you have her disappear to go hide in the attic. But that really shows that right now Magneto no longer has that bond with his students. But on top of that, he lost one of his students. But to go ahead and wrap up today's video, when we do see the new mutants in the attic of the X-Mansion, they do find some old clothes to kind of make some new costumes for themselves. But here's the thing, because you have the new mutants like the rest of the world believing that the X-Men are currently dead, even though they are not. And so it's the new mutants saying, we are not Magneto students. We were Charles Xavier students. But now with the X-Men gone, it's now time for us to step up and take their place and fight against other evil mutants across the world to help protect mutants, but to also protect the human race as well to help achieve Xavier's goal. And so now the new mutants are trying to become their own, you know, big time superhero team. But the question is, will Magneto step in their way? And that's the is the end for today's video. So with that being said, guys, please leave me a like down below and subscribe. Also, if you have any suggestions on books I should read, well, please let me know in the comments below because you never know, your suggestion could be a future video down the road. But guys, see y'all next time. Later.